Hey there. Hello. Hi, Isidro. I enjoyed your presentation yesterday. Oh my gosh, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I will have a lot to talk about because we use some records from Sonoma as well. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah you'll hear about it shortly. But yeah, I, I was, I was, yeah, it, it's a longer conversation, but yeah, I appreciated the approach you were taking. Thank you. Um, are you using um, some case files as well? Some field work case files? It's it's from the, the sterilizations um, that were done there. So I, I bet the same people are some of the same people. You are in, Well, I guess I didn't say any names, did I? No, yeah, you you didn't, but um, yeah, every, we a lot of the folks in our records were from Sonoma. We have they're from every institution in that okay. time, including Sonoma. So. Um, I'm sure there's overlap and and it it was compelling to me because we we only get that one slice. I mean, so much of what people are talking about yesterday, we have this one bureaucratic slice and you're getting another, but you know, it could kind of piece together more of a full. Absolutely. And that's what I need to is I need the broader, um, you know, for history, at least I need the broader institutional, um, I guess the bigger structural forces that shape these individual narratives, you know, so sort of to create like a historical work, you know, like a piece of history. Yeah, absolutely. And do you, do you work with Miros? Yeah, she's my advisor. Okay. Yeah. So she, I mean, that's a great person to work with for that for that task. Yeah, it came together um, uh, really organically, I guess, right? Because I came up with a different interest completely. I was looking at like a statecraft, you know, like nationhood and identity and nationhood. Um, mm -hmm. And then reading her book, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, like. I need to do this too. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, no, actually, I came to the interested disability, not with her, but then thinking about her book more, I was like, duh, like, of course I need to work with her in this, you know? Yeah, it all, it all um, overlaps really powerfully in the work you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, we should, we can reconnect. I mean, you'll hear from our whole um, lab, but basically, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Thank so. you for being here. Yeah, no, I'm excited. It's important work, right? That needs to be said needs to be presented and um a professor from ucsb also teaches like eugenics um in one of her undergrad classes like history of biology and her oh. comment is yeah students don't know students had no idea that there's this history of eugenics and that it started here first you know in the united states i think for yeah. us working in it is like well yeah it's it's so obvious right but yeah the narrative still hangs on to to germany yeah, no, and I think, I mean, I'm, um, I work in a college of public health, so um, it's like vital that people in that field understand this history. And similarly, there's very, um, very little awareness of it. Yeah. I see Han in the comments here. I also really enjoyed Han's presentation yesterday. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I'm just going to, Juan is in our group, and he just wrote that he needs the link, so I'm going to make sure he gets that one. Oh, Joe needs to become a panelist as well. Hi, Joe. Good morning. Everything Yay. works today. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I was a little nervous when I got on and there was no camera button, but here we are. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, I just needed to convert you from attendee to, to panelist. So, so we're set for that. Good, thanks. Thank you all for hanging in there yesterday, you know, it was no half problem. an hour it took us to. <laughs> I'm so glad you got it. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and everybody handled it with uh, some, you know, sense of like, I'm not gonna freak out, just one step at a time here. But now yeah. you can write, now you can do a whole new PhD on webinars. No joke, no joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll I might have some false confidence now because you know, I feel like we got over this bump, so it's like, oh, now I know how to do it. But no, there's so many little things, so many little oh. moments that, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should probably like throw some pennies in the jar about that today and see what. <laughs> <laughs> there's another one. Okay, see you guys in a bit. Okay. Oh, Cynthia, that's right, Cynthia. Thank you so much for for coming back. 
It should work now, Cynthia. Good morning. Hi, Cynthia. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Saying I'm sweaty. I just had a boot camp class, but I'm here. <laughs> oh, that's right. You told us. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> I moonlight as a fitness instructor. So from my backyard, though, so it's okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> We should be able to start on time today. That's all good. Yeah. I'm not as rushed. I'm just sweaty. It's all good. <laughs> and it looks like Juan, Juan made it in. Wonderful. Great, great. Hi, Hi. Sue. Morning, Sue. Hey, morning. Hi, Cynthia. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for doing this. Not a problem. I was really thinking about you last night. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm... Sweaty, but here. <laughs> Hi, Juan. I'm Sue. Hello. Morning. Morning. After I'm done, I'll pop off, go take a shower, and then come back and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, um, we were thanks thinking. for being here again after full full stint yesterday. Okay. So we were thinking of you uh, this week because we went, the archives in Iowa are open again. So we were there um, Thursday and Friday, um, Juan and I and a few others from the team. Oh my gosh. So I could get back in, huh? If I, if I come? Only Thursdays and Fridays. Thank you. Yeah, we that can be in touch. True. Wasn't it always true that it was just... It, only certain days? Yeah, it, it was like Wednesdays through Saturdays, I think. Okay. And then now that it's the first time they're reopening since the oh pandemic. Oh my gosh, that's good. I really need, need that. Yeah, yeah, there's still, you know, many special precautions within Iowa's COVID policy context. Um, so um, the main thing is just frequent hand washing and you can't use um, alcohol-based sanitizers because it could damage the materials. Well, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. Hi, Kate. Hello. You have you look like <laughs> I want your background. I just oh. googled um, library. So, um, Nicole, I'm starting to lose my voice. Oh no. Um, so, if that happens, if someone could take over, I have my entire talk typed out. You can punt to us. That's no yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah, take care of yourself. Hi, baby Ren. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost kind of like Hogwarts-ish, right? This like beautiful library with the ghostly head. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm gonna grab a glass of water. I'll be right back. I'm actually gonna do the same. So I'll be right back as well. Cynthia, I was sorry to hear about the, your loss. Yeah. You know, shit happens. It's really awful. I mean, I, it, um, that's the nature of doing work with people who have been, um, who have led really difficult lives is people die too young. Yeah. Honestly. So thank you. And actually, Lauren the, the Jones, who died uh, yesterday, she, um, <sighs> I, I I actually am sort of in shock because I always thought she would never die. And she she was one of the very early diagnosed women with HIV in the country. And she was part of a huge study because she was one of these rare people who had HIV really early and who did not die. Oh. And um and so there was this real fascination, right? With like what how did that happen? And what what is it that medically that made that possible? And she was, she had been a nurse and was so committed to being able to be part of medical research to keep people alive. Um, and so she was, it was sort of like this fortuitous, crazy thing, right? That this woman who would have that kind of commitment would be one of those patients who then could be part of studies to help fight HIV in general. Um, and so I just had come to believe that she would never die. Like I just, I really, which makes no sense at all, right? To think of people as immoral, but anyway. 
I guess not. <laughs> but thank you. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. Nice to see you too. How's everyone doing? Yesterday was great. Yeah. The, the, the um, I thought it, it overcame the, the tech glitches. Such Was a yesterday thing. recorded, by the way? Yes, it's on YouTube. Oh, good. I had a, a my, my boss scheduled a retreat and made me an organizer of it right after I heard about this conference. And it was yesterday afternoon, so I couldn't watch yesterday afternoon, which is a real bummer. Oh, my God. It's actually already up on YouTube. So that link. That, um, for oh, the YouTube link, link is already going. Yeah, that wasn't on purpose. I thought it was going to work today for the same YouTube live stream. So I had to create a new live stream for, for today. But yeah, it's up. So that link. Oh, awesome. Is Thank you. We're going to edit it, but it's up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, I have, a, I have a research question for the Iowa folks before it starts. So I just read about a, um, a birthright field worker in, who. Um, was working post World War II to, as Birth White was to promote um, forced sterilization, and she was uh, writing about her her success with her first case. And the source has no reference really, except it says conversation with Joanna Shun. So I, I may be able to just get it from her. But I wondered if any of you have ever seen anything like that, or if you do see anything like that. Um, I, I would love the source for this. Okay. I know I just f for the birthright caseworker. Yeah. Yeah. I know I at least have seen one case that was referred to the board of eugenics by birthright in Iowa. Um, that could yeah. be the one. It, it very well might be the one. I think it was yeah. the first case in their kind of beta testing of Oh, early on project. We can take a look at our um, at our files. Yeah, yeah, thank you. If you ever come across it, or or if it's easy to. Yeah, we'll we'll be in there all month, so maybe I'll take a note on it for the the folks who are going back. Yeah. Uh, yesterday and Thursday was a little wild because we also had an infant in the archives, <laughs> just because 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 of pandemic childcare things. <laughs> so she was great. It was infant. Fine. <laughs> and infant by the name of? Avira. Yeah. So she was, one, one can vouch for me. She, she was just pretty, pretty good researcher. <laughs> Honestly, she was, so, sorry, it was like a research coordinator. <laughs> right, exactly. You're, you're a watchdog. Yeah, keep everybody on their toes. How old is Vera? Uh, she'll be six months in a week. Oh, no infant. <laughs> and yeah, well she's, done, Vera. <laughs> she's doing great. Awesome. Like half of the lab had a had a kid in the last year. <laughs> so I hope they show yeah. up, you know, like just just bring them in, please. I'm trying to share screen and it says the host disabled screen sharing. Is that hi needles? Nobody's here. <laughs> Sorry, I was calling Isidro. Mm -hmm. Oh, were you calling me? Oh no, no, Isidro. Oh. <laughs> hi everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good thing you weren't here yesterday, Natalie. We were like, ah. Well, I was watching on YouTube. I entered for uh, earlier and then I was like, let me not, I don't want to add to like the stress. So I was like, let me just move to YouTube. I'm sure it'll come up when it's ready. But it was so great. Like I, I, I really enjoyed it. So um, Natalie, can you share now? Let me see. Yes. Got it. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Kristen. This was the nightmare yesterday. Exactly this, right? Let me actually test because we have um, one of the panelists uh, isn't able, to, Marie isn't able to make it in person. And so, but she sent a recording. So let me just make sure that I can make that work. Um, 
Hey, when it's your turn to talk, would you mind um, putting in that link again, but for all panelists and attendees also? Thank you. Let's see. So I'm gonna share this and let me know if you can hear it okay. Hello everyone, my name is Marie Konecki mm -hmm. and today works. You guys are so on it, awesome. Okay, great. Um, so, sorry, I'm gonna just touch base with uh, Susan. Real quick, I'll just say a couple things like welcome intro um, at the housekeeping notes and then I will turn it over to Cynthia and you all, is that good? That's good. Okay. And then the captioning meters, do we have that? Yeah, I have it all ready to go. Should I just pop it in now or just wait? Is For it... the first one, um, oh, we're starting now, no? Yeah, well, as yeah. soon as we start. Okay, uh, for the, um, yeah. Okay, it's 9.30 now. And then Katie and Joe, um, who is going first, first out of you guys so that I can spotlight you? This new feature I learned about yesterday. It's Katie. Katie, okay, great, thank you. All right, should we get started? Mm -hmm. Okay, All right. All right, All um, right. welcome everyone today. Welcome, to, welcome to the second day of the virtual day, of the virtual two-day symposium, Eugenics in California and the World, Race, Class, Gender, Sexuality, and Disability. My name is Miroslava Chavez Garcia, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a professor in the history department at UCSB, and my partner on this project is Susan Schweik, professor of English at UC Berkeley. Isidro Gonzalez is a PhD student at UCSB, and he's here too, helping us uh, behind the scenes with the technology. Um, thank you all. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, American Sign Language interpreters and live captioning have been provided. The interpreters are on the screen and you will see uh, in about uh, 10 seconds, uh, the link to the live captioning uh, in the chat. I will post that as soon as I'm done here. The interpreters today are Katie Voice and Joe Malizia and live captioning is provided by Kristen, I believe it's Baroni, I have to hopefully I have the correct name. Um, before we begin, I will turn, uh, before we begin this morning session, this afternoon session, depending on where you are, uh, we'll turn it over to my colleagues, Susan Schoik and Cynthia Chandler. Welcome everyone. Uh, we planned yesterday at the beginning of this event to dedicate it to Teresa Martinez, uh, who we wish very badly could be here and who is a leader and a model for so many struggles for justice and for fighting eugenics in all its forms. And we're going to turn it over to Cynthia Chandler who works so closely with Teresa to uh, begin today by honoring her and talking about her legacy. So Cynthia. Thank you so much for um, asking me to do this as well as to uh, you know, honor Teresa in this way. Oh, I'll see if I can get through this without crying. So oh, I met Teresa when we were both in our 20s um, in the mid 1990s. So we grew up with each other, frankly. Um, and uh, okay, so I was, I was a baby lawyer, baby activist, and I was looking for leaders inside California's women's prisons, organic leaders um, to really lead a new wave of activism among people in prison after it had been really squashed down um, as a legacy of FBI efforts and government efforts to um, sort of push down racial justice organizing in the 1970s. And um, I, I had this idea that I would try to find powerful women in women's prisons wherever they were. And I was having a really hard time cracking into the Latinx community in California's women's prisons. And people over and over again said, you had to meet, you have to meet Teresa Martinez. You have to meet Teresa Martinez. I wrote to her. She didn't respond. I tried to reach out to her through people. She didn't respond. Finally, she agreed to meet with me. 
And who I met was perhaps one of the most democratic leaders I would ever know. Um, Teresa was someone who believed in building power with people, not over people. Um, she was absolutely a life learner and constantly seeking out information, but doing so not just to improve herself, doing it so she could share it with anyone and everyone at any stage of life or walk of life. Um, she was incredibly humble, beyond generous, and both street smart plus book brilliant. <laughs> Um, so Teresa had this vision of people in prison being able to create their own research, of um, being able to challenge the objectification that ha happens of people in prison so often. And I helped her meet a young woman named Robin Levy, who is who's a really who is a very well respected human rights attorney, even at a young age. And together they developed the first human rights participatory project in the prison in the world. Um, and Robin trained Teresa on international human rights law and documentation processes. And then Teresa worked with her to create a curriculum that could train people in prison. And together they trained a fleet of over 400 people in California's women's prisons on human rights law and documentation and started documenting human rights abuses that women inside identified as problems they wanted to address. And almost immediately, they started looking, frankly, at genocide and eugenics. They started looking at how prisons lead to the premature death of communities targeted for imprisonment, as well as looking at the right to family That's and how families of communities of color are ripped apart and fragmented through imprisonment. And it was because of her work and developing it, this trusted network of peers researching um, problems that we were able to then document a pattern of forced and coerced sterilization abuse going on in California's prisons. Um, when Teresa finally got out of prison, I should say Teresa went to prison originally when she was 15 years old after testing positive for drugs while giving birth. Um, and she was only tested because she was so adamant, even at the age of 15, um, that it was important for her to get prenatal care. And so she was, while she was, Addicted to drugs, she never missed a single prenatal care appointment, but this put her on the radar um, and led to her own criminalization. Uh, after that point, she never really was able to get out of prison until later she sort of found the pathway out through, through activism. Um, and her goal was to one day be able to go to the United Nations in Europe and uh, speak about human rights abuses against women in, women in the US. And um, at one point, there was a delegate from the, United, from the U.S. that was being chosen to be sent to the United Nations, and um, she applied for it. And I, I proofread, you know, her application, which was amazing. And she proof and she got picked. And she calls me and she's like, "I got it. I'm going to the U.N." And I was like, "Well, you have to get a passport." And she's like, "What are you talking about? That's in New York." And I'm like, "No, it's not in New York. You're going to Europe. You're really going to the U.N." And she was, she was just, she actually hadn't realized that she was creating her bucket list right there. Um, she was the only delegate asked to speak at the floor of the UNET, UN more than once. She was asked to come back three times. Um, and she really built herself up to uh, be an internationally respected and acclaimed speaker on issues of eugenics and racial justice and reproductive justice. It's tragic, sorry, <sighs> that someone who could lead her life challenging eugenics would die in the way that she did. Um, so in early May, Teresa became very ill with kidney failure and um, she became delirious and her husband called for help. The paramedics that came to the scene were dealing with an overwhelmed uh, medical system in the Latinx barrio in East LA. Um, and they were probably acting beyond their licensure 
because the hospitals are so overwhelmed. They took one look at her prison tattoos. They twisted her arm around looking at her tattoos, laughing without taking her vitals. And they decided that she must, instead of being delirious and ill, that she was probably just high. And they left. When her husband tried to block them from leaving, he's a monolingual Spanish speaker. The paramedics threatened to turn him over for deportation. When her husband couldn't get her into the car alone because she was not really coherent, he called paramedics again and the same team came. It took him 20 minutes of begging to get them to agree to take her vitals, at which time they realized she had virtually no oxygen. When she was finally, when she finally got to the hospital, she had lost too much oxygen and had too much brain injury to be able to recover. As an added insult, her husband, was forced to bring in a, a marriage certificate to prove he was really her family. I don't know about any of you, but I've never had to do that to prove I was my husband's wife. Um, and even with that, they failed to put him down as next of kin in her chart. And in the middle of the night, when she started to pass away, they disregarded his wishes to make sure she was on life support so he could be there and she wouldn't die alone. They failed to call him. And her, family, her family's wishes weren't honored, and she died alone. I raise this because we are at this pivotal moment in history where finally in the United States, people are looking at the need for racial justice and equity. In California, we're at the precipice of getting reparations, but also the right to notification first eugenic survivors, both historic as well as in contemporary prisons. And yet so much work is needed to ensure people's lives are valued. So I know that Teresa would want us to mark our successes and cheer. And she would also want us to get busy and do more. So it's an honor to be part of this community that's really pushing for justice. And I'm going to go take a shower because I'm sweaty and blow my nose because I'm crying. And um, come back and be rejuvenated and join the rest of you. And it's just such an honor that this community exists and that people are fighting the most important fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you. And thank you, Teresa. And we're going to move right away uh, so that we have time to do it into our first panel, uh, which is on the work of the sterilization and social justice uh, lab, really continuing Teresa's work. And um, I know, I know how much she would value what we're about to hear. So I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie, Natalie Lira. Thank oh, you. Is, is Natalie first or yeah. is well, okay. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Cynthia. I think she logged off already, but um, that was a really moving story. And I hope that um, we can take that um, spirit with us um, through, the, through the rest of the day. Uh, so I will uh, go ahead and share some slides. My colleague, uh, Nicole Novak, will share um, these uh, few beginning slides. And then we have other panelists uh, that uh, will be sharing different slides. Um, Share my screen. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. I wanna thank all of the attendees and the audience for joining us and the symposium organizers for putting together such a, a wonderful program. Uh, my name is Natalie Lira, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Latina and Latino Studies at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Um, I've spent uh, 
several of the last years researching the history of institutionalization and eugenic sterilization in California with a particular focus on Mexican origin women and men's experiences of these violent state practices um, in one state institution in particular called Pacific Colony. And while I won't be talking about that research today, I'm very proud to say that part of that work spurred the creation of what we'll be discussing this morning on this panel, which is the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab, which is directed by Dr. Alexandra Mina Stern, and for which my colleague, uh, Dr. Nicole Novak, and I serve as faculty researchers. Uh, so to share just a quick outline of what you'll hear today, Nicole and I will be uh, sharing a brief introduction to the lab, um, and then we'll hear the fabulous research being done by three uh, research associates of the lab. Marie Konecki, who will be talking about eugenic sterilization among Asian immigrants in California. Juan Wudino, who will be sharing his analysis of immigration and eugenics in California, and Kate O'Connor, who will be sharing some really fascinating work on eugenic sterilization in Michigan. Oh, sorry. I think someone's um, audio is echoing a little bit. Um, so after that, we'll discuss um, some of the ethical and legal dynamics that we encounter within the lab's work, as well as what we consider some contemporary legacies of eugenic sterilization. Um, so on this slide, there is an image of our webpage and you can find us at uh, www.ssjlab.org. Um, and maybe one of my fellow panelists can uh, add that to the chat for me. Um, so who are we? We are a research lab made up of historians, public health scholars, uh, uh, including epidemiologists and digital humanists who are dedicated to studying the histories of sterilization abuse in the US. And as I detail in a bit, uh, our approach is interdisciplinary and really guided by racial reproductive and disability justice. And so on this slide, uh, you'll see a map of the United States, and this map illustrates which states in the country passed eugenic sterilization laws by 1935. And our lab's current research focus is on this history of um, eugenic sterilization. And I'll provide a very brief outline of this history here, um, and then you'll hear some more detailed histories in the panel and the pre uh, presenters that follow. Uh, so eugenic sterilization was really uh, one of the most violent ways eugenicists intervened on the bodies of people they considered unfit. Uh, so eugenicists, um, public health workers, social workers, physicians uh, advocated sterilization really as a, a legitimate public health policy. And they argued that um, sterilizing certain folks would work to address and prevent large social issues such as poverty, crime, immorality, et cetera. Um, and so state practices of sterilization often intersected with practices of institutional confinement. And as we know from the work of several historians, uh, sterilization practices and policies largely targeted people with disabilities, women regarded as sexually deviant, um, gender non-conforming folks, youth that were caught up in the juvenile court system, and people that were struggling with poverty. And in all, 32 states in the country passed eugenic sterilization laws, and approximately 60,000 people were sterilized under these laws between 1907 and the 1970s. Um, let's see, on this slide, we have a chart that uh, represents the number of sterilizations that occurred under these eugenic sterilization laws by state. And this is data collected from uh, Jonas Robisher and his work on eugenic sterilization in 1973. Um, of course, this is all of the sterilizations that occurred uh, in the country during this period, just kind of an approximation. And so our lab really started examining sterilizations that occurred in the country's most 
prolific sterilizer, uh, California, where approximately 20,000 of the 60,000 sterilizations um, took place. So drawing from a rich archive of sterilization requests that were located by Dr. Stern, a group of the lab's core members created a comprehensive uh, database that was um, uh, that derived information from these requests and that documents the experiences of over 19,000 individuals that were deemed in need of sterilization by California state officials and my colleague Nicole will talk a bit more about how we turn these archives into data sets in a bit. Um, thanks to a generous grant from the uh, National Institutes of Health, we've been expanding our research beyond California to create comparable data sets for North Carolina, Michigan, and Iowa. And we're also now working on adding Utah to that um, uh, uh, research as well. So. Ultimately, our work, once it's complete, will have comprehensive data sets on over 35,000 individuals that eugenicists sought to sterilize across the West, the South, and the Midwest. And so our, you know, our research in this lab really works to build on the important and uh, significant historical work on eugenic sterilization that already exists. But um, to echo Dr. Stern's comments in the opening panel of this symposium yesterday, we also want to expand this historiography beyond um, you know, traditional historical narratives that will often situate eugenic sterilization as this injustice that lives in the past, uh, beyond narratives that can sometimes reify notions of deviance and defect and uh, you know, uh, normative categories of uh, normal and abnormal, and that often uh, can erase the experiences of people of color and people with disabilities. So to do this work, our lab has taken up a set of guiding principles and a commitment to interdisciplinary and team research. And so we draw insights from uh, the really rich scholarship on reproductive justice, on histories of racialization and critical disability studies when we're creating these data sets and also in our analysis and interpretation of this data. So our work is inter interdisciplinary. We have a, 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 a you know, a large membership um, uh, of researchers in the lab and we um, conduct historical research and combine it with historical and quantitative methods. And our work is really grounded in team-based research. Uh, so in this uh, slide, we have a cause of this team-based research in action. Um, and so you'll see, um, uh, images of several meetings and that went digital um, in 2020. And then uh, most of uh, the most recent kind of endeavor, we have uh, a group of folks, including Juan and Nicole and Vera, baby Vera, um, in the Iowa archives. And this picture was just taken yesterday. And so this team-based interdisciplinary research really allows us to engage in um, an, in, an iterative research process that is informed by existing historical research, the expertise of our faculty researchers, and collective discussions that happen over time in our meetings. Um, and as you'll notice in the talks by Juan and Marie and Kate, we draw from uh, history to inform and test her hypotheses and our data analysis will also often point us to new historical questions and observations. So I just wanna, just to talk a little bit more about how we approach this history. And so the image in this uh, slide is a list of eugenic criteria that was used to determine who would be subjected to eugenic sterilization um, in, in each of the states. And so these are kind of labels that came from the laws that were passed in each of the states. And so our lens, um, often leads us to examine questions of power and positionality, how eugenicists and state workers set up systems and practices to facilitate and um, to legitimize sterilizations. We also try to get at 
the experiences of individuals and the way that these systems played out in people's lives. Um, so for example, you know, for all of the states, we ask questions about which groups were systematically targeted, um, how and why we, um, we also keep a keen eye toward the ways that seemingly neutral categories, such as um, categories that are listed here, so feeble-mindedness, um, criminality, insanity, how these um, labels really uh, drew from uh, already existing ableist, racist, classist, sexist, um, homophobic um, stereotypes and, and systems. And so we also look at, um, in addition to uh, you know these labels, how people resisted and contested these processes of labeling, um, questions of consent, uh, things like that. Uh, as our other panelists will show, our lab has um, a really rich, robust analysis of um, immigration and racialization. Um, I think I have a chat. Oh, we see there are one minute. Um, yes, I, I we divvied up the time on the on the panel a little bit differently. Um, let's see. Um, and, I want to just kind of end with a brief overview of the archives that our lab uh, works with, which reflect the, you know, different bureaucratic processes that states set up to facilitate sterilization. So each state had a different um, uh, format for recommending and approving sterilizations. And so um, starting with California, and here we have an image, uh, an example of a sterilization request. Um, and so in California, only people that were confined to state institutions could be sterilized under the law. And so we have, um, we used the requests uh, and consent forms and other related documents for uh, people that were sterilized in 11 uh, different state institutions. Um, unlike California and North Carolina, both institutionalized and community dwelling folks were subjected to sterilization. And so what the image here uh, depicts is um, the meeting notes for the state's eugenic board. So North Carolina created a state eugenics board and we draw from copies of those board notes which describe cases that were presented for sterilization. And that's what we used to build the, the data set for North Carolina. Um, like North Carolina, Iowa also established a state eugenics board that was in charge of making decisions about sterilizations. And so we draw from uh, the sterilization petitions of the board for our data set. And so here, this image is, um, a photograph of some of the archival material that we used for that data set. And lastly, uh, we have Michigan, which uh, really the Michigan archive, as Kate will discuss um, in her talk, is really varied and includes a lot of different um, case files and different types of materials. Um, in some cases, they are lists of sterilizations. In some cases, there are entire folders on individuals. Um, and that's what um, Kate's been using for her research and to create the data set on um, uh, sterilization in Michigan. So uh, I will now pass the mic over to my colleague, Nicole, who will talk a bit more about uh, methods and how we turn archival material into data sets and uh, some of our most recent pub publications. Thank you, Natalie, for opening us up and, and thanks to everyone who's organized this event and Cynthia for really getting us off um, in the, the right spirit of, of these reflections um, and remembering T Teresa Martinez. Um, so I'm going to share a bit about the methodological approach that we are continuing to develop and refine as a lab. Um, as Natalie mentioned, we're extremely interdisciplinary and collaborative. I'd say that the main kind of 
underpinnings of our methodological approach are um, epidemiology, which is quant generally quantitative methods in public health um, and historical methods. Um, and so I'll go ahead and um, share the ways that we're drawing on the, the toolkit of epidemiology, which is what my doctoral training was in, um, and then also the expertise, insight, and methodological uh, insight of, of historical and ethnic studies scholars. Um, so if we move along to the next slide. Um, this is a little bit of an overwhelming slide, but I'm going to, oh, Sue says that she's getting feedback. Um, I can pause and see if others are. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and keep going because I, I, I don't want to, the slide to be overwhelming and I wanna get everyone oriented to it. Um, so what you'll see here is a table. Um, on the right side of the table, there's columns for each of the five states that our lab is, is looking into the history of eugenic sterilization. So we have California, North Carolina, Iowa, Michigan, and Utah. And the purpose of this table is to show the way that, you know, once we embark on quantitative research together, we need to really be systematic and as consistent as is possible with these really rich and complex histories and the type of information that we have from each of the five states. So um, we list the number of records we have from each state, which ranges from 800 in Utah, which is the rightmost column, to um, over 20,000 in California, which is the, the most aggressive um, implementation of, implementer of eugenic sterilization in the United States. Um, we'll talk more at the end about the permissions and ethical approvals for each of the different state records we have, but that's a really important consideration, especially as we begin to overlap with health research, which has its own um, strict um, ethical regulations, um, often for good reason. Um, and then we think, start to think about our variables. So um, in quantitative research, you always want to be very clear about how you're defining what you're measuring. Um, and wherever possible, we try to be consistent across the states. So the rows in that section of this table include age, gender, birthplace, race or ascribed race, um, Latino ethnicity, diagnosis, whether or not consent was given. We'll talk more about this, but we often use consent in scare quotes because it would not be what today we would consider to be true consent. Um, the relationship of the person who gave consent to the patient, and then whether or not the sterilization was ultimately approved. And I'll just say, as you think about all those variables, a lot of those are socially constructed things. I, race and Latino ethnicity diagnosis all stand out as things that um, we inevitably in quantitative research have to make categories um, for things that are, are should not always be classified in really distinctive terms. But for the purposes of this work to really give a sense for the scope and the population impact of eugenic sterilization, we do our best to um, use categories that were consistent with the ways people were defining things in the time, even if we're critical of those classifications, so that we can understand the ways that um, the programs played out, the biases that played out in the programs. And then lastly, and really importantly, the last section of this table talks about the qualitative information that we also abstract from the sterilization records. So a core commitment of this work is, although we're using quantitative methods to get at the scope of uh, the impact of sterilization and to identify some really important population level patterns, we never want to lose sight of the individual people, um, over 35,000 people who, who are behind each of these data points, um, and also their families, the communities they came from. So wherever possible, with all the challenges folks discussed yesterday of, of bringing people to life it, through records that came from you know violent um, and oppressive systems, we try to document qualitative information about the, the reasons that they were claiming that this person was unfit to reproduce, um, glimpses of the person's real life, descriptions of the consent process, often including objections or forms of resistance from the people who are um, being uh, considered for sterilization, other family members, and then the other notes on family history. And notably, I'll say there's also people who, who wanted for their own reasons to be sterilized, perhaps as a form of birth control, and they're also navigating this um, system. And we gathered those records as well. Um, so to the next slide, 
I just wanted to briefly show, you know, that's a big picture, all the types of information we'd like to have in data sets so we can pursue quantitative analysis. And I'll just briefly walk you through the process. You know, how do we turn archival records into really rigorous databases? Um, and so this all began uh, before I got involved in the project when our PI, um, Dr. Stern, who gave the introduction yesterday, was in the California um, archives for the Department of Mental Health. And uh, one of the staff in the archives pointed her towards a set of 19 microfilm reels that included all of those 20,000 plus sterilization recommendation forms that ultimately have gone into our database. Um, they also included other records such as the so-called consent forms and correspondence between patients, their families and institutions. And the time period of those records spans 1919 to 1953. On the left side of this slide, you'll see an image with the logo of the California Department of Mental Health. And you'll also see an image of file cabinets in an archive. If you go to the next slide, you'll get a sense for the type of records that we've worked with. Um, these are very bureaucratized processes in California. Um, and so this is a very standard form where they can collect um, at the top, you can see the form says recommendation and approval for vasectomy or salpingectomy, which is tubal ligation for the purpose of sterilization. And it goes on to list in a bureaucratic way, a, a lot of the information they would document in this recommendation form. So it includes the patient's name, which in this image is blocked out, the institution. Um, and then it goes on to have a lot of things that, you know, in health research, we would consider to be socio-demographic information, people's age, where they were born, religion, education, marital status, their ascribed sex, um, number of children, as well as family history, clinical history, the specific legal provision of California state eugenics law under which this person was recommended, um, and then pieces of information about the consent and the, ultimately the approval process. So you can see that this form actually lends itself to becoming a data set quite well because information is collected in the exact same way for each person. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, you can see the process we used. We use a, a platform called Research Electronic Data Capture or REDCAP. Um, this is a platform that's often used for clinical trials or other medical research, um, but it's also a, a flexible platform that can handle complex data. So it works well for our project. Um, and so Natalie and Kate O'Connor, who you, you'll hear from later, both really took the lead um, in developing a, a form that all this information could be input into. So on the right side of this page, you'll see an image with the interface with the REDCap platform. So it has some of the same fields that you saw in the original archival record, and now they're um, entered into this sort of computerized uh, data system. And as you can see, um, there are ultimately 212 variables for the state of California, and over 20,000 records were ultimately entered. If you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to share, you know, our process for making these data sets has to vary from state to state. Um, in the case of Iowa, which is um, where, where I grew up and um, where Juan and I are both affiliated with the University of Iowa, the records there could not be digitized um, because of the particular policies of the State Archives of Iowa. They must be accessed in person. So we recruited an incredible team. In this image, you can see a group of uh, about high teens number of people. Um, and we're all outside a building that says research center on it. It's mostly undergraduates. Everyone is smiling in the sun. Um, and I'll tell you, because I know I'm in the picture on the left. This was um, right before uh, one of our long days of data entry on a Saturday in the spring of 2019 in the state archives. Um, so they, I'll, it's remarkable that they look that happy when they're about to go do data entry. But I think it was a really, um, eye-opening and, and motivating experience for many of the students involved. If you go to the next slide, you'll see what it looked like because we couldn't um, actually take images of the records. The students actually entered the information from the records into our computer system while they were in the archives. So although we weren't allowed to take pictures of these records, we were allowed to take notes and the archive agreed that this process of making a data set was just a kind of very structured form of note taking. Um, and you can also see the students 
students talking to one another as they entered the data. I think that was a really important piece of this project, um, both for the rigor of our data entry that they were all checking in with each other and ensuring they were entering things consistently. And I'll also say for the well-being of the students, um, as was mentioned yesterday, these are, are traumatizing histories. Um, they shouldn't be forgotten, but we also need to care for ourselves and for young people who are learning and really facing the, the violence of these histories. So um, we would take breaks every morning and every afternoon to just check in share how people were feeling, cases that they found interesting. Um, and I think that by the end, the students had learned a lot, but also had um, a set of concepts and, and also just tools to process this, this history that they had um, encountered together. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see uh, a lot of them ended up um, kind of developing their own interest and in analysis. So this is a poster session that they did as part of the College of Public Health Research Week at the end of that semester. And I'll, I'll just say for me personally in public health, uh, a field that often you know, sees itself as um, having very good intentions, understanding this history is an important cautionary tale um, uh, about the ways that, that the maternalist reformers and folks that everyone talked about yesterday um, could ultimately perpetuate a lot of harm, um, even with uh, good intentions or in purportedly good intentions. Um, so if you continue the slides, I'll move along pretty quickly. Um, to analyze this data, we also complement it with other sources of data. So this slide says integrating census data, and it has an image, which is a screenshot of the census broadsheet from the early 20th century. I believe that this one is gonna be from 1930. Um, and what you can see here is these were handwritten records where they were going to the institutions in this case to document all of the people um, who were institutionalized there. We use that data to create population denominators. Um, so by age, by sex, by race, who are the total number of people institutionalized and how are the people who are ultimately recommended from sterilization uh, different than the general institutionalized population over the, or the overall California population. You'll see cases of um, how we use the census data to estimate sterilization rates from um, Marie and Juan, uh, my colleagues who will be presenting later. But if we continue along here, you can see our first paper that we published using this method where we um, looked at the ways that Latinos were disproportionately impacted by California's state eugenics program um, among many other groups. Um, so we used our sterilization data set in conjunction with the census data to look at rates of sterilization. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, we found that Latino men who were institutionalized in California were about 23% more likely to be sterilized than non-Latino men in state institutions, um, and that Latino women experienced an even more disproportionate risk of sterilization relative to non-Latinas. Um, it's about 59% higher. Um, and this was published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2018. One other analysis we've applied to this, and this will connect to a panel you'll hear from later today, along with um, Cynthia Chandler, who gave the dedication, is we used life table methods or kind of estimates of life expectancy to estimate how many people who are affected, who are sterilized under California state program who um, might still be alive today. Um, and so we used one of the oldest epidemiological methods on the books, <laughs> um, just how long do, or do people live? And if you go to the next slide, you'll see we applied those probabilities to our data set. And originally when we published this analysis, we estimated that there were 831 surv living survivors of California's state eugenics sterilization program. We continue to update it each year. And un unfortunately, this is a an rapidly aging population. We estimate that the maximum now would be around 380 survivors. These estimates um, are important both for just understanding how these policies live on today, and they've also informed the legislative efforts um, to pay compensation to living survivors of the program. And you'll hear from the rest of the coalition um, who worked on that later today. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to other panelists. Um, thank you. Okay, um, so our uh, next panelist 
was unable to be here with us in person, but we have, thanks to technology, a recording of her talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that now. We'll put up. Hello everyone, my name is Marie Konecki and today I'm presenting on the patterns of coercive sterilization among Asian immigrants in California's eugenic sterilization program. I will also briefly describe a new project about the intersection of sterilization and Japanese incarceration during World War II. The U.S. has a long history of discriminatory immigration rhetoric, which was often rooted in the same ideologies that motivated eugenic sterilization. An early example of such rhetoric is shown in this anti-Chinese cartoon on the left. Medicalization of the border coincided with the eugenics movement and cast racialized immigrants as inferior, undesirable, and prone to disability. Angel Island Public Health Inspectors detained and excluded immigrants off the coast of California. If invasive medical exams found them unfit or likely to be a public charge because of disability or chronic disease. Hundreds of poems were carved into the Angel Island barrack walls by these Asian immigrant detainees, like these two poems shown on the right. Within California's borders, officials blamed the foreign born for disease outbreaks and California's high rates of insanity. The California Department of Institutions established its own deportation office, highlighting concern about mental illness and disability in immigrants. In California, racialization of Asians disrupted the predominant American narrative of the black-white racial dichotomy. Immigration restrictions grouped additional Asian ethnicities together after successive immigration increases from different countries of origin. This slide presents a timeline of some of these immigration policies and court decisions. Public health policies and practices reified Asians as a racialized group through yellow peril narratives cleanliness crusades, and birth rate monitoring. Gendered immigration restrictions helped create a largely male Asian immigrant population, feeding the same concerns about deviant sexuality and race mixing directed toward Asian men and women. The Immigration Act of 1924 contributed to legal, social, and scientific constructions of race, blending race, nationality, and ethnicity for non-whites while disentangling them for whites and Europeans. So the boundaries of the Asian race were in flux, those narratives adapted over time to racialize Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Korean, and Filipino immigrants, and Hawaiian-born Asians. This historical context and the documented disproportionate sterilization of other marginalized groups prompted the following research questions. Do certain characteristics differ for Asian versus non-Asian nativity patients recommended for sterilization? And were Asian immigrants disproportionately at risk of sterilization? We calculated descriptive statistics for the population recommended for sterilization using the digitized sterilization form data set from California. We restricted the sterilization data set to 13,499 people with complete sex and nativity information recommended for sterilization between 1920 and 1945. Since sterilization forms did not systematically report race, nativity of China, Hawaii, India, Japan, Korea, or the Philippines designated membership in a racialized Asian nativity group of about 300. We combined sterilization counts from the sterilization data set with individual level census microdata of California's institutionalized population to calculate annual sterilization rates. The original census enumeration sheets available on Ancestry.com and pictured on the left have been digitized and compiled into a data set by ITOMS USA. The original instructions to enumerators shown on the right were helpful in determining how the institutionalized population was enumerated and how nativity was listed in each census. The Asian nativity population recommended for sterilization is more likely to be older, male, sterilized between 1925 and 1929 and married and had a higher average number of children. A higher proportion of Asian nativity patients were diagnosed with psychiatric or mental illness. Conversely, Asian nativity patients 
were underrepresented in homes for the feeble minded and in social, behavioral, cognitive, developmental, and physical diagnoses. Finally, most Asian nativity patients did not consent to the procedure, with no consenter being available. The figure on the left shows sterilization rates among California's institutionalized population on the Y axis and year on the X axis, stratified by gender and nativity. The rates for non Asian nativity women and non Asian nativity men are represented by the blue and the red lines, respectively. Annual sterilization rates among Asian nativity men, represented by the orange dashed line, peaked just after 1925. Sterilization rates peaked later for Asian Nativity women, represented by the green line around 1930. Asian Nativity women had the highest sterilization rates across most of the study period, and their risk of sterilization was one and a half times higher than that of non Asian Nativity women. Asian Nativity men had a statistically significant higher risk of sterilization than non Asian Nativity men prior to 1933 and lower risk of sterilization after 1933. The results of our study are impactful, but our methods do have their limitations. While the history of Spanish colonization of the Philippines likely leads to some overlap between the Asian nativity group defined in this study and the Spanish surname group previously studied, much of the Spanish surname population would have been classified as non-Asian nativity in this study. Therefore, our results showing the disproportionate sterilization of the Asian nativity population likely underestimate the full impact of eugenic sterilization on Asian immigrants, given the simultaneous disproportionate sterilization of California's Latinx population. Additionally, we were unable to adjust statistical models for age and institution. Finally, using nativity to define membership in a racialized Asian immigrant group excludes second generation Asian Americans who may have experienced similar discrimination. This exemplifies a common limitation of quantitative methods. They often require creating classifications that are interesting and useful, though imperfect in nature. To minimize the impact of these limitations, we built upon extensive historical, humanities, and social science research to inform our quantitative methods and definitions of Asian as a racialized group, since race is so specific to time and place. We are also very intentional about our language, such as using the terms Asian nativity and non-Asian nativity instead of Asian and non-Asian in order to be clear about what our classifications capture and how best to interpret the results. Acknowledging and contextualizing the limitations of these classifications strengthens the integrity of our interdisciplinary approach. While working on the quantitative analysis of Asian nativity and sterilization, my colleagues showed me two sterilization request forms that explicitly mentioned the patients having been incarcerated in war relocation authority camps during World War II. Amid an rising anti-Japanese sentiment, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942. Although the order does not mention any particular racial or ethnic group, the order was used to systematically and forcibly relocate over 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans, many of them US citizens from the Western United States without due process. They were first transported to hastily constructed assembly centers before being sent to more permanent concentration camps where they were incarcerated for most of the remainder of the war. This map depicts the locations of the camps. These camps under the administration of the newly created War Relocation Authority or WRA have become euphemistically known as internment camps. Knowing this history, I decided to see if I could find additional cases and quickly realized that exploring the intersection of Japanese incarceration with California's eugenic sterilization program requires a different approach than my usual quantitative lens. I have since identified 39 sterilization survivors that were connected with the camp through different pathways based on evidence in our records and publicly available War Relocation Authority records. A quantitative report published by the WRA in 1946, which includes this figure, tells us that 1,275 people of Japanese descent were in institutions before passing into WRA custody. Of that number, 518 people were physically transferred to a WRA camp 
and 757 people remained institutionalized but were transferred to the administrative and financial custody of the WRA. After the closure of the camp, 1,322 people previously in WRA custody were institutionalized across the country. These are some of the pathways of sterilization in the context of this carceral environment. Sterilizations that took place while the executive order was in effect were conducted under additional layers of coercion. Sterilizations that took place after the war and the closure of the camp may speak to the relationship between trauma, institutionalization, and lingering anti-Japanese sentiment. To conclude, I'd like to comment on the legacy of the eugenics movement and contemporary anti-Asian bias. From the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, scholars and activists noted that the anti-Asian sentiment of the past persists to this day despite the repeal of some of the more egregious immigration restrictions targeting Asians and the emergence of the model minority myth. The same ideologies prevalent in the eugenics era, which portrayed Asians as perpetual foreigners, racial others, and the embodiment of disease, have led to an alarming rise in discrimination and hate crimes targeting Asians in the United States. This rhetoric and violence exemplify the importance of contextualizing these injustices with their historical roots. Understanding the intersection of 20th century anti-Asian sentiment and eugenic sterilization can help us more effectively confront their lingering harm. If there are any questions, my wonderful colleagues can either answer them during the Q&A or pass along my contact information. Thank you. All right, and with that, I'm gonna pass it to Juan. Sounds great. I'm just opening up my slides real quick. Um, Okie dokie. Everyone can see my slides. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Juan Guadino. I'm a research associate at the University of Iowa. I use the in pronouns, and today I'll be discussing an ongoing project analyzing immigration and eugenics um, in California that I've conducted with the quantitative team on our sterilization and social justice lab for the past year. I first joined SSJ in 2018, 2019 as um, in the pictures that Nicole had showed previously um, at the Iowa State Archives where we developed a data set on Iowa State eugenics law. I was in the beginning stages of grad school starting to really reflect on my parents' experiences navigating the U.S. as first-generation immigrants, and of course, my own journey in living in Iowa. The picture to the left is an old photograph of my family, my parents in their mid-30s, and my brothers and myself as children. Um, to the right is an Iowa cornfield in the summer shining on a beautiful day. I think these two pictures combined are those in which I, I really recognize as home I'm speaking to a group who knows this history well and understands the implication it has had on homes and families. To me, understanding this history has led to more questions. Why did my family and others like my family experience enormous barriers with immigration? What are the roots that we stand on and how might the contemporary issues we experience today tie to the past? It is no secret that various forms of immigration um, have been regarded as potential disruption to US values and norms. This is a scan of a cover page for a, a hearing regarding restrictive immigration policy in the 1920s, really attempting to showcase the biology or heredity of immigration. Harry Laughlin, one of the leaders in the US eugenics movement testified at these hearings and is quoted on saying that an American race exists. This is a new race while created by a transplanted people is nonetheless a race of white people established by its white founders. Understanding that eugenics and nativism are linked through social policies and ideologies, how could we capture some of these experiences using a quantitative approach? So for the past year, that's, that's really I've been exploring that, that question with all of these experiences in mind, um, with more specifically, how does region of birth capture those who are sterilized in California's state eugenics program comp compared to US born individuals? Um, today, I will discuss some of the aims that we set out to, to, to showcase and, 
and some of the preliminary results from this ongoing study. I'm gonna uh, just pause. I see I, I'm getting a lot of chat, so I just wanna make sure everything's okay. Uh, okay. All Sorry, right. Juan, we're good. <laughs> oh no, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm good to go. Um, so, so for the first aim of my, the study, uh, really consisted of developing descriptive statistics among those recommended for sterilization by these regions of nativity. We used the 1930s as a reference point, first listing all the countries, territories, states that existed during this time. Once this list was made, uh, then we began researching regions that existed based on US historical classifications and categorized this list into these particular regions. At the bottom, um, is an example of the types of historical documents we would use to guide our classification. This is from the US Census Statistical Archives where they have stratified Europe into four different regions with countries into these regions being listed as well. Um, and so we also consulted with a wide variety of historians on our team for, for guidance in, in this area. So here's a list of the regions that we ended up developing. And in public health, as Nicole had mentioned previously, we, we often struggle with sorting to account for statistical power while acknowledging properly all groups and experiences. So we understand that this might not be the perfect categorization, but for what we aim to study, this is our current list of regions of the world. In our data set, place of birth is listed as a nativity variable. So once we match countries or states into regions, we could categorize our nativity variable into a new region variable. So for example, if nativity was listed as California, then we could then categorize that region into the United States. If nativity is listed as Spain, then we could categorize that region into Southern Europe. And so we did that for our entire data, data set to get these, this new re region variable, which would allow us to examine annual sterilization rates over time. Um, so the, essentially, uh, Marie did such a great job of, of showcasing this, but really just how can we see if disproportionate rates may or may not have existed between these different um, regions of the world. And so some notable findings that we have right now, 17% of the roughly 15,000 uh, or 16,000 people that we analyzed, sterilized before 1945 in California were non-native immigrants over 40% of immigrants did not provide documented consent to sterilization compared to 16% of US born individuals. But it's also important to note that consent um, is, is in quotations for a reason. It was, is, and um, overall non native immigrants were 23% less likely to be sterilized than US born individuals. So if we leave this at the pooled rate, which is what this is, um, we're really left with one story, but the reality is this is a program which disproportionately impacted women and girls and immigrants from regions noted as less fit. So when we stratify by gender and region of nativity, we're painted with a different picture. This is our some preliminary results, but to orient you to the graph on the x-axis, we have our, an incident risk ratio. So where anything to the right of one is seen as a harmful factor or a higher risk for sterilization versus the comparison, which in, in this case is US born individuals, anything to the left of one is seen as a protective factor or less likely to be sterilized than US born individuals. On the Y axis, we have our regions of nativity, regions to the left of one or lower risk of sterilization versus US born individuals consist of women and girls from Canada, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Northwestern Europe and the Middle East. Regions to the right of one or having a higher risk of sterilization versus US born individuals are women and girls from Mexico and Southern Europe. Um, for men and boys, although men and boys from Canada, we have, we have the same graph depicted. Uh, um, although men and boys from Canada, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Northwestern Europe and the Middle East still have protective factors for sterilization versus US born boys and men. No immigrant group for men and boys had a significant incident risk ratio greater than one. So overall, we found that immigrant women and girls from Southern Europe and Mexico were more likely to be sterilized than US born women and girls. But this doesn't mean of course that individuals from other regions who weren't statistically significant or individuals from the US were not important because they were. Um, 
I think it's, it's, this is uh, an ongoing analysis, which depicts really one side of the story, building on the overall work conducted over the years. So some future goals that we hope to move this a little bit more forward, uh, conducting a sensitivity analysis on our regional classification, and then of course, adding a time intervals to analyze sterilizations over time. And then the orange but butterfly at the bottom is, is a symbol of migration. It is a beautiful and natural plight as of the monarchs. And I just wanted to showcase that this is a part of our human story. So with that being said, here are my references. Um, I'm gonna pass the baton off to our next presenter. All right, um, I am going to give a very, very abbreviated version of my talk, but the whole talk is available on that link that I just dropped. Um, maybe I am, if it's gonna let me. Um, so I am doing research on the Michigan uh, sterilization records. Um, very, very briefly, there was a law that was or that was proposed in 1897. It's the one that ended up being the one that um, most people were sterilized under. The targeted quote feeble-minded, insane, epileptic people, moral degenerates, and sexual perverts end quote. Michigan, unlike most other states, did not have a centralized authorizing body to um, either collect or give permission for sterilizations. Instead, it was left up to county probate officers and the heads of institute of individual institutions. Because of that, we only have about a thousand records. The ones that survived um, were done because they were sent to the State Board of Welfare for permission, mostly as a, a legal precaution, and they were saved as administrative files. Um, uh, the, until now, Michigan sterilization records come from the Human Betterment Foundation, which say that 3,786 people were sterilized, 74% of whom were women, and 76% of whom were labeled to be blinded. Um, I'm not gonna do this whole quote, but Michigan becomes a um, borderland, or it had always been a borderland, but it becomes a place of unauthorized migration, which causes xenophobic um, backlash in Michigan. And for a significant period, the, the immigration coming in over the Detroit-Windsor border was more um, prevalent than even over the US-Mexico border. And one of the quote problems, end quote, of um, Southern and East or Southern and Eastern European migration coming over the Windsor border is that you couldn't differentiate people based solely on appearance like you could in the um, Pacific Northwest and the US Mexico border. This is just, oops, my apologies. This is just um, data from 437 records, I think, that I analyzed. I did the ethnicity of patients. Um, that I used the ethnicity that was either listed in their chart in their um, folder, or I used or I classified their surname by ethnic origin. So it's a rough way to do ethnicity, but it's at least enough to give a snapshot. Um, for all patients, so both in um, mental health hospitals and people minded homes, this was the ethnic breakdown. For English, it was 139 patients. German, it was 55 patients. Irish, 41. Black and Polish were each at 30. Dutch was at 27. Scottish, 20. Swedish and Native American were both at nine. Um, Lapeer, which was the home for the feeble-minded, um, was one the most prolific sterilization uh, 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 <coughs> place, and it was also um, it was, sorry, it was the largest place that sterilized patients. And the, most of the patients here were young and, the, um, and women. Um, the ethnicity of patients recommended for sterilization at Lapeer are broken down like this. English was 19% of patients, Black, 19% of patients, Irish, 15%, Polish and German, each 13%, Native American, 5%, French and Dutch, each 4%. And then other is eight. Um, to put that into context of the time, the black population in Michigan was only about three to four percent of the population in the 1930s and 40s, which is when these records come from, compared to 19% of sterilization recommendations. 
Um, at Lapeer, the Native American population was less than 1% and 5% of the sterilization recommendations and less than 0.1% of all the patients uh, for both types of institutions was less than 0.1% because it was because people would be deported instead of institutionalized and sterilized. Um, these are just some quotes I pulled out because I, I try not to reduce people to numbers, um, but that reflected the racial thinking of the time. One is says, quote, since she is colored, it is generally permissible to add about 10 points to her IQ. Another one says, quote, unusually well poised in social situations for an Indian. And the last one is, quote, heavy, solid Polish uh, fasces. In Michigan, um, mental health records are protected indefinitely. There is no uh, way for them to become public, unlike in other states. Um, and because the privacy laws are so strict and there's relatively small numbers, a lot of categories require consolidation, which of course gets rid of a lot of nuances in the data. Um, and then qualitative versus quantitative approach, Nicole already covered. And then in Michigan, like I said, because there was no central authorizing body, most of the patient records have been lost. Um, the most we have for a lot of patients is just lists of names. And with that, I will turn it over to Q&A. All right. I think Sue's having some feedback. Um, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion today. Um, there's so much, so much, so rich, so much rich information provided. I would like to begin. Um, we have a few minutes uh, to ask a, a couple of questions that did appear in the Q and A, and one I think is very fascinating to think about. One asks, um, "What do you all think is the most effective way to present, to share, to analyze the qualitative material you uncover?" So the qualitative. Anyone? I can begin to respond, but I, I think it's a question that we're working through as a lab as well. So I, I would welcome uh, insights from the audience. Um, I think one important piece is that um, the lab actually has uh, two projects under it. So this is the, the portion that's been funded by the National Institutes of Health. But there's a second uh, portion, which Dr. Stern, Alex mentioned yesterday, um, Alex Stern and Jackie Warnemont of Dartmouth co-lead a digital archive. Um, and so there's a lot of cross pollination uh, with stories that we encounter in our work and the digital storytelling that they'll be doing through that digital archive, which aims to make a lot of the, the human faces of this history visible. And then when presenting our quantitative findings in articles or when we're presenting to, for example, audiences in public health or medicine, we're always in, intentional about presenting in, examples of cases, individual people's stories um, to give a sense for it. The, I think the other piece I'll, I'll mention is that we often get more questions when you when you analyze something quantitatively, you find a pattern, but it doesn't usually tell you the uh, causal pathway or the reason that pattern emerges. Um, and so our, you know, our next frontier is really a, this more of a mixed methods approach where when we are presenting our findings, we will interweave um, the quantitative analyses such as those that Juan and Marie shared today with um, stories that give insight to why these patterns may have been emerging. Um, I'll just briefly say our analysis of the consent process is a really good example of something where you need to interwave um, stories and actual kind of cases from the archives with the patterns we see and how consent was, uh, so-called consent was granted. Thanks for that question. We had a question from Milton in the chat. Uh, what additional questions have surfaced as your research has revealed the differential experiences of racialization that you weren't initially entertaining? Does anyone else on the on our team wanna take that one? I think we might've lost Natalie. I'm here. I'm just rereading re the question in the chat. I, I will say, I think the the analysis that that Marie presented um, kind of shows a, an example of an answer to that question. So she initially came to us interested in the disproportionate impact on Asian Americans, and then through that started to realize that that it the particular 
pathways to sterilization for especially folks of Japanese origin um, intersected with the internment camps in the U.S. and has it led to more of an archival type process um, to understand the particular ways that that community was affected um, during that time. Juan, I know that you, um, I, I, I will say also, I, I don't know if anything we found yet is something we didn't necessarily expect based on, for example, Natalie's previous scholarship um, about immigration and, and race in California. So the finding of um, Southern European women being disproportionately sterilized actually is pretty consistent with what the ways that people from Portugal, from Spain, from Italy were talked about in that time. Is there anything else you would add, Juan or Natalie? I would just add to that, like um, doing this um, research and trying to uh, document these histories of racialization really point to the constructedness of these racial categories. And um, again, to like draw from Marie's work as an example, the Asian nativity um, category comes from a part of the sterilization form that is marked in nativity. And so we've had a lot of discussions around, and, and one of her results um, of, of the analysis of that category was that um, there were higher proportions of Asian immigrants being sterilized in the institutions for the mentally ill versus the institutions for the so-called feeble-minded. And so something that we talk a lot about is how that specific category doesn't um, capture the experiences of second generation or first generation, second generation um, Asian folks who are not born outside of the US. And so younger um, folks who were in these um, institutions for the people minded. And so, you know, we're constantly having to um, really think critically about the categories that we were using to document this history of racialization and how, you know, because race, because of the constructiveness of race, how difficult it is to get like a precise um, uh, measure and how like that's okay. Like that's the, the point of kind of going back and doing this collective research. Can I just add that it's just so amazing to see the work that you all have done, the data science, right? Was I'm sort of learning. I've used those records. Alex Stern was so generous. She's generous and allowed me, helped me access those records for my own research. And just looking at the documents, I just looked at one thing. I mean, it was overwhelming to think that it could even be, you know, <clears throat> calculated or turned out in ways that are so productive. And then to be able to put that flesh on the bone, right? Which you are all working on the bones the structure, the skeleton. And I think the qualitative is what sort of adds that, that flesh on the bone. And another point about the Asian, Asian American sort of, that was, you know, wow, I'd never knew about that. And I think that context, as you all are mentioning, right? So important in understanding and being able to interpret what's happening, especially why the numbers are going down in the thirties and forties when internment, right? There's like other structures who are taking over. I mean, if you want to look at it that way that are taking over sort of the controlling of these bodies, right? These, so it's, I think that you, the work that you're doing is amazing. Thank you to all of you, so. We have another question if there's time, uh, or should we stop? Um, you could take one more. But we had a question from Ella Kello and Ella, I wonder, oh, um, you're, you're a panelist. I wonder if you want to ask it yourself. Oh, can I do that? Can you hear me? You can. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm still learning the little the rules today of, of this interface. Um, okay. So yeah. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Um, that was wonderful and really, really interesting um, work. I'm, I'm fascinated. I, um, I echo Miroslav and that I, I really didn't understand the interplay between um, uh, internment and, and control of disabled Asian bodies is really fascinating. Thank you. Um, my question is, is if, if this was something that came up for you, um, what people or resources did you find useful to understanding how sterilization of American Indian and Alaska Native people, and I think for you guys it was, would have been American Indian uh, almost entirely, um, was, 
um, understanding that in the context of like the larger empiric project, I just think because you're overlapping with periods of Native American studies, like the termination period and um, big land grabs. So I'm wondering if there was any um, any uh, bandwidth to focus on that if you did and who uh, was useful to you. Um, I can just say very, very briefly from Michigan, it, I haven't yet, and that's mostly because I haven't encountered as many Native Americans in the, um, in the uh, as files as I had anticipated. And even ones I know for sure, because there was one family of eight kids that came forward that were um, Ottawa, who said that they were sterilized and their records do not indicate that they are Native American. So I know that we're like in, in the sterilization files. So I, one of my next projects is actually figuring out what resources are available and um, going from there. But it, yeah, it, it's very interesting that it wasn't listed in their patient file, what their race was. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know I know that family and obviously they had a great deal of litigation. I don't think it was ever questioned that they were native um, during the litigation, but I can think of many reasons they would not have listed them as Indian during that period. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. So that's, I'll just add, sorry, if I can just add really quickly um, that there, you know, were a, a few cases um, in California and I, I drew from, um, archival documents from social workers in California that actually talked about the, the difficulties or the way they tried to work around um, uh, transferring uh, Native youth from residential schools to the state institutions and really like this interesting um, conversation around who was gonna pay for that, like how to get the federal government to pay for that. Um, and I think the, um, you know, there are histories written about institutionalization in Hiawatha, which was a, a federally uh, established uh, institution for um, American Indian folks, I think, in, in the early 20th century. And I think, you know, that work has been useful for understanding those experiences and particularly, you know, uh, work by, um, Pamina Yellowbird, who writes about those experiences. So, so I, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on, on that for California, but also across the states, because we know we have some um, people who were labeled Indian in the North Carolina data set as well. So we Thank need you. to stop to give a break uh, briefly, and uh, we'll come back at 11 for the next panel. Um, Thank you so much for, <clears throat> for everyone here on the panel today. We really, really appreciate um, all the work that you're doing. So thank you for taking the time. It's been wonderful. All right. See you all in 10. I'm going to take a quick break. Hey, Nate. Howdy, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Doing good. Good, so do you want me to be your click through person or are uh, you gonna, um, do you wanna switch over when it's time so you can do it yourself? Uh, no, if you could be my clicker person, that would be really, really awesome. Okay, yeah, will do. All right, I will see you in a few then. Thank you very much. Oh, and I want to let you know, I'm, I talked to Lucy. She was, you were right. She was very happy to be sort of let off the hook. She was just really overwhelmed. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I don't blame her one bit. <laughs> All right. See you in a little bit. Bye. Awesome. Thank you.
Sutra, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound good right now. I doubled. That's that was so bizarre. <laughs> it was a little funny. Yeah, no, you're okay now though. I, I, you know, every once in a while something happens that is like, you know, how? <laughs> but anyway, no. Yeah, happened. this is a different universe here, Zoom, and we're trying to figure it out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you are doing so great. Thank you so uh, you much. You both too. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go off for five minutes <laughs> or four. See you in a bit. All right, I'm back. I'm back and only one, one okay. at the <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> there's two, Sue. <laughs> if I had more.
were mixed feelings about the material, I would have some explanation, but I have none. I... That's okay. All right, we have our next. All right. I'll just, uh -huh. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Amy. There's Carlos. All right, I think we're, we're ready. Welcome back, everyone. Um, this morning, it's still morning here on the, on the West Coast, um, a little gray here where I'm living. Uh, well, welcome to have everybody back to our session today, to our symposium on eugenics in California and the world. So this morning we have our, our third panel. Um, we, we are continuing from yesterday and this morning's panel is on ableism, anti-blackness and racism, eugenics in the present. And today we have Ella Callow and Nate Tilton from UC Berkeley. And then we will have um, Amy Medeiros and Carlos Martinez from UC San Francisco. So I will be posting, again, we have our ASL interpreters and I will post now the live captioning link in our chat. Who would like to go first, Ella? Thank you. Sure, okay, let me share screen here. And I'm gonna go ahead and be the clicker for Nate too. So we'll just keep this one up throughout. All right, everybody see the slides okay? All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to participate. So we're going to be looking at eugenics in the context of child welfare system, particularly and the risks around and prevention of the civil death penalty for disabled parents and their children, which is the termination of parental rights. Why does this matter? Why, why do we want you to think about this? Child welfare is not a system many people think about as anything other than benevolent. Um, hopefully this audience is a little more uh, savvy on that front. But generally because children are traumatized by removal from their parents, they're at risk of severe levels of violence and out of place care. And termination of their parent-child relationship is considered so severe that it is likened in case law to the civil death penalty. The state removal should only be undertaken when there's a, no choice to keep the child safe. It should never be undertaken as the result of uh, eugenicist theories uh, regarding fitness or unfitness. I'm going to break this into a few sections. First, I'm going to give you the backstory, talk about the eras of um, parenting and eugenics uh, in the last hundred years, talk about the law, talk about this parent population um, and issues that are occurring now. So what I call era one is the 1914 to 1940s period. And really the state is focused on preventing parenting. So, you know, everyone knows the uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, in 1914, the Eugenics Records Office there issued bulletin number 10B report on the committee to study and to report on the best practical means of cutting off the defective germ plasm in the American population. Um, in this, this oddly titled brief, Dr. Harry Laughlin, famous eugenicist, researcher, or academic, states unequivocally that the basis of designation for sterilization is in fact inferior parenthood. Um, by the end of the 1920s, we have a test case, Bell v. Buck, um, for the model legislation that Cold Harbor and Laughlin were pushing. Um, and they uh, wanted to see if uh, involuntary sterilization and institutionalization on the basis of disability to prevent parenthood could survive a constitutional analysis, particularly survive 14th and Fourth Amendment uh, constitutional analysis. It did. And by the 1930s, you have 30 state legislatures with these formal eugenics laws for sterilization and institutionalization. The summative goal is, is basically achieved right there at that point the, to, to deny parenthood to those who are manifestly unfit in the best interests of society. Um, I'm going to be highlighting for the, the race portion, the interplay with American Indian Alaska Native um, people in this period. So. Um, you see the Indian asylums like Canton, also called Hiawatha, um, and the Morningside Asylum, which is less known or studied, epitomize the era's uh, racialization of the eugenics zeitgeist. To the right is an image of a, a sort of scary black and white picture of an institution, and that's actually an asylum in Vermont. In era two, we're looking at the 50s to the 70s, generally in the parenting milieu. Um, and at this point, we're looking at policing parenting. So because of the association of Nazism with explicit eugenics, um, we see that that things uh, messaging is 
highly altered an approach, but there's still steril sterilization and institutionalization. So we have eugenicists like the Kelloggs and Campbell brothers, sort of um, infamous folks, groups like the Birthright Group. They're focusing on multiple types of eugenics and sterilization of the general population, not just those they can sort of catch out in state custody, right? Um, and they're reaching out to institutions and influential professional guilds, including social workers. Um, we know generally that um, in, in this period, there's targeting of Latinx women um, in the West and the Southwest, Native women in the West, the prairies, the Northeast, African-American women in the South and the Midwest, um, all over different things are happening, but along the same lines. And uh, we have explicitly that it is still disability centered, designated to check the reproduction of defectives, quote unquote, wherever they may be found in institutions or at large, whatever the class, the race, et cetera, which is a, a quote from a birthright group. I have a picture here of um, on the right of women protesting uh, sterilization of mothers and the violations of the UN charters at that time is what they're focused on. Um, it targeted the poor uh, and it became complex, pushes birth control tied to welfare eligibility embedded in Medicare funding to public entities. There were hearings in 73 at the Congress. There were protests over Indian health service practice. Um, ultimately, the Weather Underground actually bombed an SF uh, San Francisco federal building over this issue. Era three is the 80s to the 2000s. And at this point, what the state is working toward is recension or rescinding of parenthood. So in 74, we get the Child Abuse and uh, Protection and Treatment Act, which is the first time we're really having big federal funds coming into states who usually hold jurisdiction over child matters, um, citizen child matters of their state um, for the, the protection of abused and neglected kids. Concurrently, deinstitutionalization had at this point created an independent living movement um, or an independent living movement had created deinstitutionalization, however you want to look at that. In the 1980s, as the first wave of disabled parenthood is manifesting, states are choosing to include parental disabilities as a ground for removal and termination of parental rights. Um, and in, the, in 1997, the um, Adoption and Safe Family Act, another federal act, sort of doubles down on all of this by creating strict timelines for child welfare systems to either reunify or terminate parental rights to quote unquote, free children for adoption. Um, what's awful is that it's, it's, it specifically notes that in cases of a sexual abuse, chronic physical abuse or parental disability, that authority states have the discretion to um, dispense with due process, uh, reunification efforts being the due process in these cases, moving directly to TPR. All right, so what does the law generally say about parenting in this country? Parenting is sacrosanct in American law. Um, I have a note here, obviously poor and racialized parents never really counted there, but this is the state party line. Um, parenting is a civil right. It is established in US jurisprudential theory. This is a Rousseauian Lockean thread that runs through our laws. Um, the idea that the family is a, is a sacrosanct um, realm not given over to the government and there must be justification for intrusion. Um, it is constitutionally protected under the 14th and the Fourth Amendments. And we have a line of cases interpreting this and finding, um, and finding this to be so. Federal policy uh, recognizes this. Um, there have to be fitness standard violations to come into a family, remove a child. There must be due process, efforts to reunify. And the states recognize this in their law. Um, this is a bunch of lovely quotations on how important the parent-child relationship is, the rights uh, to remain, retain that relationship um, without unnecessary interference of the state is constitutionally protected. Uh, parents and children have a liberty interest in their care and companionship of one another. Custody of one's children is the most precious of all rights and the bonds between parent and child are in a word, saint. So when the, you do have termination of parental rights intrusion, the child welfare system is where this is happening. So it's a state entity responding and investigating where allegations of parental fitness um, uh, are alleged, uh, allegations of parental unfitness and petitioning dependency courts for the power to intervene, remove kids, put them in foster care, reunify them through uh, service efforts or adopt them out, otherwise to reorder custody. Um, this is the manifestation of the parents' patriotic power of the state over citizen children, the right of the state to act as a parent. The states promulgate their own statutes um, saying on what bases um, the, param the parents' patriotic power of the state can be engaged. 
We have 30 states still that allow parental disability as a grounds um, to exercise parents' patriarchal power for removal, bypass of due process reunification efforts, or termination of parental rights. Termination of parental rights is identified as the equivalent of a death penalty in Smith, 1977. The power to do so is an awesome power in the oddly titled Champagne v. Welfare, 84, and tantamount to civil death penalty in Drury v. Lang. So disabled parents, to the meat of it, prevalence and experience in child welfare. So let's look at the disabled parent population. Um, we know from the last American community survey um, in, in the last, at the beginning of this last decade, that there are 4.1 million parents, at least with reported disability. So 6.2% of the parenting population is disabled. They are parenting 10% of the kids in this country, 6.1 6 million kids, 18 and under. That number is higher for folks who are already overrepresented in child welfare. So 13.9% of American Indian Alaska Native folks that are parenting are disabled. And um, I believe it's 8.2, uh, 8.8% of African American parents have a disability. Um, I've done three studies over the, the, the period that I served as the legal director for the National Center of Parents with Disabilities and their children. This first study, I was looking at the National Child Abuse and Neglect data set, big data set, reports of confirmed maltreatment by states um, to the Department of Health and Human Services. 17 state sample we looked at, in it 12.9% of the parent population from whom children were removed were disabled. So they were over twice uh, disparately uh, uh, represented there. Another study, um, I looked at the fi case files, physical case files of three systems, one urban, one suburban, one rural. Um, when there was no screening, two of them had no screening mechanism in place, not required by law, um, there were 35 and 37% of the parent population were disabled respectively. In the one that had screening through a special grant, over 65% of the parent population is disabled. A lot of that mental health. Um, the third study, I analyzed 42 cases with intellectual or developmentally disabled parents. 86% um, of the time, IQ is used as evidence of unfitness, though it is um, patently pseudoscientific. Um, internationally, studies have shown it's not predictive of parenting capacity. And appellate courts upheld this 81% of the time in termination cases. Rates of involvement in custody law. So I gave you that number, 12.9% of parents um, from whom children were removed. That 17 state sample uh, were disabled, twice what it should be, quote unquote. Um, we also know that it's three times more likely that you'll have a child removed by child welfare as a parent if you were in special education as a child. 30 to 50% of intellectually or developmentally disabled parents are believed to lose custody of their children. 70 to 80 percent of parents with psychiatric disability that become involved in these cases lose custody of their children. 11 percent of parents with physical disabilities report discrimination in custody matters. We don't have as much data there. And deaf and blind parents, in my experience, the experience of um, representation groups um, report elevated level of interference with their child custody through different types of courts. Um, disparate impact by race. Again, I want to come back to American Indian and Alaska Native folks. So when I was doing the analysis of the INCANS data set, it revealed that 26% of children identified as American Indian or Alaska Native that were removed by the state um, were removed from caretakers with a disability. So that's a huge percentage. Um, parental mental illness is one of the grounds on which the American Indians uh, Indian Child Welfare Act can be circumvented by state courts. When these children are disproportionately removed into foster care, they're exposed to very high levels of violence because that system has high levels of violence. Um, they have a three times higher rate of suicide than the national average, which matches up to that of foster children. I'm interested in how much foster, um, fostering and removals has driven that suicide rate traditionally. Um, targeting uh, American Indian Alaska Native parents and traumatizing their children through these state mechanisms continues structural racism and colonialism that was inherent in the Indian boarding schools, Indian insane asylums, Indian adoption programs, et cetera. Where am I on time, Miroslav? She's gonna time keep for me. Okay, <laughs> all right, well, I'm almost done. Um, so we see these numbers and the parent, the, the question that should come up is, so why is parenting not so sacrosanct for these people, right? Why, why, are, why do we see these incredibly high levels of people coming into this system, um, being traumatized by this system, being at risk for and losing their children through these systems? 
eugenics. Eugenics history, what I've laid out, continues to inform the tacit social agreement that disabled people are manifestly unfit, and particularly to parent. Um, disability, you see this in the fact that disability is a status crime. Everything else that you can have your child taken for, your rights terminated for, is an action. You abuse them, you neglected them, you allowed them to be abused or to be neglected. Only disability um, is an actual status that you're criminalized for. Disabled parents is not a concept taught to the professional class because we disappear them because they're not supposed to exist, right? And, and so you see that. So in medical school, law school, social welfare programs, um, uh, in, in police trainings, um, in uh, educational training for teachers, nobody talks about parents and disability, that there are disabled parents. They are invisible. No one's learning about them. Um, this feeds into them being reported um, and into them being treated um, poorly in the system. They are often poor, underhoused, undereducated, low access to healthcare, transportation, and support systems. Child welfare is a poor people system. Rich people don't go to child welfare. And You're so, right you, 10 seconds, my apologies. Thanks, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, they're over surveilled. Ableism leaves a suspicion of society of them. There is poor practice and support, intervention, evaluation, and assessment, and racism is inter, inter, um, intervening here as well. The last era, era four to the present, is protecting parenting. So, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six items here that are particularly notable in that they settle the law and raise the profile of the issue. And we've gotten good outcomes around raising it as a constitutional issue to. Um, to the executive and Congress through Rocky McCradle, the first, um, uh, the first federal report on this. The Gordon case, the first time Department of Justice formalized their findings that 14th and 4th are implicated. Um, we also got guidelines to codify the position of the Department of Justice that the ADA applies the termination of parental rights and DOJ has Chevron deference. They are the interpreting entity for the, the ADA. 2016, Georgia had a settlement with DOJ saying that they can no longer deny the opportunity to foster and adopt out of that system based on disability. And in 2020, we got the first global settlement to overhaul an entire system of a state to address systemic ableism and deprivation of constitutional rights. In 2017, we published the first national analysis on prevalence, um, which is filling some holes in, um, in the uh, public debate and conversation about this. Um, but we still have an entire realm of things that need to be done. I don't have time to read them, but everything from enacting federal legislation to executive orders for interagency commissions um, and having a special um, focus on the intersection of the American Indian um, Indian Child Welfare Act and the ADA in these cases, there's still a lot of work to do to protect them from the civil death penalty. Okay, so Thank I am going- Thank you to... so much. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Wait, did um, I'm going to move to Nate now. Okay. Yes, thank you. Right? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> wait, wait, let's not go away. This is the same slide. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Slide. All right. So um, Nate Tilton is here, and he's going to talk about what the real lived experience is of being a parent with a disability in this fourth era, which is still rife with a lot of risk. Nate? Uh, thank you, Ella, very much, and thank you for that insight. Um, and I just want to give a quick image description. Uh, my, uh, this is a photo of myself, of uh, me, a smiling brown man standing in my dress blues, my military dress blues in front of a row of lockers. And then I'll introduce myself. Hello, my name is Nate Tilton. I'm a disabled veteran, anthropology graduate student, and the UC Berkeley Disability Lab Manager. And in 2007, I returned from my first deployment in Iraq. One day over the cold beer, my platoon sergeant, Staff Sergeant Edwards, and I were talking. He looks at me in the eye and he tells me, you have PTSD. Before this, I never even considered the possibility of having PTSD. In those moments, I felt guilt, shame, confusion, at the, even the thought of having PTSD or any sort of disability. Later that day, I shrugged it off and put in for another deployment, and I would later deploy three more times to Iraq and Afghanistan. My last deployment in 2012 left lasting effects that I continue to feel to this day and will continue for the rest of my life. I now require the assistance of mobility aids like my scooter and power chair, to get around. But you know, adapting to my chair and my scooter proved to be often a frustrating experience, not because of the disability, not because I was having a bad day at physical therapy, not because parts of my body didn't want to work right, but 
because of how frustrating and debilitating disabling ableist structures and policies are. You know, a, a lot of people are not comfortable around me or they don't know how to interact with me due to my disabilities. Or is it due to the constant bombardment of ableism and eugenics in the media or even in our schools? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, quick image description. Uh, it's my picture of myself, a brown man with long hair and a mask, sitting on my power scooter with my youngest son, Howie, a smiling child in a red Elmo shirt, and Starlin, the service dog, a yellow Labrador retriever. You know, even going to Cal or when I go to my kid's school, I'm automatically met with stares. I can feel people looking at me and I can feel their anxiety. I can feel they want me to go away. When I'm with my kids, I see some people want to call CPS or they're thinking about it until my partner comes around the corner and I see their physical sigh of relief. And it happens all the time. I saw a post on Facebook the other day. Someone wanted to report another disabled parent to CPS because they were disabled. No reason other than they thought the disabled parent was unfit and should be reported just because they're disabled. And I wish this was a rare occurrence, but it's not. This is the one reason why I feel I, I will not often post pictures of myself uh, sitting in my power scooter or my power chair with my kids online on Facebook or Instagram out of fear that someone may try to report me to CPS. You know, I, over this, this, you know, I wanna talk to y'all about this and share with y'all my experiences as a disabled parent. And I'm just gonna, go over my life and pictures with y'all over the last few months and share with y'all what's in the photo and what's not. And so I'm gonna start with this story of a few weeks ago, I went to Sam's Club because personally I prefer it over Costco because I don't spend all my money at Sam's Club and compare it to Costco. <laughs> I walked in with Starlin, my service dog, and we go to the automotive section. I needed some oil for my accessible vehicle. And as we walk in, some guy says, he ain't blind, he's faking it. And I heard him, but I, I chose to ignore him because I was just kind of like, okay, whatever. Then the guy walks up to me, gets into my face and tells me, you're not blind. At this point, I'm confused, I'm frustrated, and I'm just like, what is going on? And I inform him, you're right, I'm not blind. And this is not a guide dog. She is a PTSD service dog. After correcting this gentleman, as I use the term loosely, he proceeds to want to fight me. And eventually he was kicked out of the store. But I'll tell you, that really shook me to my core of how some people just want to pick a fight with someone just for whatever reason, you know. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a photo of a quick image description. This is a photo of Howie, my youngest son. He is playing a bronze xylophone. Uh, he's wearing a blue sweatshirt with a red uh, a mask. And, you know, he was having a lot of fun. And so at this picture, uh, my family and I went to the Bay Discovery Museum in Sausalito, California. I was really excited to go because the website says it was accessible. And at first it was really cool. And then, you know, you can see uh, Howie playing here, which is really awesome. And what you're not seeing is all the children who were curious about my service dog and my power scooter. And, you know, many children stared, but they don't stare like how adults do. Children are naturally curious. And I saw that in their eyes and it made me happy because I'm like, hey, I'm happy to talk about my disability. I'm happy to talk about my power scooter. I'm happy to talk about my service dog. You know, one approached me and wanted to ask about my scooter and my service dog. You know, I can't, I gotta admit the power scooter and the service dog are pretty sweet. Starlin's pretty awesome. <laughs> but you know, their parents quickly shooed them away, just scooped them away, up and away. And with a sigh, you know, I just went on and, and checked out the rest of the exhibits. But it was just really frustrating because it's just like, wow, you know, you're not gonna catch my disability, right? Your child is not gonna catch my disability either. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so quick image description. Uh, in, this, in this photo, you're seeing my partner, Lisa, a brown woman in a blue sweatshirt and our son, Howie, doing the Titanic King of the World impersonation on a boat at the Discovery Bay Museum. You know, and I was happy to take this photo 
But what you couldn't see was that I was really sad because I couldn't access the boat despite there was a ramp there. It seemed to be more of, like the ramp was more for show and less for access. And the accessibility got worse as I eventually, like there was a lot of parts of the uh, museum I couldn't access, right? Because they were a lot of bark and different things that my power, my scooter could not go through. Um, and the accessibility just got worse from there. And I eventually did what I always learned to do was I had to, whenever there's a lack of accessibility, I, I first found a nice quiet place to wait for, for wait for my family to do whatever they were doing and while they were having fun. And I was just kind of sitting in the corner. So, so much for accessibility, right? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo of Starlin, the awesome service dog, a yellow Labrador wearing a blue uh, service dog vest sitting on a bench in front of some purple flowers. And this trip, we went for Mother's Day this year, a few, uh, a few weeks ago now, right? And we went to the UC Berkeley Botanical Gardens. We had never been there, but we were really excited to go. I mean, it's Berkeley, right? So it's the birthplace of the disability rights movement. So it's gotta be accessible. You know, and as you can see, uh, as, as this photo depicts Starlin, we had a grand old time. But what isn't in the photo is that this is where I had to wait. This is where I had to wait for my family because they had to go ahead of me because a lot of the pathways there were not accessible. And my family and I became separated. And so I figured I would just go and meet them on the other side of this paved path that they had gone on because they went on a, a, some stairs I couldn't follow. However, due to the lack of accessible navigational signs, uh, I tried to go up this grade and my scooter battery died. And when I tried to turn around, my scooter flipped and I couldn't get up. And I was by myself without my caregiver and I was worried, how would I get up? Luckily, some nice people came over and helped me out. But I wanna to read to y'all really quick, a snippet from the garden websites, uh, what they say about accessibility. It says, the garden is committed to making its ground and facilities throughout its 34 acres accessible to all who visit. However, the layout of some areas of the garden may pr prove difficult for those with mobility challenges. The grounds are accessible by paved pathways throughout the garden, but certain paths may be narrow, rough, uneven, or steep. Only trained service dogs are allowed to enter the garden grounds. And these are, and then talks about a few parking spots that they have available uh, for accessibility. However, as I quickly discovered, this place was not accessible. Um, you know, the hardest thing about being a disabled parent, at least in my experience, is how this impacts your kids. Because my kids see it. They see every time some loudmouth ableist wants to pick a fight, a parent shoes their kid away from me, or looks at me like they want to call CPS on me, or they oftentimes think I'm a houseless person. You know, my kids and other all disabled parents, we see this and we can't help but see this. And you know, kids are naturally curious. They're naturally intuitive. They pick up on this stuff. And no matter how big of a fake smile myself or any other disabled, puts on, disabled parent puts on, you know, when I have to find a quiet place to tell my kids, uh, you know, and sit out because, you know, the fun places is not accessible to me, I have to tell my kids I'm tired, you know, and that's basically the code word now that I use whenever someone thinks it's not accessible is I'm tired and I'm frankly tired of the inaccessibility. Uh, and next slide, please. In this last photo, it's me, uh, myself and my family at Oakland Coliseum. We're all smiling in the accessible section at Oakland Coliseum. And, you know, I'm really happy here in this photo, not just because I'm at the Raiders game and the Raiders won, you know, <laughs> the Raiders, but because I can participate. You know, and a lot of people put Oakland Coliseum down because it's old and it's falling apart. But despite all of that, it's largely accessible and mostly built with ramps. And, you know, honestly, we need more places like this. And I don't want to just present a problem and not offer a solution. So I'm gonna say, how do we change this? Well, let's travel back in time a bit to the start of the disability rights movement, you know, in Berkeley, when Ed Roberts, the Rolling Quads and other disability rights activists chanted, nothing about us without us. Could it really be this simple? Yes, yes it can. By centering design in all aspects of policy, construction, course curriculum around disability and disabled folks, you know, we can really change this. 
But every time we say this, it seems to go ignored. So I'm just going to ring that bell one more time and say just nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Um, I think that's it for us then, Miroslav. We're ready to move to the second half of the panel. Right. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nate, for that testimony. It's so powerful. Um, thank you. Okay, um, we'll now shift gears and our next presenters. We have two from UC San Francisco. I'm not sure what the order you would prefer. We have Amy Medeiros, um, Associate Professor from UCSF, and Carlos Martinez, um, a PhD candidate at UC San Francisco. Thank you, Miroslava. I'm really honored to be here today. Um, I think Amy's gonna uh, share a PowerPoint uh, for us. Um, many thanks to Miroslava and, and Susan and Isidro for all your work in organizing this uh, symposium and everyone else who's been involved with organizing it. It's been really fantastic. Um, we're honored to be here today uh, to talk about uh, the Repair Project, which is a project that um, both Amy and I and several other people uh, have been involved with uh, launching at UC uh, SF at UC San Francisco. Uh, both Amy and I are in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in medical anthropology, the joint program in medical anthropology um, uh, between UCSF and uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, Amy is um, it also is a historian. Maybe Amy, you want to introduce yourself now. Hi everyone, I'm an associate professor and director of the History of Health Sciences program at UCSF and I work with uh, Carlos on the Repair Project. Great, um, so the Repair Project is uh, an acronym. Uh, so as you can see here, the REP stands for the REP and the word reparations and the AIR stands for uh, the anti-institutional racism. Um, so our project is designed to address anti-Black racism and augment uh, the voices of Black, Indigenous people of color and presence in, in science and medicine and, and healthcare. And um, really our project uh, emerged out of a recognition of longstanding racial inequalities in health and healthcare institutions um, and, uh, that have emerged out of a long history of structural violence, systemic racism, um, and really aimed at opening up a conversation at UCSF specifically, but also more broadly um, in uh, medical institutions and in academia around the health implications of uh, past and ongoing forms of anti-Blackness um, and racism in science and medicine. Um, next slide, please. So um, our initiative was uh, born in the wake of last year's um, uprisings in the response to the murder of George Floyd and um, all the themes that were brought to light um, that have emerged out of the movement for Black Lives. Um, and um, really we're working from some of those insights, you know, such as the recognition of incarceration and surveillance um, and uh, implicit and explicit racial biases. Um, but thinking about those in the context um, science and medical research and clinical practice. Um, so our project is uh, anchored by a diverse group of uh, steering committee members, uh, including students and faculty from UCSF's Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, um, as well as from other departments across UCSF from the medical school and other science departments as well. Um, we're also joined by members um, increasingly from other institutions, such as Stanford University. Uh, next slide. So um, our, our notion of repair and, and the, the way that we are using the word repair um, seeks to move current conversations around racialized inequalities and health equity behind, beyond some of the narrow frameworks uh, that have been informed these conversations um, as, as, up to now by taking really seriously the idea of medical reparations, um, also ideas that are emerging with the concept of abolition medicine and also the decolonization uh, in the health sciences. So we're thinking um, beyond, I think, um, some of, uh, the, of the frameworks of reform to really think more broadly about what kind of structural changes might be necessary within science and medicine 
um, to, to address past and ongoing harm. Um, but we're also uh, wary of the way that, um, that notions of repair have often been invoked in ableist and eugenicist logics. Um, and so, you know, we really think with critical disability study scholars um, to reframe repair as a means of address, addressing past and future harm, while also being mindful of the inherent limitations um, and potential side effects of any reparative project. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're just uh, we're we're wary and mindful. We use repair, but also uh, aware of the ways it's been invoked in the past, and trying to think of what repair can look like um, when it's informed by reparations, abolition, and decolonization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I think this uh, quotation from the scholar uh, and theorist Frank Wilderson uh, from a recent article uh, that he published, um, actually in the Nation really captures um, why we think it's important to explicitly address and, and speak of anti-Blackness in our project, which Amy will also be further discussing. Uh, but as uh, Frank Wilderson says, anti-Blackness is its own beast. It's a conceptual framework uh, that cannot be analogized to capitalism or any other ism, nor is it a byproduct of any oppressive necessity other than its own. Um, and so I think, um, you know, despite any sort of, uh, you know, the, uh, differences that people might have with different theorists, including Frank uh, Wilderson's work, we really take seriously this idea of uh, that um, anti-Blackness is its own structure um, that needs to address, be addressed head on and explicitly, um, and that can't just be subsumed within larger anti-racist efforts. That really needs to be named and discussed, um, and as Amy Wolf will talk about, it needs to be discussed historically, excavated historically, and then also talked about currently. Um, thank you, Carlos. And I wanted to also thank you, uh, Dr. Chavez Garcia, for asking us to be here and talk a little bit about the repair project. And um, just to give uh, folks a little bit of a background of how we ended up here is that we actually had a talk um, uh, by Dr. Lira as part of the repair project. And in that discussion, um, and the, the, the PR that went out, um, we made contact with this consortium about, your, about their efforts and the way in which there's a synergy. And we definitely, um, through our discussion, it became very clear of the synergy that was there. And so what we'd like to add to the conversation today is that we want to suggest and, uh, and talk more about how anti-Blackness has a historical relationship to eugenics and how that um, eugenics continues to inform medical research and policy. And it does so as a legacy of the racial terrorism era of the late 19th century, early um, 20th century in the United States. And so in talking about the historical relationship to eugenics, um, we thought that it would be helpful to provide a little bit of uh, evidence. And I know that many of you have seen this uh, tree of eugenics before. It was exhibited by eugenicists at multiple international uh, uh, Congress uh, conferences, international eugenics conferences, uh, 1921 and 1930, or 1922, 1932, I believe. Um, it's funny, I'm a historian and I'm bad with names and dates. So uh, please bear in mind if I'm a year off. I think it's 1932. Too. Anyways, okay. So uh, this logo by the uh, by the Eugenics Record Office sh is uh, intended to show the ways in which eugenics is rooted in many fields. And if you look at the fields that are listed here, medicine, surgery, psychiatry, statistics, many of these are scientific and many of these are medical. Um, and so we see the ways in which uh, medicine and science are really posited as uh, rooting forces of eugenics. And if we had a bigger view, or if there was a kind of a view from 30,000 feet of this logo, perhaps we would also see the deeper roots that are at play. And the foundation of these roots, um, in part being anti-Black racism and also white supremacy. As David Rodiger um, keenly observed, the world had gotten along without race for the overwhelming majority of its history, but the US has never been without it. And if we consider race as the child of racism and not the father, which is a quote by Coates, um, then we think about the ways in which racism is infused in many of these roots that are depicted here. Also, medicine is in part responsible for the maintenance of um, these fundamental principles of anti-Black racism and white supremacy as it used race to employ 
Um, it employed it to categorize populations and conduct surveillance on black and brown and indigenous people. So that's an also another element to this relationship, this historical relationship between eugenics and anti-black racism and medicine as well. And then if uh, looking to uh, the other part of the slide, we see the way in which eugenics as this, uh, this tree logo is depicted in the, uh, at the third International Eugenics Conference in 1932. This year is significant, not only for the eugenics movement, and many people see it as the height of that movement. Um, there is uh, depictions of all the progress that's made uh, that the eugenicists uh, are arguing in 1932. But also it happens to be the year when the US Public Health Service launches its study, um, which they title the untreated syphilis in the Negro male. This study was administered out of the Tuskegee Institute and is infamously known as the Tuskegee study. Um, what's important about this is that we see the ways in which both of these, uh, the, the conference itself and the study are uh, products of this time period in the United States that the tree also too um, is a symbol of this time period as the era of racial terrorism um, is a time where there is extensive lynching that's taking place throughout the, throughout the United States. So placing eugenics into a white supremacy and anti-black context that is coming forth through medicine and public health, it, it's, it, it's an important uh, job to do and we see it as part of our job in the repair project because it allows eugenics to serve as a revealer of the principle found at the core of American medicine and public health policy, and that is anti-Black racism and white supremacy. White supremacy is defined through anti-Black racism in the United States and has a long history. We see it in multiple sites taking place in plantations and in prisons and in laboratories and in medical schools. These are spaces where Black, black bodies are exploited, tortured, and abused for gain. And they're also spaces where the expert knowledge from um, Black populations are, are exploited as well. We would like to suggest that anti-Black racism is really the backdrop of the eugenics movement in the late 19th century and early 20th century, as it serves as the fold for the type of white supremacy nation building that takes place during that time. A prime example would be the race suicide campaign um, that is articulated by Roosevelt in 1903 um, and is best understood in a contrast of xenophobia, anti-Black racism that's happening at this time with increased immigration, diversity within that immigration, attempts to restrict that immigration, and also the white supremacy campaign that we see in full effect. While race suicide is more of a, a public health campaign or a mass media campaign, um, it also definitely is infused with medicine and health as public health officials and physicians are seen as the potential warriors in the fight to bolster the Anglo-Saxon, um, which is uh, also seen as the white race at this time. So in talking about the past, and there's much between then and now um, that we talk much more about during uh, our campus forums that we have that are, uh, that are hosted by the Repair Project and also teach-ins that we also uh, feature too, um, we do see the ways in which eugenics continues to inform medical research and policy and medical technology. Um, and what's interesting about it too is that not only does it continue to inform these things, but it also um, makes it where they start to be seen as kind of scandalous stories in some way. So uh, it, they, it, it, certain elements in medicine that have to do with racial bias as they often are referred to become seen as surprises. For example, during the uh, pandemic, oximeters um, received a lot of attention in part because of what they serve and how they're able to um, indicate the oxygen um, intake of a, of a patient. And with that, the racial bias that's embedded in them became newsworthy. So um, there was talk about the ways in which they are less effective as medical device on black and brown skin, in part because during their development, they were not tested on the variety of, um, uh, of skin, skin types that are out there. And so they were primarily uh, tested on white skin and therefore most effective in that, um, in that environment. Um, and so another example too, is that we see um, reports that come out, especially there's been um, an upswell of reporting about how genetics 
has uh, really been focused on, um, on collecting information and data that uh, to better understand the human genome and in doing so, and in the studies that they're pulling, they pull basically from European um, populations, which leaves most of the world out and many, uh, many populations that are black and brown, not part of the data pools that are take, that are that are occurring in this field. Um, this is seen again as not only new, noteworthy or newsworthy, but also as a surprise. It caught, catches the attentions of scholars. And just this week, the NF, there was um, a headline on the internet and in the news uh, on the news um, about how the NFL has made the decision to no longer use race correction when assessing cognitive impairment on those that have retired from the NFL and are reporting that they feel impaired and want to um, be seen as someone that could uh, could receive benefits. Um, but in the news, as this has been reporting on, there had been emphasis on this, under, this misunderstanding that this was actually happening in the first place. So the race correction um, becomes noteworthy. Now, one can argue if we're able to talk more, way, more ways in which eugenics continues to inform medical research and policy instead of talking about it as a movement that ends with World War II, that, and I know that this argument's been made in other talks today and yesterday, that of course it's not ending the message, just the messaging and the tactics shift. Um, if we talk about how it continues to play a, fun, a foundational role in medical research and in clinical practice, then perhaps these would be less seen as scandal and be most, and, and we would see them more as examples of what's at the core and some of the issues that, that we find in medicine and, and, and healthcare. And so what is the Repair Project doing? It's trying to move forward these conversations and make them productive through curriculum development, hosting events, publications, and, um, and and trying to make even more visible um, community expert knowledge and involving and working with the community and participatory research and in development of curriculum events and publications themselves. Um, thank you, Amy. And um, just to make clear that in that last slide, uh, those photos were uh, 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 just the group of the, some of the people that we got together this uh, last academic year and some of the campus forms that we organized, including Natalie here, who's been here uh, today and others. So um, it's been amazing. It, really, the Repair Project has been, um, I think, a platform for bringing together scholars from a number of different fields, uh, diversity of fields, so the social sciences and humanities, uh, and, and bringing them into conversation with people um, who are health practitioners or in um, doing any kind of uh, scientific research. Um, so, uh, looking forward uh, to our second year of the Repair Project, um, we'll be uh, thinking uh, a lot about and, and, uh, and uh, organizing um, quite a bit of a discussion around this concept of abolition medicine, which has been, been getting written about um, uh, in the last couple of years, really, uh, also in response to the movement for Black Lives. Um, so in particular, we're organizing a uh, symposium on abolition medicine. Uh, we'll be organizing uh, some teach-ins uh, on racism, medicine, and carcerality, um, as well as some curricular consultations um, at UCSF. Um, and um, those curricular consultations are really uh, just our effort to try to bring some of the um, knowledge that we'll be gathering through the symposium and teach-ins to departments throughout UCSF that at, at this time, really that the concept of abolition or the concept of medical reparations, which we really thought of quite a bit about in our first year, um, aren't really being taken up at this point. Um, and, and then uh, lastly, we'll be doing, uh, we'll be organizing a series of workshops on anti-racist research with, um, with students and uh, researchers at UCSF. Um, so we're really excited about what's coming ahead in our uh, year two of the project. Um, and just lastly, um, you know, we really invite people to uh, please visit our website where we have a number of, of resources uh, from our first year. We have videos from our talks, uh, from our campus forums that we've organized. Um, and um, we um, have, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, we have actually syllabi that people can access as well. Um, and so, we, you know, we really would love people to access those resources, but also if people want to get more involved with our project. We're always uh, looking for more people to engage with our with our work. 
uh, you can reach us at um, the email that's listed here and also follow us uh, through our social media. Thank you. I'm going right. to stop share and then I'm going to put the website on in the chat too so that it's a way that um, people can access it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amy and Carlos and our and Ella, our speakers, and Nate as well today. Um, I don't know if we have any questions uh, that people would like to ask. I posted a couple of myself. I think with both sessions, I was just kind of my mouth was sort of dropping up, my jaw was open. And I was, if, if, if I could ask the first question, if my colleague Sue wouldn't mind. Um, but I was just wondering, like, what can we do to support disability rights for parents and their families? Um, what you were saying, I was astounded. I, I don't even know how to describe it, but you know, it does not much in the media or in the public, we don't hear about it too much, or maybe I'm not listening to the right places, but wondering about that. And I also was wondering how the UCS campus community had responded to the work that you all are doing. Um, because medicine, right, there's, I can see all these challenges. And, you know, of course, I think a lot of us have these personal stories where, like, you realize these biases going to hit your family and you're, they're trying to diagnose you using these models that just don't apply to your family. And they're telling you you're abnormal. I, mean, I was told that my daughter was abnormal. And I thought, oh, wow. How? <laughs> right. And once you do some digging, you realize, oh, it's based on these models that don't apply to our circumstances. But I don't know either disability rights or UCSF work? Um, I'm happy to respond. I saw your question. Thank you for it in the chat. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, you noted that may, maybe you were doing something wrong. You're looking in the right places because you didn't hear about this issue. Um, you know, eugenics, the purpose of eugenics was to disappear this population and it did its job quite well. Um, you, you know, eugenics was um, a mechanism of control. It's not focused on any one particular people. It's there intentionally to remove those who are deemed unfit to participate in society, to hold valorized roles. And so, you know, the fact that you can't find information on this or didn't know about it is utterly intentional and, and, and none of the um, causation of that could be attributed to you as an individual. Um, these parents are disappeared. Their issues are disappeared. Um, when social services would fight with us at the legislative level over protections for these parents, they would have a two-pronged approach. One was saying that they must retain um, the ableist eugenicist elements of the code that they use for termination of parental rights. And on the other side, they would say, but it doesn't really ever happen anyway, because there really aren't many of these parents. And they can do that because um, <laughs> looking at the philosophy of bioinformatics, they choose not to collect the data. There is no screening required to determine if a parent's disabled when they're brought into the system. Why would you want to identify it? Because they're now a protected class. And so certain rights and responsibilities of the institution will flow um, if you know that they're there. Right. Um, so I think raising this profile, thinking about this, including it as you have, and I think you again in the panel today is, is one approach. The other is to, um, you know, to talk more, let's talk more about lobbying uh, legislators. That's how we've gotten a lot of movement at the state level. We've gotten multiple states to change their, their laws. Um, is that you, you have to lobby legislators to take this issue on. In places like California and New York, which are the worst, large liberal states are the hardest to get anything done with this because they are inundated with requests from more powerful entities like lobbying groups. Um, in California, you, uh, a legislator can only sponsor three bills a term. And so are you going to get ahead of the Sierra Club? Are you going to get, you know, probably not, right? Are you going to get ahead of Chevron? Probably not. Um, it's very difficult. So um, looking at how we can move things in smaller states is sometimes a really good thing. Now that the pandemic's over and Trump is gone, there may be more appetite at the federal level. Nate and I were doing work with, um, with representatives there previously, Sue, um, and wrote a paper with uh, Lucy Seriani and I that was presented to um, individuals at the federal level got some interest, but with um, all the Trump madness and the, um, the pandemic, there was no appetite for anything else. So uh, work in the legislative um, arena, as well as in your own lives, bringing this issue in, representing bringing invisible people in, disabled and especially disabled Indian parenting. That's as long as we're a colonial entity, which is forever, as long as the empiric project continues, um, Indians are another disabled um, population and they are rarely considered. Also, they're a disappeared population. Um, you can really determine power by who gets to even be considered to exist. They're not allowed to consider, be considered to exist even often, right? The data points fall off, they just get erased. We don't look at them. So um, continuing to bring them in in your personal work would be appreciated. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you all want to say something about UCSF and what's happening, how the community, the different communities, I guess, are administrated? Just wondering how that's been going. I'm, I'm happy to comment. Uh, Carlos, please feel free to add. Um, it's been pretty well received on one level. I guess you could look at different levels here. So um, we've had an interesting experience about, uh, about trying to uh, get published in, in medical journals. So that has um, been a much more traditional closed door that remains closed um, to non-MDs um, or MD-PhDs, which we are not. Um, I, uh, I would say that within UCSF itself, there had been many uh, people who reached out to us saying that they wanted to address um, anti-Black racism and didn't really know how or why, or, or they kind of just knew they wanted to do this and how and, and look towards the repair project as a possible space. So we had that group that we heard from, um, various individuals from around campus. Um, we've also heard from others who felt that um, they had been trying to fight this uh, fight and now felt that there was an, a, another group um, that they could plug into and be a part of. And so they've either joined working groups or they visit and come to uh, campus forums virtually, they're all Zoom, um, but has definitely served as community building. Um, and uh, it has also, I think for some have been able to come to the repair project and our events or either volunteer in a way in which that um, allows for discussions that might not necessarily be happening in more clinically focused um, spaces um, and thinking about ways in which to do that, to bring these conversations to those spaces or to bring them to research spaces. So that's been exciting too. Um, there's also a, a larger effort right now on campus about truth and reconciliation and what could that mean for medical school. So we're able to be part of a larger conversation that's taking place. Um, but I'm also going to kind of pass it off to Carlos because uh, he also has an interesting vantage point about the way in which the, the project has been received. Um, yeah, so I, 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 you know, I think just to add on, um, I think it's been really exciting to see the response in particular from medical students um, who have not really had access to this kind of um, information generally, right? And so I think it's been a really um, exciting sort of niche that we found ourselves in um, where, of course, we're in a kind of uh, broadly like biomedical institution um, where um, this sort of social sciences and humanities department within this broader institution. Um, but um, because of that, we um, have, I think, the unique ability to, to engage with the work that, you know, scholars at this symposium, for example, have been doing. Um, and um, our familiarity with that work has really um, allowed us to, um, to, to, you know, just become, I guess, sort of experts on, on a certain level. Um, within the context of our institution, right, um, and to be seen as a resource, um, and so you know um, the the student response in particular, like with the teachings that we've organized um, and the the effort to integrate some of this stuff into curriculum, has been the most exciting thing I think to to see. Um, there, people are really hungry for this uh, kind of stuff um, and are really wanting to I think to move beyond. Um, some of the ways that um, you know diversity, equity, and inclusion are, are sort of being done in, in education, or some of the uh, ways in which anti-racism is being discussed um, as well. Um, I think we have a depth and a breadth in our work that is um, really um, amplifying all of that. And so, um, and, and I think you know the political moment that we're in really. Um, really is, I think, what's motivated the, the hunger for this as well. So it's not us, right, that has created that hunger, but we're just sort of, um, you know, responding to it and able to respond to it. We have a question and a question and answers uh, from Susan Antebi. 
If there's time, I would be interested to learn about whether the issue of disabled parents overlaps in some cases with custody disputes in which one parent is identified as disabled and the other is not. And if so, does gender play a role in these cases in some way? Oh, clever you. That's a good question. Um, we're talking largely about child welfare because it can result in the complete disordering and um, undoing of a parent-child relationship. And I didn't have time for every uh, type of system and cord around custody. Um, but absolutely, I have a completely, I have a full retinue of material and, and information and um you know, uh, issues around the non-state sponsored custody um, matters, which are handled in family court as between two citizens typically, right? So there's some interplay in that child welfare um, cases will sometimes be exited to family court for full um, resolution when it gets to the point where they feel the child can be safe with the parents, but the parents themselves um, are in dispute as to whom the child will come back to or stay with. Um, and in every single state for that family code that each state will have, um, every single state considers disability. And the reason they consider disability is that their mandate is to look at the hue factors, the health, education, and welfare of the child, which is this, which leverages everything basically, right? You can look at anything more or less in the context of family court. Um, and so family court judges are the um, proverbial wall that the mud gets thrown against to see what sticks, right? And they will throw the disability of either parent at the court to try to make the argument that the child is um, best suited or best placed with a parent who is able-bodied. Um, and there is even less opportunity to get paid for services um, to show um, through proper evaluative, evidence-based evaluative techniques that the parent is safe to care for the child um, and that the child will not be harmed um, or undermined with a disabled parent. Um, interestingly, in my own work, um, as I said, I, you know, I, I worked in this field for uh, almost 15 years, um, there was not we saw many more mothers because mothers are more primary caregivers typically in our society. Um, but we saw many more fathers than I would have imagined. Many, many physically disabled fathers, um, often fathers who had been the primary caretaker because their disability meant that they were not working. It's difficult to become employed um, as we know. And um, the, the other parent would turn around and say then that this person was unsafe and I'd be able to care for the child due to the disability, even when they had been the primary caretaker. Um, and they frequently lost. Um, we had fathers who were blind, physically disabled, had mental health involvement, um, chronic um, disease, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, shot on the job, wrecked on a motorcycle, all sorts of things. And um, they, they had just as hard of a time um, as mothers but the mothers make up the vast majority of what we see simply because of the sexualized, genderized primary caretaker role in our society. Um, and there's a third court, court that we'll go into, but the, the guardianship court where relatives often can come in and um, sort of demand that they be assigned by the state custody of a child. And um, that frequently occurs as well. We have a question from Milton. Uh in the chat, have there been efforts to shape the mandatory course requirements to include the teaching of this history for medical professionals? I had the opportunity to work with high school educators at a local high school to create a medical ethics course at a school where all students were considering entering the medical profession. It seems important to counter the eugenically inspired essentialist thinking early and often. So true. Um, I put, I posted on in the chat a, a, a news uh, link about an initiative that has gotten underway at UCSF. It's an anti-aggressive curriculum initiative. It's three years. Um, I am part of the team that's looking at the ways in which we can um, 
infuse an anti-oppressive uh, approach in both the pedagogy and also the content of the Bridges curriculum, which is the name of the, of the, Bridges, of the curriculum for uh, the School of Medicine. Uh, there's similar uh, efforts that are taking place at the other schools, the health professional schools um, at UCSF, uh, but I would say that this one probably is the most organized and probably has the most funding as medical schools have a hierarchy to them as well. Um, and uh, so that's really exciting. And we currently have uh, eight, eight weeks dedicated in the foundational uh, year of medical school that uh, uses a social justice lens. And so that's really become kind of a laboratory for uh, addressing um, social determinants of health, uh, using a structural competency approach and talking about the history of medicine and better understanding the harms that had been done and the ways in which we can move forward um, in, in medical school and just medicine in general. And I had the opportunity to teach a, 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 a to have a lecture in that, um, that block that focused, focused on the history of white supremacy in American medicine and that included eugenics. And uh, there's many other examples about the ways in which there's continued inequities in, in, in medicine and in healthcare and what a, a clinician of the 20th, 21st century needs to know. And then also thinking about the practices of uh, social humility, cultural humility and moving forward um, and being able to treat um, individuals. We also had a, a symposium that took place in April that thousands of people have attended that directly talks about the ways in which race correction is used um, in medicine. Um, it's a hot, hot debate. There isn't necessarily consensus in medicine. And so as we try to move forward in taking the anti-oppressive approach, we also are trying to help facilitate conversation um, in, in some of these debates and making them more visible. And so that hopefully through those discussions, we can kind of move some folks forward. Are there other questions? I know that some folks were asking about this information if it's gonna be made available, yes. We are recording and it's live streaming now. And when it live streams, apparently it also records out on YouTube. Um, so those will be available um, as well. So um, do have- I have a question or maybe just a response um, uh, and, and a kind of invitation to ongoing thinking for us. And I really appreciate it, Amy and, and Carlos, maybe too, the, um, the reference to COVID, which I don't think has much come up today. And yet COVID triage uh, has been completely underpinned by eugenic principles. Uh, and uh, I wanted to give a link to um, uh, Latif McLeod's uh, discussion of, of this subject, um, really wonderful um, black disability justice activist. And um, partly because I think this is something we could have a whole panel on. And I think that, that everything we've been talking about so far, we could be thinking about this issue in relation to. So I don't know if anyone wants to respond right now, but. Um, I'll just say that, you know, for the, the tribal community that I'm, I'm in community with, I really uh, found that it has been the number one pressing issue. There's such a high level of disability. Uh, Native people are the most disabled um, in society, the highest rates um, and lowest, you know, um, lifespans, um, a lot of other measures of well-being and health. Um, and because a lot of that illness is around um, uh, diabetes um, and, and other illnesses that made them particularly vulnerable to COVID. We saw massive dyings um, and the grief was around the fact that these dyings often were hitting traditional and older people and so languages are being lost at the same time. And the response by the state was to, in, in, in one situation, instead of sending um, uh, uh, PPE, they sent body bags um, to a tribe. I mean, this this was the level of, uh, of discardment of the, the grief and the trauma that was happening. Um, and again, I think it's just one of those uh, doubling of disappearing of people, right? So native disabled people are just too invisible to be counted um, in the midst of this um, 
and I, and I felt in California with Latino people as well, you know, our Latino population carried over half of the deaths, I believe, um, in this realm. And yet where was a completely high level, laser focused Spanish language door to door effort to address this just didn't happen. I didn't see it. And, you know, I'm from Richmond. I'm still right here. Like, I, you know, we have huge Latino populations and I didn't see that much effort. And so it really felt like, again, it was sort of um, an allowance of death and grief um, without a lot of attention emanating from either the public health, or the medical or the, the governmental um, entities supposedly responsible for that. I think also to keep in mind, there's, you know, um, all these points are really good. And I think there's so much here about visibility and invisibility and the ways in which eugenics operates. And the LOU has really been, or Dr. Kelly, you've really been focusing, or um, you've been helping me kind of remind the ways in which eugenics was intended to, to erase individuals by 1980. I, I remember the chart, they were like 1980 degenerates will be gone from the United States and we'll, we'll claim victory, right? So, um, you know, thinking about that being the initiative, I think that also a part of the initiative too is, um, which we see now in white racial framing is this idea of the self-direction of human evolution is very much an Anglo-Saxon white project, right? And that this is how we move forward um, in, in really ensuring white supremacy. And that continues to reverberate in medicine and in clinical practice. So hearing that your daughter is abnormal falls within that paradigm, right? And the idea that um, when there is information that's being put out, about COVID and about um, the uh, the vaccines, but COVID testing in particular at UCSF on the health side, UCSF health side, which is a, sometimes feels a world away from the curriculum side and the and the, and the education side. Um, there was not; it was English only on the website, and there was not concerted efforts to really think about the ways in which we can strategize and get to communities that might not be using the the, the internet as the uh, information source, and also might not be uh, English as uh, as the primary language. And so, um, there was movement that had to be made. There were calls that took place in order to change that. And then it's also interesting too the multi layers. Um, talking about how we were, how we, how the repair project has been received, it's a multi-layered answer. So is the case with that, because, for example, when it comes to vaccination distribution, there's been this interplay between um, local entities that have been organizing efforts, and they had kind of nine months to try to correct some of these. Uh, these, these, these practices that continued to perpetuate health and healthcare uh, disparities. Um, and they were, they were making some strides. So at UCSF, for example, there was a phone campaign that was put into place for COVID testing that was actually a much more effective in getting the word out to um, in particular Latino communities in San Francisco. And then the federal government comes in and says, we're gonna take control of things. And they have their own, um, the own way of which they operate. And they had wanted nothing to do with the phone um, effort. And so we see the ways in which there's so much, so I think with, uh, talking about eugenics, the ways in which it continues to persist, the message changes, but the intent is the same, is that you see the way in which that really gets infused in state policy and all the different levels of the policy and how um, execution can happen and fire in different spots. And so it can be very difficult to try to continue to address it and to uh, to repair it. Um, that almost is always happening. There's There's just so many different levels to it. Thank yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, oh, uh, just really quickly, also, yes. just to mention um, the way that, of course, um, COVID um, has been used um, uh, to really reinforce anti immigrant um, policies it, since the pandemic began with the, you know, um, use of the CDC's Title 42 policy, um, which has basically um, created a, a way for uh, immigration officials to immediately expel asylum seekers uh, at the border before even allowing them with the opportunity to access asylum. So uh, and this is based upon this idea that this is to prevent uh, the spread of COVID from, uh, from people migrating, right? And so really what we're seeing with that is also a, a remedicalization of the border. Um, so kind of similar to the work that uh, people like Natalie Molina have talked about, um, you know, we're seeing that in the context of COVID uh, reoccurring currently. Great. Um, we have great. some wonderful questions. Uh, 
in the chat, but uh, we're so close. I don't think they can yeah. be really answered before. So I just would invite people to uh, look at them, uh, copy them, and come back after lunch, and uh, we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone for coming today. We really, really appreciate you taking you your Saturday you. to be here. <laughs> a lot. Thank you, Ella. Thank you, Nate and Amy and Carlos. All right. Have a great Bye. day. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. All right, time to go to lunch. I'm going to take a real lunch, go for a walk. <laughs> yeah, me too. See you later. All right, bye.
Hi, Lorena. Hi, Cynthia. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Table I'm using keeps bumping, and I'm like, I really don't want to spill coffee all over myself in front of everybody. Right. Hi, it's Sue. I'm not being allowed. <laughs> to uh, show myself. Citro, are you here? I've had so much trouble today. I duplicated into two people earlier today. Oh, strange. I, I've never had anything like that happen on Zoom. It's like there's some sort of mercury in retrograde for this um, there must conference. Be. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the original was just uh, inexperience. Hi, Lorena. Oh, great. Hello. Hey, thank you. It's nice to meet you, Susan. Yeah, it's great to meet you. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Thank you all for the for the uh, great invite. <laughs> Super excited oh, yeah. to be here. That was so important. Like the heart of this thing, as far as I'm concerned. Cynthia, thank you for what you said. <laughs> for crying my way through a dedication. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, that was exactly right. But thank you. No, thanks for the opportunity, seriously. I think Teresa would have said it was real. Yeah, That's exactly. It. Yeah. <sighs> I cleaned up well. You did. 
I was quoting, I don't know if you, you heard the thing I said right at the beginning yesterday, but I was quoting, you know, the, the famous image that's on our poster of the women in Tennessee who were yeah. um, uh, fighting, you know, the, the requirement of sterilization in order to get welfare benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, they tried to ask questions of the guy who had um, proposed the bill. And then the whole hearing was shut down because they actually tried to speak directly to him. They did speak directly to him and ask questions. And then they went out and gave a press conference and they said, when we come real, they shut it down. <laughs> that was the quotation. And things have not changed much yeah. <laughs> in terms of slogans. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah. I'm writing yeah, that down. Like they, they had submitted prepared testimony and then instead, um, the woman, Willie, she got her, Willie Pearl Ellis, instead of delivering the testimony that had been approved, she just started talking to him. And that was just not going to be allowed. <sighs> How brave everyone was during that then. I can't I even imagine I know. like the amount of resistance that we've gotten for talking about these things now, so many years later, like... Yeah. Yeah. So we're still waiting on, well, we have lots of time. I guess Amina and, and Carly, huh? There's Carly. Hi, Carly. You're muted, Carly. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. I just said, uh, I'm sorry for being late. I, um, I share a paid Zoom account with my colleague and I was like <laughs> trying to, um, I was logged into her account and I was trying to, yeah. anyway, it was a mess, but I'm here. You're not even late. You're not <laughs> even late. <laughs> Oh, Han, oh, just reading Han's comment in the, the chat. Hi, Amina. Hi. 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 Welcome. Thank you, happy to be here. Yeah, and I'm really grateful. Carly, you're not actually at Ed Roberts, are you? Is that a background? <laughs> I am not, this is the background. <laughs> I wish I was. <laughs> well, I know. Is it open? Can you get in there? Um, I can. So it's not open to the public, but um, the offices are open for staff members to go in as we feel comfortable. Right. I never really want to go back to my office. <laughs> Here's yeah, I, I miss my colleagues a lot, but I don't miss being in the office. <laughs> Exactly. The only thing I don't like is when there's something in that office that I really need, <laughs> then that's bad, but. Yeah, I've pretty much gotten everything out of there at this point. I have, I, and I also spend most of my day on Zoom, whether I'm in my office or not. No, yeah. So, <laughs> so why do that there? I should unmute myself. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yes, oh, wow. Hi, it's Hello. nice to meet you, um, Miroslava. Oh, hi, Lorena. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Who else? Amina, um, Carly, and Ella's here again. Hi, everyone. This is so exciting. Hi, everybody. <laughs> just ignore me. I'm just listening. <laughs> is it Amina or Amina? Oh, Amina. 
Amina, apologies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amina. Sue, do you want to do the introductions today? Just I can give a couple of housekeeping things. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Should we? Is everybody ready? Do you want to get started? I'll wait for the interpreter to. Okay. All right. So. Are we okay? We're good. We're going to go ahead and get started. Let's wait for yes. one of the interpreters. Just yes. They usually appear on screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, barely one. Lots of activity in the chat. That's great. I'm gonna go ahead and grab the link for the captioning as well. So that we will have that. Joe or Katie, are you um, available? There we go. Wonderful. Thank you. Just a quick question. Is live transcription also enabled on the Zoom? Yes, we are having it um, uh, captioning, live captioning is happening. Oh. Welcome, welcome everyone today to the, our second day of the two day symposium. on eugenics in California and the world. So a couple of housekeeping um, details. First, we do have ASL interpretation happening with Katie Voice and Joe Malizia um, doing that work for us. Thank you so much. We also have um, uh, closed, uh, excuse me, we also have live captioning and I'm gonna go ahead and post that now in the chat so you can um, use that if needed. What else am I missing? Um, I'm looking at my notes. Let me just take a quick peek. We're asking uh, one the, uh, participants or attendees to post questions in Q&A and then we'll wait till the end. And if you're a panelist, then uh, for some reason I don't quite understand, you'll need to post your questions in the chat right. and we'll, we'll gather them together. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to um, Sue, uh, my colleague, Susan. If you'd like to maybe just introduce the panel, just um, speakers, yeah. Yes, thank you to everyone who's here and to the panelists we're about to hear. So this is a panel on such an important topic on the campaign for reparations for um, California survivors of forced sterilization. And there are gonna be four speakers, Amina Esler, Elster, Elster Mina Elster uh, from California Coalition for Women Prisoners, Carly Myers from Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, Cynthia Chandler from Bay Area Legal Incubator, and Lorena Garcia, what's? Cermeño. Cermeño uh, um, from California Latina, Latinas for Reproductive Justice. And they've all worked together on this campaign. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so very much for the opportunity to uplift AB 1007, a bill that would establish the forced and involuntary sterilization compensation program in the state of California. Um, as Sue um, just, just introduced, my name is Carly Myers and I am a staff attorney with the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, a national law and policy center that protects and advances the civil and human rights of people with disabilities. 
Um, Jadif has been a co-author of the Sterilization Reparations Bill for the past four years. And we, as an organization, have long advocated for the rights of all individuals, including people with disabilities, to be treated with respect, dignity, and independence regarding their lives and their reproductive capacities. I sit here today amongst a brilliant group of intersectional advocates. Joined by the common thread of bringing a semblance of justice to our communities, Jadif has been honored to have the opportunity to work with the California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, the California Coalition for Women's Prisoners, Back to the Basics Community Empowerment, and the ever brilliant Cynthia Chandler. The Sterilization Reparations Bill was born of a bold concept. In 2003, Governor Gray Davis and the state Senate separately apologized for California's eugenics sterilization program, which as many of you know, forcibly sterilized over 20,000 people in state institutions, merely because they had disabilities, the administrator didn't like the color of their skin, they displayed quote unquote, social deviance, or they were otherwise deemed unfit to reproduce, which was a broad discretionary decision. The end of the state's formal eugenic sterilization program and its subsequent apology, which was 24 years later, might I add, was unsurprisingly not enough to end eugenics sterilizations in this state. In fact, in tandem with this apology and continuing up until as recently as 2016, women who were overwhelmingly women of color have continued to be involuntarily sterilized in state carceral settings. At least 250 women, and likely many more, have been sterilized without proper consents, and often even without their knowledge in state prisons. So you see, eugenics motivated forced sterilizations have never stopped in this state. In 1979, when California's formal eugenics law was repealed, the setting for involuntary sterilizations just simply shifted. And as we have seen since 2003, a simple apology by the state is not enough. We need bold action. We need the state to take true accountability. We need reparations now. AB 1007, which has held many different numbers and authors through the years, at its core is a bill that would provide material acknowledgement to the survivors of state-sponsored forced sterilization. And it would raise awareness about the harms that they endured in an effort to ensure that this never happens again. AB 1007 has three main components. First, of course, it would create a compensation program for verified survivors to apply for and receive monetary payments. There are two groups of individuals who would be eligible for reparations. Those who were sterilized pursuant to California's eugenics laws, which were on the books between 1909 and 1979, and also individuals who were sterilized without proper consents in state prisons after 1979. The precise compensation amount that each survivor will receive is dependent on how many people actually come forward. But our goalpost, if we have to state one, is approximately $25,000 per person. And just to be clear, that number is not guaranteed and it's also not capped. Second, the bill would establish outreach and notification programs to be developed and implemented in consultation with community-based organizations. The outreach program's goal is to inform survivors of the availability of reparations in places that they already regularly visit or through the modalities that they already regularly engage with. The notification program is tailored more specifically towards the survivors of the more contemporary sterilizations um, as many of these individuals still do not even know to this day that they have been sterilized by the state. And that's something that my coalition partner, Cynthia Chandler, will speak of um, further a little later in our um, panel today. 
And then finally, um, AB 1007 would require the placement of plaques and markers at designated sites to raise awareness about California's eugenics laws and the far reaching impacts that they have had and that they are still having on our communities. With the passage of AB 1007, California would be the third state to compensate survivors of um, sterilization under eugenics laws following the states of North Carolina and Virginia, two southern states might I add, and it would be the first state to compensate survivors of prison sterilization. At a time when the COVID-19 pandemic has really brought to the forefront deep-seated racial, disability, gender, and income-based health inequities. This bill provides California with an opportunity to denounce its egregious reproductive abuses and be a leader in setting the model for preventing such future harms. Um, what I want to kind of end at least my portion of this panel with as well is just highlighting how um, important it is that this bill passes right now. So to be clear, there were over 20,000 individuals sterilized pursuant to the eugenics sterilization laws. Out of that 20,000 number, only 383 are estimated to be, will be, are estimated to be living at the time when this program goes into effect. So that means that if we don't act quickly, these 383 individuals, like the 19,617 people before them, will die without seeing any form of justice. Now more than ever, this state needs to commit to addressing its legacy of eugenics and through reparations, boldly commit to ensuring that it will not happen again. And with that, um, I want to pass the discussion to my coalition partner, Lorena Garcia Zermano, um, who will speak in part about where the bill is now in the legislative process. Thank you so much, Carly, uh, for that really wonderful overview and super in-depth um, discussion on what is actually included in the bill, um, AB 1007. And um, really quickly, I just wanted to briefly introduce myself. Um, I am the Policy and Communications Coordinator for California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. Um, I've been um, really honored to work with uh, our coalition partners the last two years, really leading the policy work for CLRJ. And prior to that, um, I've been involved with CLRJ and as a staff member and a volunteer for roughly six years. And prior to that, my role was really doing a lot of the community engagement work, which I only mentioned because it is relevant to the some points that I wanted to bring up today in terms of the work that CLRJ has done, particularly around this campaign. And so really briefly, in terms of the status of where we at with AB 1007, um, I wanted to uplift a really important piece that we are taking a multi-pronged uh, strategy approach to be able to ensure reparations for survivors of forced sterilizations. And in order to do that, we um, not only are working on a bill, AB 1007, but we've also been um, really heavily pushing forward a companion budget request and this budget request would, um, we are asking the state of California to allocate $7.5 million um, in order to ensure that we have the funding to um, provide compensation, the reparations so, um, that we are you know, talking about, and also to establish markers and plaques that Carly mentioned to raise awareness of um, you know, the terrible sterilization abuses that have happened. And we are really excited because, as I'm sure a lot of you know, this has been a very long, um, a very long and challenging um, four years that this is our fourth year uh, introducing a bill for reparations. And we are very excited and I'm very excited to be able to share that um, we are hoping and very hopeful, uh, cautiously hopeful that this will be our year. Um, and in terms of the status of AB 1007, which 
to clarify it's um, the bill and the budget request are operating under slightly different timelines. So I think it's just important to, to um, make that point clear. For AB 1007, um, we are excited because just this past week, it made it out of the assembly, um, the assembly side with unanimous bipartisan support, which is something that we were all very excited about. Um, we received 79 uh, I votes in support of AB 1007. And the only reason it was not the full 80 was because there is a vacant seat. So that is huge, uh, a huge uh, win for us. So we are very excited about that. And then for our budget request, we are equally excited because we have really um, been able to count on the support of key legislative champions um, that sit on um, budget committees and caucus chairs specifically Senator Maria Elena Durazo, Assemblymember Cristina Garcia, um, and both of them have really, they currently chair um, the budget subcommittees that our budget requests um, had to go through on both the Senate and Assembly side. And we're also very excited to be able to share that um, as of this past week, our budget request is included in the, legislat the legislature's budget proposal and so what this means is that we have for our budget request passed one of the biggest hurdles. And so we have been included and the next step that we are um, uh, working on, the, the next step that we are hoping to achieve in the final push is to ensure that once the full um, assembly and the full Senate vote on the legislative budget proposal, that it will then go to uh, Governor Newsom's desk and he will then be able to formally approve and sign the final budget. And for this timeline, um, which is slightly different than the legislative process, right, that will would have gone until around um, October, September, uh, for the budget request, we are looking at a June 15th deadline that the legislature needs to send and submit a proposal to Governor Newsom. And so for us, this is very exciting news because this means that since our budget request with trailer bill language, um, which would outline and include all of the policy components of our efforts, if this gets approved and signed by Governor Newsom, then we essentially won and we've essentially reached our goal of securing reparations for survivors of forced sterilizations around the June 15th deadline. So this is really exciting. And this panel really could not have come at a more um, ideal time because we are uh, about 10 days away uh, from hopefully being able to finally celebrate and share really exciting news with everybody on where we are at with, um, with our budget request. And I see a, a question, Susan, um, that yes, how can we uh, help between now and then? Yes, uh, we will definitely keep you all posted. Um, and thank you, Carly, for sharing uh, in the chat a link to our action alert. And so I was going to say this until the end, but I think it is fitting to kind of share a few important um, asks that we have of everybody, uh, individuals, community members, and partner organizations, um, is to please, if you can, and if you are able to, there is, um, a few steps that you can take. One is submitting a letter of support to uh, directly to Governor Newsom, requesting and asking him to please um, include our request in the final budget. And it is very simple, it should be very simple. There is a template, you literally would just need to swap out your name, you can customize it if you would like, but we have tried to make it as simple a process um, and included the direct email that you can send your letter to. And if you can, um, we are asking um, for letters to please be submitted by uh, Friday, June 11th. So we have roughly a little bit under one week. Um, and the other um, asks that we have is if uh, folks can please uplift on social media. And we have a social media toolkit that is also included in our action alert that includes um, very simply you can there's a little caption that says click here to tweet you can just click it and it will take you directly to the Twitter 
with the tweet automatically generated if you have a Twitter account. And we've also provided sample um, Facebook posts with the handles directly um, asking Governor Newsom to please include our budget request into the final budget proposal, uh, the final budget. And also um, a really key piece that I'd also want to uplift is the importance of thanking the legislators that have really supported us to getting this far. Um, and really we can't, um, I can't stress enough how much we really relied on their support um, this year to really champion the budget request. So um, the last piece that has been very important to our campaign has been our petition. And we're very excited that we have, um, the last time I checked, we had that over 16,000 individuals that have signed on in support. Um, it may be more than that now, but um, if you can, there's also a link in that uh, action alert to the petition where you can directly click and sign if you haven't done so already. So there are three different asks and um, action items that uh, our communities can really partake in to support um, our final push that we're hoping is our final push to get us to, to where we would like. Um, and then also just to reiterate that because we have taken this multi-pronged approach with the bill EB 1007 and our budget request, um, if you know, our budget request with our trailer bill language gets included around June 15th, then um, just to kind of flag that AB 1007 will automatically like fizzle out because we have essentially secured our goal. We've, we've been able to secure um, the funding and the policy um, to establish the forest sterilization compensation program. So um, in terms of the status of our, of our campaign and our bill and our budget request, um, that's where we are at right now. And um, I did want to uplift a few uh, things that have been really important in our campaign um, and that have really supported uh, us to really have gotten this far. And the first that Carly mentioned earlier is really our amazing diverse coalition that has really supported our efforts. Um, and I see a few questions, if it's okay with everybody, maybe I'll, I'll wait until the end in case there are any additional ones coming in. Um, so as I was mentioning, um, I did want to uplift that our coalition of co-sponsors and more broadly than that, our partner organizations that have you know, made the phone calls, that have submitted the letters, that have done a lot of work and have been tracking the campaign, um, it's a broad coalition that has really worked at the intersections of so many issues, including reproductive justice, racial justice, disability justice, economic justice, and gender justice, among many others. And the reason why um, I mention this is because this has been so vitally important to our work in this campaign. Everything from our communications messaging to the community engagement work that we have done and really importantly, educating our state legislators on eugenics and the continued impact of this violent legacies on our communities to this very day. And I think this is um, very important to mention because you know one of the things that um, we constantly encountered throughout these last four years and even now, every time we would discuss um, AB 1007 and our efforts for reparations, we were constantly encountered, um, we constantly encountered um, shock. Uh, our legislators were shocked of this history um, and disbelief that, you know, this belief that eugenics was a thing of the past. Um, and this, you know, very sadly was very countered with conversations that, you know, for example, CLRJ, um, the conversations we had been having in our communities where we would do presentations with promotoras in the Central Valley, for example, or we would be canvassing in Southeast LA and we would discuss this history. And it happens very frequently where we would um, have, you know, somebody come forward and say, you know, I think this happened to me. I didn't know that this was a state sponsored effort, something that has been ongoing, that has been happening for a very long time. Or we would have family members that would say, you know, I think this happened to somebody, you know, in my family at a county hospital in LA, for example, or um, in different, you know, instances where they had been pressured by their medical providers to be sterilized. 
And so um, this is all really important because um, for us, it was necessary to make sure that our legislature understood that eugenics ideologies and practices continue to seep into state institutions and that our efforts for reparations are deeply connected to the continued fight for racial justice, for reproductive justice, for disability justice, and for economic justice. And I also want to uplift that a few, you know, it took a lot more than, um, it took a lot more work that has been ongoing for so, for so, for so long, right? And I want to uplift the amazing uh, organizing work of for example, the Black Lives Matter movement that led to uprisings last year that really raced to the forefront and really exposed um, to our legislature a lot of deeply seated um, racial and income um, health inequities and also understanding the impact that COVID-19 has had on our legislature to really um, make, um, make a situation happen where there was really no more room for excuses. Our legislature, you know, they listened to something that we had been arguing for years and years and years, um, but it reached a point where it was difficult for them to really turn, you know, turn away from what we had been arguing. And um, also, oh, thank you for that, um, Isidro. Um, and also just to uplift that this year, California was experiencing a large surplus in the budget that has also really um, allowed room for our legislature to prioritize and to uh, hopefully you know, make this be our, our year um, for, for our campaign to be successful. Um, so thank you all so much for giving us the time to be able to speak a little bit about where we are at. And um, the, you know, if anybody has any questions on the specific action items um, or how to really be involved, we'd be happy to answer those um, at the end of the presentation. And now I will pass it on to um, uh, the amazing Cynthia Chandler that's on the panel to discuss a little bit more about the contemporary ster sterilizations. Thank you, Lorena. I feel like uh, while folks are listening, you should go ahead and click on that link. And if nothing else, do the petition now, take care of the letter later, and also take a moment to just engage in some magical thinking or prayer that we move forward. I just want to say that I always worry that we might be jinxing ourselves. And so I like to throw some positive energy out there. Um, so it's, it is incredibly, um, I don't even know what the right word is, like, awe awe making, I don't know what, humbling something spectacular to see this kind of political will and momentum around this issue in California, but not just California, really nationally um, and the national support we're getting now. And I think Lorena hit it right on the nose around how we're at this perfect nexus moment of tr transformation. And, um, both around racial justice, also frankly around health equity and health justice, right, with the pandemic to make these changes happen now. Um, we're also facing enormous pushback around white nationalism, which of course has always historically partnered with eugenics, um, but fascism and eugenics go hand in hand. And, and with that, I wanted to just sort of highlight what how we discovered exactly what we discovered in terms of the modern sterilizations in California, um, how, how we tried to shape what, sorry, what influenced the shaping of the um, sort of extra notification piece for the modern eugenics component in the bill, and then also maybe some of the national implications for this uh, policy work that we're doing in California. Um, I wanted to start off really by talking by clarifying that the, the um, illumination of the modern uh, prison sterilization abuse really came out of, as I mentioned in the dedication to Teresa Martinez earlier, came out of organizing and activism and really peer research that was being done by people in California's women's prisons. And it was interesting because there were sort of two separate streams of research that were happening in this human rights participation program. One was looking at the destruction of reproductive capacity, which originally started looking at um, the sort of aggressive use of hysterectomies as the only form of care people in prison were receiving, as well as, um, interestingly, 
how the prison itself functions as almost a form of forced noroplant is how folks inside would talk about it. Being in prison through one's entire reproductive years, especially for younger women facing longer and longer sentences, functioned like a form of reproductive control and sterilization abuse. Um, it was later that we started realizing and getting more and more data on larger level sterilization abuse. The second tier of research was on death in prison, and specifically premature death and the targeting of communities both for imprisonment um, and reduced lifespan. And that, that work was really important to the documenters who were in prison because it, it highlighted to have that, especially in tandem with the control over reproductive capacity, it highlighted the double squeeze that communities of color in California were facing um, through the threat of imprisonment. And um, it also really tied the eugenics abuse that we were documenting in California to broader movements against genocide. Um, and we didn't use that word loosely. We actually used the most conservative definition provided by the United Nations in defining genocide. And we're working with people in prison to document how they actually met that definition. Um, and I raise that because often when eugenics gets talked about, we forget to talk about the other side of it, not just the sterilization abuse and reproductive capacity issues, but around uh, efforts that thwart people's ability to thrive in specific classes of people. Um, and you know that's perhaps one of the things that's most relevant in this political moment also, as we are within this COVID epidemic, is that the kind of medical abuses that um, we've seen historically have certainly led to vulnerable communities being shied away from um, getting the vaccine. Um, that history of medical abuse is playing out in vaccination patterns. It's also though, uh, also though, uh, the lack of access to general health care um, and the privatization of medicine in the United States is also another form of eugenic control and that it makes makes it so that people of lower income face premature death. So folks in prison really wanted to harness and look at how their lifespan was actually reduced through imprisonment as well. Um, as we started doing this documentation, what's interesting is that, that the trends we saw really mirrored what has come out recently by whistleblower Don Wooten um, about conditions in ICE detention centers, uh, but on a much grander scope. Uh, we found initially approximately a dozen um, surgeries, abdominal surgeries that were performed uh, with consent, which then included non-consensual sterilizations. Um, so we had 12 people in prison who contacted us at Justice Now um, and through the in prison um, documenters who had had abdominal surgeries and then had very peculiar symptoms afterwards that didn't match what their surgeries were. Um, and those symptoms were we suspected surgical menopause symptoms. Um, and sure enough, we were able to document that at least you know those dozen people were sterilized without their knowledge whatsoever during hernia operations and other forms of, of abdominal surgeries. Um, the people that those people were specifically darker skinned women of color, um, mostly black women. Uh, with one Filipina who presented as black and was often mislabeled as black when she was in prison. Um, and then one uh, person of color who's a transgender man in a women's prison, uh, when he learned that he had been sterilized, he confronted the pr prison doctor who was sort of in charge of his care. And that doctor's response was, well, you should have been thankful. I mean, surely you of all people wouldn't have wanted to be a parent. I was doing you a favor. Um, so there was also clearly a targeting of that person because of his um, gender identity. Um, we were looking more and more and more at these sterilizations and we had gotten that dozen, those dozen cases documented when a whistleblower came to us, much, much like Don Wooten reaching out to lawyers um, more recently. And the whistleblower told us that the Department of Corrections had had a gender responsive strategies committee meeting to review what conditions of women's prisons should look like and that one of the agenda items had been the exploration of redefining sterilization for the purpose of birth control during labor and delivery as a medically necessary procedure. So in California, it's actually illegal to fund, publicly fund medical care that is not deemed medically necessary 
necessary and tubal ligation on its face has been defined as a, an elective procedure and it is illegal to perform. So they had a meeting to reclassify tubal ligations into um, necessary care, specifically for women of color, which is the vast majority of who is in California's women's prisons. And we, we found this to be really shocking and alarming. We were able to get minutes of that meeting and document that that was in fact what happened. Um, and what's interesting, not interesting good, but interesting horrific, is we were then able to do public record act requests and see the rates of tubal ligation during labor and delivery. And we could see that until that time when that meeting happened, there were a few happening that time in 2006 after that meeting, they spiked up and suddenly instead of maybe three a year, suddenly there was one to three of those sterilizations happening during labor and delivery in a single day. Um, we started using our um, entourage of doctors documenters in, who were trained in human rights documentation in prison to interview their peers who were pregnant in California's prisons. And they interviewed several hundred women who have been uh, pregnant in California's prisons between 2006, actually 2005 and 2007. Um, every single one of them said they had been asked if they wanted to be sterilized. Some were asked if they wanted to be sterilized while on the operating table having a cesarean section. All of them said that they had said no. So the question became, did they even know that they had been sterilized and who in fact were the people that were sterilized? Um, so uh, how to remedy this? Um, we decided not to do a legal strategy for very complex reasons. There's, if anyone wants to know later, you can ask me questions. In short, we were afraid it was gonna make bad law. There's been a huge pushback on anti-eugenic le um, legislation that was put into effect in the 1970s. And it's been watered down in many other contexts. And the prohibition on doing sterilization for the purpose of birth control in prisons and jails has actually never been tested in our courts in the US. And we were afraid that if we brought the initial case, we might actually lose and open up the door to legally, forcibly or coercively sterilizing people in prison. Um, so instead we took a legislative strategy in 2014, we passed a Sunshine Statute uh, with greatly with the help of people in prison and their testimony. Um, and that Sunshine Statute sort of illuminated the fact that this was illegal, created a lot of, um, stopgap measures to make it much more difficult for the state to do this kind of illegal behavior. Again, they have to provide data. There's data sets on that now that they have to publicly record every year on every sterilization. Um, for folks who are researchers watching this, I would encourage you to actually pull that data and look at it. There's at least two sterilizations since 2004 that are highly questionable whether or not they're legal listed in that data. Um, and, uh, but that was just the beginning and it really didn't meet what justice was. Um, so while we were documenting the sterilization abuse, we were doing interviews with people in women's prisons about what justice would really need to be to reach justice for this kind of grave state violence. Over and over folks said that they needed to see real acknowledgement, um, which we think we immediately had, when I heard about the bill that Dredef and California Latinas for Reproductive Justice were thinking about doing and the idea of a monument to the harms of eugenics. It was like immediately, you know, we brought that idea back and folks were like, yes, that kind of monument would provide acknowledgement. We also wanted to have some sort of atonement um, and the idea of restitution um, of reparations was important for that. But folks also wanted to have a sense of real safety and what could actually really prevent eugenics from happening again. And, and what would make sure the harms that had happened already were truly addressed and folks over and over said people had to be notified. Um, if people are not notified that they have been sterilized then the harm is actually ongoing of that state violence and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to have the notification piece included for people who were the survivors of contemporary sterilization. Um, so I wanted to say that the the work that we did over a 20, well, a 15 year period leading up to that Sunshine Statute um, and moving forward. So this has been really a 20 year campaign as documented in a film called Belly of the Beast. It's been nominated for a Peabody. It's by filmmaker Erica Cohn. I encourage folks to check it out at bellyofthebeastfilm.com. Um, and our hope is used to use that film for a national impact strategy around this issue to tie in what's happened in California to other jurisdictions. 
with help of, docu of journalists working with us on the film team, we've been able to show that nine other jurisdictions are doing these kinds of tubal ligations during labor and delivery in prisons and jails uh, throughout the country. There might be, and there likely are more. Um, we also know of other forms of sterilization abuse happening in California's youth authority um, with, with young men or in boys who are in custody. Um, and there's a need to actually use the legislation that we're doing as a model. So uh, we're, we have a national advisory board. If folks are interested in hearing more about that, let me know. Um, but the idea is to use the film to build conversations, build awareness, uh, to get folks organized in other areas on a local level so they can fight this kind of abuse. And then finally, to create a ethics curriculum for, the med for medical providers. So the medical providers understand the history of eugenics and understand what their ethical obligations are as part of a way of preventing this abuse. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. And I wanna turn it over to Amina Elster. And I should say that Justice Now, which was the organization that originally started doing this documentation in collaboration with people in prison is no longer operational. And it was so important to have the, the strategies and ideas of people inside inform this work. Um, and uh, as I transitioned out of justice now, I was desperate to figure out where this research could be placed. And it was such an honor to transition this role over to the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. And with that, um, I want to say thank you to Amina and hand it over to her. Thank you, Cynthia, um, and um, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm happy to be here today and share. And I want to thank you, Cynthia, for you know laying that foundation because it is a um, a great segue into you know what I wanted to share with folks. But before I begin, just a short introduction. My name is Amina Elster. I'm the campaign and policy coordinator with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, or CCWP, which was founded over 25 years ago by women prisoners and advocates to support prisoners um, fight for decent health healthcare, human rights, and dignity. So um, as Cynthia mentioned, CCWP became involved in the fight to compensate survivors a few years ago during a really critical time of transitioning for Justice Now. And what CCWP brought was instrumental, um, and that was the relationships with people inside of women's prisons. CCWP has helped make possible the ability for people inside to continue to have ownership and input in this very work. Um, well, um, many of you may be wondering, well, what do I mean by that? And I, um, I think it's important to highlight the value and leadership that people inside contribute to reform efforts across the state, across the nation, and, and absolutely within carceral systems, and how their leadership puts them at risk on a daily basis as they fight for recognition, dignity, relevance, and liberation. I can tell you from my own personal experience that it's easy to lose sight of who you are when you're in prison. My identity as a mother immediately became blurred and suppressed by my other identities as a black woman and as a prisoner. Um, and I lost my motherhood due to a life sentence in prison while many of my friends and peers lost their reproductive capacities. Prisons are the most concentrated forms of violence in the world and acts of resistance occur on a daily basis inside. After all, people inside are fighting for their very own survival. Um, prison guards and institutions will try to strip, um, strip try to strip our worth in many ways. We fought defeminization when they took our makeup and said that we did not need it because we were in prison. So we found ways to make our own lipstick and curl our hair with toilet paper rolls or whatever um, innovation we can come up with. We organized and challenged um, the institution when educational and leisure opportunities were taking, taken. I served on the Women's Advisory Council where I was voted in along with other peers to advocate on behalf of our population. We filed mass grievances, met with prison officials, and advocated for humane, humane treatment, better access to feminine and hygiene products, phone access, and more. One example of such an act of resistance and the retaliation that ensued, um, I would like to share. So one, at one point while I was incarcerated, I decided to move into the prison's honor dorm, which has some really rigid requirements for resident. The unit prided itself as a self-help unit housing numerous workshop classes and groups. Upon moving in, I immediately got involved with the public relations, legal research committees, and took advantage of all the groups and classes that were relevant to my needs. Not long after settling in, I noticed the male guards' behavior towards the women prisoners. They engaged in tactics such as mental verbal abuse, sexual harassment, intimidation, coercion, threats, and retaliation. 
So I submitted um, what is called an inmate request or a form 22 to um, my facility captain regarding these abuses. So I chose to speak out. I chose to use my voice. I felt empowered by all that I had learned and by you know having the support of my peers and using the internal channels available to me. The captain never responded to my request to my request, but instead informed the unit officer um, that I had filed the complaint on. I was subsequently threatened with a write-up if I didn't voluntarily move out of the unit. So a write-up for someone serving a life sentence as I was means the difference between freedom and prolonged incarceration. Other forms of resistance include hunger strikes, sit-outs, organizing in partnership with community-based organizations and work stoppages. All of these forms of resistance increase the possibility of a loss of liberty and prolonged incarceration. And this transpires by, by the abuse that officers use with disciplinary, um, disciplinary infractions, um, conspiring, encouraging, and, and engaging in direct violence on imprisoned people by um, prison guards. So as you see, every day inside of prisons, people have to make choices on how to respond and react because your life literally depends on that decision. So even though some women were experiencing severe medical neglect, they refused to be named in class action suits due to fears of retaliations and the, the thought of having to remain in prison forever because of it. And this is a tangible fear. In prison, people are routinely exposed to retaliation for expressing opinions at odds with those of their captors, refuse access to news medias to you know, make the public aware of what's going on inside and punish for possessing radical views um, and most, most often rewarded for renouncing them. So the leadership and partnership people inside exhibit cannot be underscored or ignored. Their, their bravery and sacrifices continue to inspire and influence how we think and the type of policies we champion. Just as the courage and work of other impacted leaders, such as Elaine Riddick in North Carolina, Kelly Dillon in California, and Wendy Dow in Georgia has done, to name a few. It was the passion of imprisoned people that influenced the development of their vision through the documentary Belly of the Beast, which was born from their conviction and a shared sense of purpose and value. And this is truly powerful. And I think it's important to elevate the value of incarcerated people and the risk that they take every day as they fight for liberation. So this campaign really was a collective effort with everyone giving so much in themselves and time to ensure that this racist practice is stopped and that those most vulnerable are really leading this work in a way that promotes healing, safety and collectivity. Um, and I wanna hand it back to any one of my colleagues, Carly, Lorena or Cynthia to add anything at this time. Thank you all. Before we take any questions, I think um, that was a very good um, question or proposition. If there's anybody else on the panel today who wants to say a few more words, we could also take some of the questions that have been posed in the chat. There was one question posed in chat that about whether there had been a, an attempt to get a curriculum requirement in public education around the history of eugenics. And I wasn't aware of that, but I also came into this particular bill a year after the first one was even introduced. So I, I don't know if that happened earlier. Sure, um, I appreciate the question. Um, yes, so in the, in the very first iteration of the bill, um, before it actually went to its first reading, um, we had included a provision that drew on the FAIR Act, uh, the Fair Education Act in California, which was enacted in 2012 that required um, uh, primary and secondary schools in the state of California to include studies involving the history of and contributions made by historically marginalized groups. And the intent was to modify that statute to specifically include references to how people with disabilities, um, people of color, women, um, all of the groups that were targeted for sterilization under the eugenics laws um, had been impacted by them. Um, and th that was something that was taken out of the bill quite early on um, in recognition that the education, um, the, the teacher's lobby is can be quite a force to reckon with. And we really wanted to kind of streamline the um, provisions of the bill to ensure that we um, brought reparations and awareness 
um, to this, these group of individuals as quickly as possible, and that was going to be a roadblock. Um, so that's still something that Dredef in particular um, is considering in the future as a as a bill that we might want to uh, might want to run, but um, it's not currently part of the bill. I appreciate the question. There yes. is a. I was going to say there was another question about whether and if, if we have an update around the um, outcomes and around the Georgia ICE detention sterilization, uh, I don't know what you call it, exposure of that horrible abuse. Um, and my understanding is that there's litigation pending in that, um, but that it has not been resolved. What's interesting to me is how the... Um, the reporter that originally broke the case has actually been doing uh, reporting since taking back the initial allegations that this was systemic violence and arguing that it was sort of the actions of one bad actor because now there's documentation that that doctor who was doing those sterilizations was sort of skimming money in some convoluted way, both because of those, ser those surgeries and other, ser other surgeries. My feeling, though, is that that abuse would not have been allowed to be perpetuated so long, along with other kinds of billing abuses, had that population not been so vulnerable and devalued and their lives and reproductive capacity been so diminished. Um, so I, I think it's, it's quite dangerous to focus on this idea of just one bad apple. Um, Similarly, if folks do watch um, Belly of the Beast, which I encourage you to do, we had to have a narrative arc. So we kind of focus in on one doctor as kind of the boogeyman, the arch villain of that storyline. Um, but he was actually only one of um, dozens of doctors who did the sterilizations in California. And the sterilizations took place in 11 different medical centers, including one UC, uh, UC University of California teaching medical center. Um, and what I've seen from doing Q and A's with showing the belly of the beast to groups of gynecologists, as well as gynecological residents. And then also more broadly at medical schools over the last few months is that I've seen a real lack of knowledge on a systemic level in that field of what eugenics is, of the dangers of eugenics. Um, I, I mean, literally last week, I was talking to a group of residents for all of Kaiser, which is a very large medical uh, delivery apparatus. Um, and their gynecology residents were talking about how they had had no idea that the reason there were extra safeguards put in place for people who are on public benefits around getting sterilizations wasn't just extra sort of loopholes that they thought, they basically had thought that the eugenic protection efforts that were put in place to ensure consent were punitive towards people who were low income and put in place to create barriers to care. They had no idea that those were actual safeguards because of a history of coercive behavior. Like they had no awareness at all. Um, and so I was on a, you know, Q and A with a group of a large group of residents and this came out and suddenly it became clear that the whole audience had had no idea about the history of those protective measures. So I think what's come up to me most about in this exposure of the ICE abuse is how systemic um, this kind of abuse is and continues to be in the entire field of gynecology and um, how there has to be real interventions in that field. Cynthia, we had a question in the chat about which uh, UC teaching hospital was uh, the one you were mentioning. So the We've identified actually uh, 1,400 questionable sterilizations, which would have to be evaluated if this bill passes. And those included some sterilizations happening at UC Davis, as well as at UC San Diego's, Med or at, at UC San Diego's Medical Center, um, and also one, I think, at UCSF, um, University of San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco. Um, the sterilizations that we know happened during labor and delivery, um, some of them happened at University of California, San Diego. I, I had a question about, um, I think I was just over, uh, 
you know, overwhelmed with the amount of work that you all are doing. And, and certainly just each component of it is just in itself, you know, takes so much energy. So we talked today, talked, uh, the focus is on reparations, but also this idea of the com commemoration. We're back in the early 2010s. There was a group of people who were talking about that as well, just thinking about what that might look like, what that might involve. Is that, what role has that played in what you're doing? Or is the focus primarily in reparations or does it go hand in hand? Um, and then, you know, including in the curriculum, um, you know, uh, if it's part of the K-12, K I know that Milton Reynolds who's on the chat, she's here, um, has been involved in all of that work. So just wondering, like, how are you <laughs> managing all of these goals that you have? So I, th I think I could chime in a little bit and um, just to uplift that I think, you know, our particular efforts with AB 1007 and the budget request. I think mean, this is just like one, one, one piece of a long um, and very complex fight that I know so many people have been, you know, involved in. And just to uplift that, even like, you know, in our conversations around how to ensure reparations for state sponsored for sterilizations. Um, we know, for example, that there, the, the number of sterilization survivors in federal institutions and in local county institutions, like the, the, that number is so much larger, right? As Cynthia was also mentioning. And so I think in terms of like how to juggle all, all of these different components and pieces to it, I think the, I, the fight is not over, right? And I think we, we it's, it's one step of like so many more that need to happen. And so I just, just to uplift that, right? That, you know, we're, it's, it's taken a lot to get us to this point. Um, and there's, you know, still so much more work to do. Yeah, I think that one of the goals is to bring us all together over the, these two days to, you know, uplift ourselves and to know that we're not doing it alone, that there's other people working on small parts or bits mm -hmm. and parts of all this larger fight, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not like you are or they are, we all are, at least I'll just, you know, assume collectively that people on this interested in what we have to say, the, everyone that we're a part of this process, I certainly hope so. I'll try to do my tiny part in documenting, right, the history. Um, you know what's so fascinating to me also about the import of all of y'all's work to actually document this history is um, when, when the whistleblower came forward in this, Don Wooten, when she came forward about the ice sterilizations, she knew that there was something questionable about it. Um, we had a, at Justice Now, we had a whistleblower come forward to us to tell us about this you know, meeting where they were evaluating the cost efficacy of sterilizations during labor and delivery. And the whistleblower who was a very, is a very progressive person who um, I had known in many progressive political circles, um, came to me and didn't have the language at all to explain what was wrong with it. The person came to me and said, you know, this funny thing, this weird thing that I can't, it's not sitting right with me happened. And it seems like it might be kind of wrong, and, but I don't really know if it is and I know you all are looking at, you know, reproductive stuff in prisons. And so I thought I would give it to you and didn't even have the language. And this was like a very informed leftist person had no idea of the language. And we found, and this was in the mid 2000s, um, when we started talking about eugenics with people in the prison reform movement to sort of gather our allies, nobody knew what eugenics was. I mean, I, we had to do some base, we did some baseline videos for people in the prisoner rights community about the history of eugenics and what it is, why it's bad, why it was an early victory of the civil rights movement to challenge it. Um, there was just, I mean, it, the, the, in my way of thinking of it is that the value of women of color's reproductive capacity is so low. And obviously that's not only who is targeted for eugenics. Um, I feel like the and also the value of disabled people's reproductive capacity is so low that the word fell out of our lexicon, like completely, like the, like the harm of it, the word of it, how to describe it as a harm just was like gone. I remember one a very prominent man in the prisoner rights movement saying to me, he's like, no, Cindy, when you say this word, it's like you're just screaming vagina. I don't understand what you're saying. And, you know, and I was like, 
I was like, well, if I were screaming vagina, you would know what that is. Right. But I, you know, it was so strange. I mean, there's just absolutely no, no knowledge of the history of eugenics, even among the most selectest of people. And that has to, that has to change. And I think this, these monuments, I mean, I think it's brilliant what um, Judge Jeff in California Latinos for Reproductive Justice came up with this idea. I think it's so need and it's needed and it's so essential to take the baby steps towards um, preventing this from happening again out of just complete ignorance and the normalization of it. I have a question about the budget, uh, um, the, the reparations aspect of this. I mean, it really struck me, Amina, when you were talking, like the point about retaliation is just hits so hard. And I was thinking, so what about people who are still inside? How are they going to be in a position where they could get that money? Um, or, or is that... Are there, are there ways or channels that the public can help with to try to ensure that people are in any way in a position to be able to step forward and make that claim if they're still inside prison or in another kind of institution too? Does my question make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And um, as well, speaking for um, survivors that are currently incarcerated, I don't believe there's a many that are still currently incarcerated. Correct me if I'm wrong, Cynthia. Um, we don't know about people who might have been. So I, mean, I think there's going to be a need to do a push to encourage anyone who had an abdominal surgery from 1979 forward in California's prisons to, to put in, to submit a request that their records be evaluated. Um, because I, I think, and, there, and I would not be surprised, I do not have any data to back this up because we, really the dozen cases we found of those kinds of folks was so on accident almost, right? That we don't really know who those people are or not. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, people doing longer sentences might've been targeted for that kind of sterilization because their reproductive capacity would have been all the more devalued. Um, so, uh, and one, one of the 12 what, uh, people that we did document was um, a juvenile, a person who had been sentenced to life without the possibility of parole as a juvenile. Um, and, uh, and we couldn't find a law firm to agree to take her case on because the damages under our legal system were considered so speculative because really she would have been expected to have been imprisoned her entire reproductive years that even though there was harm and the harm could be proven, the damages were so speculative that we couldn't get any attorneys to help us with the case. Um, so, so anyway, that makes me believe that folks like that would be very vulnerable to that kind of abuse, right? So uh, the question, I, I don't know. I don't know how many of them would still be imprisoned or not. And then a certain number of them would have been likely deported. Um, we know from a state audit into the folks that were sterilized during labor and delivery between two, just the window of 2006 to 2010, that a disproportionate number of them are monolingual Spanish speakers, uh, which would lead me to believe that a significant portion of them have probably been deported after completing sentences and they will be virtually impossible to reach and notify. Um, but yeah, so it, many obstacles, many obstacles to finding and identifying the folks. There's a question in the chat. Uh, interesting point about involuntary psych settings. Does this work get tied to conservatorship? Um, I mean, in principle, it certainly does um, in that it is our belief as an organization that represents the rights of all people with disabilities to control their own reproductive capacities and that frankly is against the use of conservatorship in virtually all settings. Um, that That is definitely a modern day form of eugenics against um, people with disabilities who are under, under such arrangements. In terms of like the nitty gritty of does this bill actually reach individuals who may be sterilized pursuant to those arrangements today. No, it doesn't. Um, this bill is um, more narrowly focused at the states 
um, reproductive or direct reproductive abuses because um, you know we, we, we could certainly make the argument and it's a, it's a very valid one that by having these state structures that exist which allow for the conservatorship over the body um, that that is a, another form of eugenic sterilization that is sponsored by the state we could certainly make that argument but in terms of whether it's covered by this bill um, no, it's not. It's, it's certainly an extension of the principles that we represent, though. There's some great comments in the chat. Uh, wondering about other questions that people want to focus? Um, I had a question. I was wondering, I know all of you represent different organizations and groups. How do you work together, like physically or, you know, now, of course, online, um, but how does that interaction, because I mean, myself as not uh, working directly with you all, um, I just think you're all working together, like you're one lump, a, a group, but that's not accurate, right? So that's, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how you all do your different I don't mean to say like assume, I guess my assumption about that one person know, you know, is doing. So I'm just wondering, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure uh, everyone else um, would, you know, chime in here, but um, part of our coalition and, you know, our roles is um, especially through COVID has all been virtual, right? So we, um, We've all also, I think, taken on really important critical roles in the work, right? So that we all have like different areas of expertise. For example, Carly and Cynthia have provided the very critical like legal support that is needed when it comes to like amendments that are proposed with the bill. And Carly and Cynthia haven't taken a huge role in the, the crafting of the, of the actual language, right? And then um, each, organization has like a different you know level of expertise and so I know for CLRJ our role has been largely focused on like the legislative piece like making sure that things are moving forward um communicating and conveying um the needs that have arise that working closely with our lobbyists that are you know on the ground daily like you know speaking and, and letting us know in terms of strategy strategy like who we need to be talking to um yeah, but in terms of, um, I don't know if that answers fully the question, but um, in terms of practicality, it's a lot of a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of text message groups, a lot of um, kind of very rapid response requests where it's like, okay, we need something quickly done now because, you know, there's a decision that needs to be made on the budget, but it's been very much a collective effort um, where we all, I think, have our levels of expertise that bring different, you know, key components that have really, um, that have really pushed us through this far. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to I, add. I wanted to just highlight two other key um, players in the coalition working on this. Um, one is uh, Kelly Dillon, who uh, is sort of the protagonist of Belly of the Bee. She was a person who was forcibly sterilized. Now she's a Los Angeles County Commissioner. Um, and she also runs an organization called Back to the Basics. And she's really taken on um, proactively this idea of like, how will people who are notified of being sterilized be supported? Like how will their mental health be maintained as they receive this information? And so she's working on, you know, just fingers crossed this passes this year, you know, um, how, what kinds of systems need to be in place to hold people up? Um, as they receive this information, which she had to receive and, and she received it from me. And I can tell you that I 100% did not have the emotional and psychological skills to hold her up as well as I wish I had. Um, so from her own experiences, she's putting that together. And then also the um, Belly of the Beast film team has been really helpful. I mean, one of the things we were able to do the last three years the bill got stuck in the budget request uh, before this year's budget request, for example, we were able to have a um, special screening of the film for California legislators with a panel that was like kind of a historically spectacular panel for this 
especially right now. Um, it, it brought together Southern Republican lawmakers who have, or support reparations with California women of color Democrat legislators. I mean, on the same group arguing for in support of reparations, which is kind of amazing. Um, and I think, you know, having, for example, having that the film um, and its impact team as a partner has been really helpful in, in making those kinds of national connections as well and unique opportunities. Yeah. And I also um, thank you for uplifting that, Cynthia. And I also wanted to uplift the incredible support from Dr. Alexander Mina Stern and Dr. Nicole Novak that have been um, so critically involved in this work since the very beginning and um, that they've provided the really important, um, a lot of really important, um, you know, uh, support for, for our efforts uh, throughout, the, throughout the process as well. And I see Dr. Um, Alex Mina Stern is on the, uh, as an attendee, so hello, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just following up on that, I also just wanna more broadly thank the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab um, which Alex um, led and, you know, that team went through thousands of microfilm records in the California State Archives to discover these records of the 20,000 individuals who were sterilized in the state of California that, and then they converted that into a HIPAA compliant database that we are now, um, that is now going to help um, facilitate the implementation of this program. Um, and so just uh, it, it, especially with regards to the population of individuals sterilized under the eugenics laws, um, the program would not be feasible were it not for their work. So thank you. There's a question in the chat from Donna Perkins. I heard that there were 50 groups in the coalition, yes. besides the main leading groups represented here, is there a list of those groups? Yes, there actually is definitely a list. And um, one of the things that maybe we can also link in here is um, our budget request memo. So it's a coalition letter with a list of all of the organizations that have um, been in support. And all of those logos get listed on that letter that was sent to the governor um, on behalf of our broad coalition. And it's over 50, um, which is really exciting. And again, I, I, like I mentioned earlier, the breadth of issues and um, you know movements that these different organizations are part of is, is um, very intersectional and diverse in terms of the issue areas that these different organizations um, work towards, which I think has been incredibly instrumental as well as, you know, we've been doing the advocacy work and really trying to, for example, move different legislators that may be, you know, um, really championing uh, like reproductive health issues. And then also other legislators that may be, um, you know, championing, for example, like labor issues or things like that, that I know that's come, that has come up. Um, and so we can definitely share that in case anybody wants to see the full list of the organizations. And then I also wanted to uplift that, um, that list has varied over time, right? And so this year um, we, you know, we're very, uh, thankful and grateful for the support of all of our partner organizations that have really put in a lot of work as well in terms of advocating and, and really pushing for, um, for AB 1007 and our companion budget request. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, a little bit less than two minutes. Maybe we can wrap up and see if you want to give us any takeaways of what we should be doing next here. Um, thank you for the links earlier and all that petition. That's really, um, yeah, there's anything. So I think um, in terms of action items, um, the letters are so incredibly helpful. Um, I know it's a little bit more uh, labor involved, you know, having to download it and format the letter. But if, um, if anybody, you know, has the time to take 10 minutes out of your day to download the template and send it to the email that was provided, that would go directly to Governor Newsom that would be so incredibly helpful. I think just demonstrating the breadth of support for the budget request will really help us, um, you know, push us through the final, the final hurdle that we're really hoping that we'll, you know, like Cynthia is mentioning, not to want to jinx anything, but we really are like knocking on wood and, and just trying to do the final push 
Um, so if anybody can submit the letter, that would be so greatly appreciated, um, as well as uplifting on social media and just making sure that we're tagging the um, our target legislators and, and the governor as well. Anything else um, you wanna say, Sue, or anybody? Carly, I saw you had your uh, mic, uh, your mute off. I don't know if you wanted to say something else. Yeah. Not earlier, yeah. Oh, I don't have anything additional. Lorena okay. uh, covered it very thoroughly, thank you. Well, no, well just can, I, can I add one little thing, which is that we, we kind of had a, a short conversation amongst the sort of sponsoring groups recently where we were talking about how people have really transformed themselves around this issue too. Like, you know, over the last 20 years, there's been over and over and over again, uh, people who had been political opponents are now evangelists on this issue. And um, I hope that if even if um, folks are not working specifically on a bill like this, I hope it just gives hope to folks that there really is a way to generate political will and to create real transformative change. Um, and you don't have to be have a ton of money and be super fancy with all kinds of like huge organizations behind you. I mean, all the folks here are, are really working on a very grassroots level. And it's, it's really just inspiring to be part of this group and to be part of this effort and, and to see what we were able to do just by persevering. So I hope other folks follow suit. All right, I'll just wrap up by saying thank you so much to all of you and all the other people who have worked with you for this amazing panel and, and for this work. It's, um, it's incredibly important and encouraging and um, a model. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll come back to, um, go to an all too related subject of the, all those things that are happening in labs behind closed doors, uh, a new gen genetic technology when, when we return at uh, 2.30. So we're gonna take a break now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll step away for just a second, and then I'll be right back. See you soon. I just pinged Osagi as well. So. Oh, good. Know.
Hi, Milton. Hi, hey, Cedro. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm good. A lot of screen time the last couple of days, but, you know, that's part of the <laughs> Nine hours. <laughs> it's good, though. Yeah, it's been it's been good. I think it's been exciting to see the conversation growing and, you know, there, yeah, there's obviously there's work to do. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of people involved, too. It's really good to see all the different connections too. you know, scholarly activist, legal. Yeah, right? you need it all. I mean, I think when we think about the consistent. And sustained promulgation of these ideas and that there really has not been an opportunity to fully confront that. We should assume that these ideas are the operative norm. Yeah, I right. normalize. Yeah, you said that in, in your in your comment, and it's so true. Yeah, and so that's we, and that's what we're up against. And so if we know that, then we settle in for the long the long haul, and put in place systems that allow us to you know to foment the kind of necessary confrontation that will be required to unseat these ideas and create a more generative counter narrative. Absolutely, yeah. I'm going to test the, the video real quick, okay? Let okay. me know if, if it works. Yep. Hi, I'm Marcy Darnowski. It's good? Yeah, it looks too. Okay, good. Yeah. There'll be a, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Sue or Mitos will do that and then... And then I'll play that. I'll be in the background. <laughs> okay, perfect. And I don't see Osagi yet, but I'm sure he will join us. He was Maybe in, the, in the attendees. Let me see. No. He was there. He was actually in the panelist this morning. I Usually, just, right? Yeah. And I just sent him, I sent him the, the info again. So I'm assuming he'll jump on. Okay. I don't know if I've got his. Let me see if I've got his phone number here real quick. Text him. It doesn't look like I do. He knows he'll be here. <clears throat> yeah, good exchanges are good. Good panels. You know. Yeah, they have been. Yeah, good questions too. I wish we had more time for for Q and A. You know. Yeah, it's some. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the. The goal is to, you know, this is the start of a conversation, obviously not the conclusion of one. And I think as we build forward, you know, the important thing about structures through which we can hold these conversations over time, because I think the complexity of the subject matters warrants it. You know, even going back to your session yesterday and thinking about the specific experiences and the particular kinds of racialization in the in the larger social purposes that they serve, that that all warrants deep excavation. And I think one of the interesting things about this current moment is we're sort of breaking out of that sort of stultifying framework of universal experiences and beginning to understand that there are very distinct and differential experiences of racialization that are context specific. And I think it's when we get to this level of understanding that we can actually root out these issues and begin to create some um, reparative structures that are really essentially reverse designs. Here he is, Aosagi. Hey, I'll tell you. You know, that are essentially reverse designs, right? Because if, if, if the designs are rooted on this sort of assumed disposability, which is in fact a, 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 a farce, then we have to recreate systems that actually assume and are designed around the value of the constituent parts, not the idea that there is a universal ideal, because there is no such thing. Right. Right. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, looking forward to it. Got a lot of good folks. Yeah. Yep. How did you, I'd be curious? How did you get introduced to the to this work? What brought you into it? To eugenics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I started. Um, I came into as a grad student looking for statecraft scholarship or, or mm -hmm. looking at nationalism, you know, and the building of identity, I guess, through, through nationalism. And when I first learned in undergrad that 
nationalism was like a social construction i was just kind of blown away like what do you mean i'm mexican i've always been mexican there's always been <laughs> this essence to me you know um mm. it, i don't know to learn that it was constructed made me want to um tackle it and, and then i learned of Minos's work not about eugenics actually that's not how why i reached out to Minos originally it was more about the u.s mexico context mm. um and i have two kids that have a diagnosis of autism um to autistic kids mm-hmm. and i don't know something that really bothered me was always the the disordered part it was like there's nothing disordered about my kids you know um and then also in the context of minos's word too like she sort of did some of that right like a pathologization of people mm-hmm. and then the intersections of race of immigration everything else just came together and i was like i need to do this this is exactly what i need to do so it just it was a very like natural of me for natural thing for me to follow yeah and I think that's actually the crux. If you actually understand that the nation is conceived of as a biological or racial community, mm-hmm. you can connect the dots. But the ideas cause us to look to the body, not to the context in which the bodies are situated, which is sort of the okie doke. And that's a really hard conceptual framework to extricate oneself from. And it's nearly impossible without access to the history. Mm, yeah, so. very well said. And then Alex Stern, of course, um, eugenic nation, that was it's foundational too. You know, in my understanding, yeah, that, that one blew the doors open for me because that that opens up the, the gateway to the new scholarship, which is not as preoccupied with the experience of European immigrants, but takes into account a much broader and different sort of geographic context. So, yeah, Alex was, is uh, like we need a <laughs> monument to Alexandra Stern. And I'm glad this is on, on YouTube. Alexandra Stern deserves a monument. She in her book had a little reference to yeah. the Whittier State stuff, and I was already doing that. And she told me to go to the APS in Philadelphia. There might be something there of interest, which led me to the eugenic social field workers cases, which you see that I was using a part of the Sonoma State Home. So, so yeah. This she stuff is it. literally everywhere, though, and I think that's the yeah, point. Right. It's, hit, it's hidden in plain sight, and people actually can't see it, and there's a reason they can't see it, and it's a conceptual issue, and I think that's what this history has the power to do, is to help attend to that conceptual impoverishment in such a way that people can hold the complexity that's necessary to engage with these ideas rather than assume simplification will allow you to render some understanding, which it won't. True, true. So. You know, as an English professor, I've been thinking about all these different genres we're working with, like the field reports and the, the pictures of the different uh, kinds of documents in the sterilization justice lab, the different states. And Alvaris may be gone, but I was thinking a lot about letters, how interesting letters are just as a genre to study, either letters from insiders or like those amazing caches. Like a lot of, in my book now, a lot of material I found was in um, uh, people writing to the governor of the state of Iowa, uh, just trying to get some help from somebody, right? And, um, and I found more kind of complex narratives there than anywhere else. Yeah, yeah the, the letters I hope to, my, you know, my last work that I did was all based on yeah. letters. So it gives a nice methodological tool. So I'm leaning hard on that, but let us transition now. I do believe we are. We yeah. are. Okay. And we have uh, Marcy's video set up. Does somebody have a link to the video? Mm-hmm. Okay. That are interpreters. Want to introduce Maris? Oh, yeah. Let's just get our interpreter. So, um, yeah. Katie, yeah. Give them a chance. Katie, thank doing... you so much. Incredible Thanks job. You. Let me spotlight. Okay. We... Everybody see that in here? Okay. Yeah. Hang on. We need to start with. I want to give an introduction. Can you pause it? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. Can you stop the screen share for a sec? Mm-hmm. Sorry, pardon me. Hi, everyone. We are back. We are back this afternoon um, with our still continuing with our day two of our second of our two day virtual symposium on eugenics in California and the world. We're very excited to be here today and to be able this afternoon, I should say, and continue with our discussions. We have lots of um, fascinating and mind-blowing discussions going on, at least in my view. 
Um, for this panel, we're gonna be talking about reproductive genetic technologies and social justice implications. And I turn it over to the panelists and or Susan Schweik, my um, colleague. I think we're ready to go. And uh, the stalwart people who have been here the whole time, I, I say, let's just go right to Marcy and let her blow our minds. But I will tell you that our panelists are uh, Milton Reynolds, Marcy Darnowski coming to us uh, by video from the Center for Genetics and Osagi Obasogi, my uh, colleague at, at UC Berkeley in the Public Health School. I think we need to uh, turn on the sound uh, in the sharing screen. I was muted, okay. <laughs> yeah, but... Okay. In real time. Hi, I'm Marcy Darnowski, and I'm recording these comments because um, a last minute conflict prevents me from being with you in real time. I wish I wasn't missing this opportunity to dig into this conversation. Looks like we lost the audio. You see the right oh, there you go. policy debates about reproductive genetic technologies, and especially the controversy about techniques to alter the genes and the traits of future children. CGS got its start 20 years ago when uh, there was an earlier chapter of advocacy for heritable, what's now called heritable genome editing. At that time, a small but vocal group of scientists was promoting the prospect of so called designer babies, and their vision of be breeding better babies uh, was one that was so much more precise than what 20th century eugenicists could have dreamed about. Some of them openly acknowledged that this would create a world of genetic haves and have-nots, but they said that's, that's a price that we have to pay. And anyway, it was all inevitable. You know, in fact, heritable genome editing is prohibited in some 70 countries around the world. But despite that, and despite the intense controversy about it, including among scientists who are developing gene therapies to help people who are sick, other scientists are pushing heritable genome editing forward and have actually put themselves in charge of several important committees that are issuing recommendations to move heritable genome editing into the clinic. These days, most of those who are doing this pushing say that heritable gene genome editing should be used only for the tiny number of people who can't prevent transmission of some serious heritable disease with all the existing ways that they could do that short of heritable genome editing. And they say that they don't necessarily support its use for genetic enhancement and argue that therefore eugenics shouldn't be a concern. But there are numerous reasons to question whether any of the limits they talk about would hold. And there are reasons to think it much more likely that approving gene editing for human reproduction would throw open a door for a market-based high-tech form of eugenics. So what I'm gonna do is just really quickly um, say a few words about some of the reasons to, to be concerned about that prospect. First, what counts as disease is hotly contested and uh, including and especially from a disability justice point of view. In a recent article in Scientific American, Sandy Sufian and Rosemary Garland Thompson write about their concern, quote, that the use of these genetic scissors, meaning CRISPR and other similar techniques, will in the future cut people like us out of existence without others even noticing. And they go on to point out that the ability to fix people at the genetic level is a threat to those who are judged by society to be biologically inferior. 
A second reason for concern about a new eugenics is that most countries, including the United States, permit so-called off-label uses of any approved medical drugs or devices. So if heritable genome editing were to be approved to get a regulatory nod, then doctors would be able to use it for any condition or trait that they decided uh, they wanted to use it for. And the third reason is closely related to that. And that's that these decisions um, by doctors would take place in the commercial fertility sector with all its typical business pressures of finding new customers and boosting bottom lines. It's just all too easy to imagine the marketing campaigns. Don't you want to give your child to be the best start in life? But remember, you must act now before you get pregnant. This really is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So even now, there are several com companies recently formed that are offering um, a related technique, one that selects human embryos based on purported traits rather than modifying human embryos. So the way that this works is the embryos are created through in vitro fertilization, their genes are sequenced and run through algorithms that spit out what, what they call polygenic risk scores. And these polygenic risk scores supposedly predict the chances that the resulting child would have this or that trait or this or that condition. One of these companies is called Genomic Prediction, and it started out offering tests for what they termed cognitive disability. They stopped that for now because of the pushback that they got. There's another company, ORCID, that offers what they call embryo prioritization. And ORCID is marketing this to all would-be parents, including those with no fertility issues. Um, and despite the, the invasiveness and health risks that are posed by in vitro fertilization for women. Orchid's founder was interviewed last week in the LA Times, and she recognizes that what they're doing is controversial. And her response is, fortunately, we're living in a free market. No one's forcing you to buy our product. So in thinking about the likelihood of a new market-based eugenics, it's important to note that most traits aren't fully or straightforwardly controlled by genes. It's the genetic components, even of traits like hair or eye color, are complex, and that is far more true of traits like athleticism or intelligence. But that might not stop reproductive genetic editing from taking off, because even the perception that gene-edited kids would be superior could be a powerful incentive. So consider a wealthy, hypothetical wealthy family that would spend hefty sums of money for their children's genetic upgrades and whatever biological effect, those kids would be treated as if they were special by their teachers, their nannies, their tutors, their friends. This belief that they were superior because of their biology would shape their lives. And uh, the benefits of the social privileges that would accrue by virtue of their socioeconomic position would be attributed to their genetic upgrades. And then on a broader level, the focus on genes and on the individuals and populations who carry them would deflect attention from the social dynamics that we know perpetuate inequality and discrimination. Well, let me wrap up with um, a quick show and tell. I have a series of magazine covers and illustrations that I want to show you. Um, and these are all about the prospect of heritable gene editing. So I'm going to start with a couple of images from the early 2000s, Time and Newsweek, at that time, thinking about designer babies. But then jumping right away to the period after the development of CRISPR, here's a cover from Time in 2016, what the CRISPR experiments mean for humanity. And that was when the first human embryos were uh, modified with CRISPR in a laboratory. MIT Technology Review went with this illustration and the article inside is titled Engineering the Perfect Baby. And here's The Economist with this image pointing to all the targets of genetic modification that they envision. 
a similar kind of image on the cover of Cosmos. And this is the cover of a British magazine, The Spectator, that minces no words. Their article is titled The Return of Eugenics. And here we have uh, an, uh, a baby, an imagined designer baby on an article published after the births in the, at the end of 2018 of the two twin girls, of the twin girls in China uh, whose uh, embryos had been modified. And from that same period, new scientists welcome to a new age of humanity. So I'm guessing you notice what all these images and all these babies share, the blonde hair, the blue eyes, the fair skin. And I just think we should think about what these images tell us about uh, the ideas of hierarchy and stratification that are deeply embedded in today's social and cultural imaginations. And what do they tell us about how heritable genome editing would be all too likely to play out? Thanks. That was really, really informative. Um, I started writing questions in the chat and then I realized she's not here, but I'm sure we have some awesome um, minds here who can fill us in on these. So um, I do believe, I will turn it over to Milton because I know he has this well orchestrated. Okay. All right, Milton. thank you, Maros. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Milton Reynolds and I am a local educator, author and equity practitioner, but I'm also involved in the larger effort that this is a part of from small beginnings. I'm really excited about the conversation that I'm going to be in shortly with my colleague, Osagi Obasaki. So I'll allow Osagi to uh, introduce himself and then we're gonna enter into a conversation that hopefully will lead to a robust uh, Q&A session. So Osagi, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, so thank you, Milton. And uh, thank you, Miros and, and Sue and uh, Isidro for organizing this effort. Uh, so my name is Osagi Obasugi. I'm a professor of bioethics uh, at UC Berkeley in a joint medical program in a school of public health. I'm also a colleague of Marcy Darnoski. Uh, I've worked with her for several years um, in her capacity as executive director at the Center for Genetics and Society and continue to work with her on these conversations regarding um, um, not only reproductive and genetic technology such as IVF and CRISPR-Cas9 as Marcy discussed, but specifically putting these and other developments in a context of our history with eugenics to understand that this desire to be able to design a future, uh, future children with specific traits that align with our specific social and political imaginations, um, that that, uh, that desire is not new, that that denier is uh, uh, deeply entrenched of how America has emerged over the past several decades and has led to some of the most horrific moments in human history. Um, including the Holocaust and other forms of mass sterilization, other forms of oppressions and genocide, and how that historical context can help us think through uh, the possibilities and the challenges and the difficulties that might arise uh, when new technologies are used to pursue uh, some of these um, questionable outcomes, such as being able to have control over traits such as uh, intelligence, height, uh, phenotype, and other traits. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with Milton about the impact of these, of these technologies um, and how we have to think about our future in the context of, of past applications and past ideologies. Great. So I'm looking forward to the exchange as well. And so let me sort of offer up the first question, Osagi. We spent a fair bit of time over the course of the past two days looking back on the history of eugenics and for very good reasons, right? Um, from your perspective, why is it important to reclaim and perhaps revise our understanding of eugenics in order to comprehend the resurgence of it in its presence and the potential implications for uh, eugenics in our future? Yeah, so this is a great question. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on, on this, Milton, as well, because I know you've done a lot of thinking on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying that, you know, as someone who uh, teaches uh, mostly graduate students and occasionally undergraduates at Berkeley, you know, Berkeley is a world-class university um, with close proximity to Silicon Valley um, in terms of how, as, as a space where 
a lot of technological innovation is occurring, um, not only in information sciences, but also in the health sciences and biological sciences. And so a lot of the folks that we train at Berkeley will be tomorrow's leaders. And I'm always um, concerned that when I teach my classes on bioethics or reproductive and gen genetic technologies, when I ask my students, um, how many, what do you guys know about the eugenics movement? And unfortunately, you know, so many of our younger students just have not had the opportunity to either even be, be to even have a conversation about what eugenics was. Um, most of our students um, have never had a serious conversation about it in class. Those that had, had a, have had a very minimal discussion that positions eugenics as a fringe ideology that was, uh, that was uh, embraced by a handful, a small group of, uh, of Nazis uh, during the early 20th century and how those quickly uh, dispensed after World War II. That's the kind of framing that our society and our education system has given eugenics. And our students don't have the broader understanding and context of how eugenics was a global phenomenon, how it was a phenomenon that spread across uh, political boundaries, left, right, center, um, and, is, and how it is an ideology that continued to persist after World War II. So after we saw um, the horrific outcomes that came from eugenic ideology, uh, after we were supposedly, uh, as, a, as a society, we were supposed to have moved past this and become more equitable in how we treat people, particularly with, with regards to science, technology, and medicine, eugenics has persisted as a framework that is seen as legitimate. So I say this all as a precursor to suggest that history is crucial for us to understand precisely what is at stake when we embrace the idea that science, technology, and medicine can be used to intervene to produce what we some what we can, have come to believe will be the quote unquote best people and to discourage uh, the reproduction of those we seem to be as quote unquote burdens. And again, you know, uh, we see so many examples as Marcy talked about in her opening where this is being pursued as a quote unquote new approach. And I think um, part of the work that I know you've done Milton and the work that I'm doing is trying to get people to understand that we've been down this road in the past. It did not work out well. And if we continue to go down this road without a proper context in history, we run the risk of harming the very same populations that have been harmed in the past, including people of color, women, people with disabilities, poor people, and other vulnerable populations. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so so spot on, Osagi. I think, you know, in my experience, my the the domain in which I've dealt with these ideas is a little bit different. As you know, I've worked primarily with educators. Um, but also in some other domains around environmental justice, disability rights and other things. But I too have been struck by the number of times in which I encounter people who profess the same truncated understanding of eugenics. One, that eugenics was a, a fringe ideology uh, and that it's something of our past as though it's encased in amber rather than an ongoing dynamic. It also seems to me the current misunderstanding also seems to parallel the approach to dealing with difference that emerged in the post-war, which was sort of that of racial liberalism to look at discrimination and inequity as individualistic behavioral traits rather than an understanding of sustained and systemic devaluation, subjugation and normalizing of, of human hierarchies where in fact there are none. And so the ability to hold the complexity of race really requires, and racialization to be specific, really requires an understanding of the history. Because that, that idea of our identities as being universal is historically abstracted. And I think the very intention of that historical abstraction is to prevent people from being able to connect the, the ideologies to the institutions that continue to promulgate these notions of that there are discernible and distinct uh, differential values within our human populations, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that for, for me, that's, that's critical. I think the other, the other thing that comes to me is that these ideas are, have been normalized for so long that they're literally operate as a suppositional foundation of, of many sets of ideas rather than things that need to be questioned uh, continually uh, in, 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 a, in a deep way. And so without having access to the history, it's just very difficult to get back into that process because in fact, we may need to redesign our systems based on the assumption that um, everybody brings value to the table rather than there are some for whom those resources need to be dedicated, those deemed to be most fit by, again, those very um, historical markers that remain clearly uh, present in our 
present in our current discourse. So, so, so this question sort of is an extension of that. You know, we oftentimes encounter the framing that eugenics was, was in the past and that science today is actually free of the taint of eugenics. Why is that a problematic framing? And what are the potential implications of this framing in regard to how science functions today and how eugenically rooted ideas are being legitimized in the present? Yeah, so I think this, this is another great question. And I, and I think there is this tendency to think about science, medicine, and technology as these kind of neutral efforts to improve uh, human life, right? So we often think of these this aspect of, of human activity as free from ideology, as free from politics, and uh, free from any effort to try to, or to say, as separate from any effort that might attempt to replicate any type of social or political hierarchy. That is that we, we have been kind of um, taught to think that those professionals who are, who, are, who are physicians, who are scientists, who are working in technological innovation, only, are only looking at the data, are only looking at the numbers, and that the numbers drive their work and that any type of social, political, or economic consideration is just not a part of the worldview. I think it's important to acknowledge that there are many professionals who do embrace their work or as they encounter their work with that level of seriousness and robustness and those folks should be applauded. However, what history shows us and in particularly the history around eugenics is that ideology has been a constitutive part of so many scientific developments and medical interventions. That is to say that the, the entire idea that we should somehow intervene and use our social and political presumptions to determine which people or populations should be encouraged to reproduce and which populations should be discouraged. That is by definition an political uh, engagement. And when that gets reframed as a neutral assessment or, or, or neutral uh, attempt or an objective attempt to somehow improve human outcomes, that, uh, that fails, or I should say it, um, it limits our ability as a society to understand how science and medicine and technology can be weaponized for really detrimental uh, outcomes and projects. So this is to say that it's really important for us to engage this history, uh, as we were talking about earlier, for us, so that we can understand precisely how these attempts have occurred in the past, so that we can improve our ability to detect what is happening in the contemporary moment and going forward. And, and so, it, and, and I think this kind of history of eugenics is such a great case study of understanding how technological innovation and ideological presumptions come together in ways that are quite damaging and it allows us an opportunity to be able to piece apart how and why these things occur and allows us to have a conversation about what does it mean for us as a society to have some type of democratic oversight over scientific development so that we can embrace the opportunities that come from scientific innovation and innovation and developments in medicine. We want to embrace those opportunities while at the same time being able to limit those um, ideas and practices that are deeply entwined with subordinating practices and, and, and ideas. So um, I, that's where I see, um, you know, this examination of history can be quite useful. Yeah, and when, when I'm hearing you say the word intertwined, it brings me back to that image of the eugenic tree. And when we look to the root ball of that tree, we see a variety of different academic disciplines engage in this process of promulgating eugenics. Part of what makes it interesting and intriguing to me is that in many cases, those different disciplines have different language or frameworks through which they traffic in the ideas uh, you know, of, of, of essentialism. And so that I guess part of, part of the challenge is that we have to sort of spend some, some time to go deep and to understand that those investigations need to be across various different disciplines in order to fully comprehend the ways in which these ideas are, are normalized or can be normalized um, from different, from different uh, arenas. Yeah, and I think another part of the question you're asking about framing eugenics as something in the past and something that's not with us today, I think a big part of this is we tend to have this um, assumption that the eugenics movement, um, to the extent that it is acknowledged, was problematic only because the state was involved. Um, and it's this idea that what made eugenics troublesome was that the state was dictating reproductive choices um, for individuals and families. Um, and that uh, what we see today, people have argued is not problematic because the state is not involved and that this is simply free choice. And I think that is a bit, is a bit 
not only overly simplistic, but also, uh, you know, I think we can go as far as say it's a, it's a fundamental inaccuracy in terms of how we understand the eugenics movement. So I like to think of what drove the eugenics movement, both past, present, and likely future, has been the role of markets and in industry rather than the state itself. So clearly, you can see the state was involved in the late 19th and early 20th century in producing laws that codify certain eugenic ideologies. But we can't really, uh, this, we can't, it's, I should say, it's difficult to disconnect the rise of eugenics in the, in the early 20th century from the growing industrialization of nations and how the desire for having productive bodies and the desire to have quote unquote an efficient society with quote unquote people who are not burdensome. Like that is a market driven practice and the state was certainly participating in that, but markets really drove the perceived need to have these type of medical and scientific interventions in creating what they believe to be the best populations to help industry thrive and to reduce the quote unquote cost and burden on industry. And so once we think about the history of eugenics in that way, and, um, and try to understand the, the central role of markets and understanding the role of the state as more anterior to that, that allows us to understand how the, the continuity of, the, of eugenics and understanding its legacy has spanned across time as a continued and ongoing effort to prop up markets and as a continued and ongoing effort to make sure that industry has access to bodies that they perceive as being the most uh, efficient and effective. Um, and that allows us to then rethink the possibilities of eugenics in the 21st century. That is to say that although the state is unlikely to be involved in the ways that it was in the early 20th century, the continuity of thinking between the role that markets play in the early 20th century and how markets are being are, are, are playing a central role today. And so this, again, we can go back to some of the, the statements that Marcy made in her opening comments in terms of how entire companies are, are, are developing around this idea of choice and providing choice to individuals um, so that they can make decisions uh, about their family formation uh, without a serious conversation of how that individual choice is tied to broader kind of social and economic desires um, that are closely uh, linked to and uh, a part of these kind of past economic desires that we've seen um, over the past 100 years or so with regards to eugenic thinking. This, when we have this reframing, it allows us to see that there is a lot uh, there's a lot there that are, I should say that there's a lot there that, they, that continues to be in conversation in terms of how the past is shaping the present and the possible future. And again, this kind of focus on the state as being the kind of definitive aspect of eugenics obscures that, the reality of the role of markets. And once we kind of can lift that, we can see how much this kind of market sensibility, this neoliberal sensibility is shaping the way we think about the need to, in a sense, have these type of interventions. So I think that's it, that's just an important part of the conversation. Yeah, I, I appreciate you putting that back on the table. And I think it connects back to some of the conversations that were made earlier on yesterday's session. I, I think that framing also sort of assumes that this, the state and different sort of elements of the state weren't effective in promulgating these ideas. You know, when we think about, you know, decades of promulgation, particularly in this country, in the sense that there never was a, a, a full usurpation of the movement, is that these ideas have extended far beyond the state. It, it, it also occurs to me that in some respects, the preoccupation with the state may be somewhat of a hangover from the earlier studies on eugenics, which were particularly focused on um, that of Nazi Germany and may have been in some cases impacted by the Cold War politics. And so that the narrative of the United States engaged may have been more exculpatory than investigatory. And so what's happening now is that we're sort of breaking into that deeper interrogation. And what we're revealing is that the same patterns that were existing in the past are, are, are very much here in the present. And I think the past administration uh, has made that more uh, apparent than ever. Although to be clear, eugenics is probably one of the most bipartisan things that we've ever engaged in as a nation. So I think that that's really important to lift up as well. It's not the domain of any particular party, but rather it is a, a sort of a broader national imperative. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, why is it important to expand inquiry into eugenics in our understanding of it beyond the role of the state? And we started to talk about our state-sponsored actors. Um, why is the, Martin, the, the market a particular important side of inquiry in this present moment? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, just, it's critical to understand that, the, um, that so much of this idea of human productivity is driven by 
market sensibilities. Um, so rather than framing this as um, uh, individual states getting involved in shaping the kind of demography of, of, a, of a nation, which is, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, part of it, we have to, I think it's, it's important to kind of keep in mind that so much of this is about political economy and, and what does it mean for uh, those who are uh, leaders in industry to be able to um, uh, create what they believe to be that a population that can help them drive their further economic success. Um, and, um, you know, as we were talking about earlier, once we are able to understand the centrality of markets, um, that allows us to think of eugenics less as something that kind of uh, rose in early 20th century, peaked in the mid to late, uh, or excuse me, mid 20th century, and then somehow ended after the World War II. I think we, once we kind of have a focus on markets, it allows us to understand, again, a continuity of thought across the 20th century into the 21st that has been, in many ways, uh, uh, not disrupted as much as the traditional historical narrative would tell us. And once we understand how the lack of disruption um, and, and the persistence of thought has occurred, or has, has, how the persistence of, of thought has continued to shape so much of uh, science, medicine, technology throughout the late 20th century and into the 21st, that then allows us to take seriously the importance of using history to shape the conversation of how we should approach these newer technologies that are attempting many of the same things that were attempted um, in previous years. Mm -hmm. And again, it's important to note that so many of those technologies were preoccupied with sort of honing perfection. I think it was Al Alexander that used the term perfection project and it. it is a national project. And so the idea that, you know, industries and academic domains sort of position within the nation would sort of change course so rapidly, particularly when the ideas have such utility, um, just doesn't, just seems to defy reality. Mm -hmm. I think in this present moment, we're beginning to see that in, in, in ways that are pretty profound. So I know we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about the potential social justice implications, you know, of, of, of this history. But I think one of the things that I've become more aware of in recent years is that, you know, again, this preoccupation with perfection is really a narrative that normalizes disposability. And when we think about it, uh, it has particular implications for some populations. And we know that, for instance, the disability, to com the disability community is squarely uh, in, the, in the focus you know, of this preoccupation with perfection, but there are other broader social justice implications. I'm wondering, would you be uh, willing to elaborate on some of your social justice concerns when you see the directions these technologies are moving in? Yeah, I mean, so my, my largest concern is that it, um, it reinforces the idea that health and health disparities are a function of individual traits mm -hmm. rather than social, political, and environmental contexts. Um, and um, you know, as someone who's situated currently in a school of public health, you know, a lot of my work is in conversation um, with the broader discussion about the social and political determinants of uh, social and political determinants of health. Mm -hmm. um, trying to understand how the way that we structure society has as big, if not a bigger impact on health outcomes um, as uh, any type of individual uh, trait that people might have. Um, and once we, um, you know, once we kind of um, move toward the place that somehow places kind of the responsibility of health on these type of, of kind of um, interventions that are made uh, kind of during conception um, or interventions made uh, prior to birth, uh, once health is shaped in that way, um, it places a tremendous burden on families to make decisions um, before a person is even born to, in a sense, impact positive health, rather than putting the focus on where it should be. That is to say, how do we put families in a position where they can raise uh, healthy children and not have their own health or their children's health adversely impacted by social, political, and economic considerations that are a function of human choice. That is to say that we can make a series of decisions as a society to make sure that we are all healthy and can thrive in important ways, rather than assuming that one's health is somehow uh, determined by a series of individual traits that can or ought to be manipulated um, prior to birth. Yeah, and individual traits are in some cases even individual choices as we see mm -hmm. sometimes entering the discourse. 
I'm, I'm struck by the power of eugenic thought to focus, to, to actually create a series of attribution errors. Yeah. We're, it, it forces us to look to the body as the site of, um, of defect rather than to the society which is assigning meaning to that body and in which that body is situated. And in some sense, it, is, it also, if we follow that logic, it also seems to be to be profoundly inefficient to be looking for solutions within the body rather than perhaps more efficiently and effectively changing the social conditions in which communities are sort of situated in ways that might provide broader and more sustainable positive health outcomes. I think that's right. And I, I, I'm glad you brought up the, what, what the issue of inefficiency because, <clears throat> I mean, the vast majority of scientists understand that if you take eugenics seriously, it's an impossible endeavor. That is the type of interventions that are being um, proposed even if that's something that you think is something that ought to be pursued, it's quite difficult to have population level um, impacts that can affect the way how entire populations live. So this is to say that um, on the one hand, eugenics is both a, an immoral um, and deeply problematic practice, but even if you take it seriously on its own terms, it's highly unlikely to achieve what it says it wants to achieve. So then we have to think about, okay, if that's the case, then what's the purpose of this type of idea? If folks, in a sense, know that it can't really do what it tends to do. And this is just, you know, I think part of the everyday violence that is deeply embedded in, how, in group conflict. That is to say that not only is it part of a broader con conversation of continuing to blame disparities and poor health outcomes on individuals, mm -hmm. it, it's also part of the, the, this conversation that science and technology can solve social problems in ways that allow money and prestige and resources to flow in one direction and away from others. So this is to say that what we do know from, from mountains of research is that deeper investments in community and, and social projects can have tremendous impacts on how folks can live healthy lives, right? Um, but uh, eugenics allows for the conversation to continue to focus on what can individuals do? How can we prop up kind of these kind of medical interventions in a way that you know supports a multi-trillion dollar medical uh, industry um, and uh, allows the conversation around racial hierarchies being natural rather than produced to continue to persist in a way that um, again um, leads to the, the lack of support for many uh, vulnerable populations. So again, we have to see kind of the continued efforts at, at eugenics as much more than what uh, proponents perceive as a genuine effort at health improvement and understanding it as a part of a broader kind of um, project of violence that is used to, as you say, mis misattribute poor outcomes to individual failings as to um, part of the many ways in which society has failed its most vulnerable. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, several of the earlier panelists had lifted up the issue of carcerality, thinking about sort of how people, individuals are confined within space. And I think understanding that that, that framework is also sort of helpful in, in, in reconnecting some of the purposes of eugenic narratives, which was to promote these ideas of disposability, which was oftentimes tied to resources and allocation. But thinking about it in terms of the contemporary sense, I'm also sort of understanding sort of redlining and, and other patterns of carcerality that may be larger than Putting, being put into an institution, let's say, um, or being incarcerated in a jail, but actually being sort of incarcerated in a community. And we know that from the eugenic past that once people are geographically isolated, narratives can be constructed around those communities. The amount of resources that those communities receive or don't receive can be not only limited, but also rationalized and justified and that economies can, extractive economies can be constructed around those communities. And so, again, there are much larger sort of implications of these narratives, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that are not being addressed. I, I know in the past that you, you did some writing around Bidil and the use of sort of medicine, you know, to attend to issues of, say, high blood pressure in African-American communities. And, it's clear back then we could change the living conditions and in which many communities are situated, which would be much more efficient and effective uh, in the long run. But again, this attribution error continues to cause people to look to the body rather than the context in which bodies are situated as the site of intervention. 
Right, right. And I think you, I think this is a great point that you're raising. I would say in addition to it being an attribution error, it's also a strategy. You know, this is in many ways a deliberate strategy uh, to justify, um, again, funneling resources to certain populations and away from others, as you described. And I think um, you know, it's. Uh, I think there are moments of individual failure where fo- people fail to think critically about what's being said. But at the same time, this type of misattribu- misattribution is weaponized as a way to pursue specific political projects. And so we have to think about you know eugenics within that as one of the many tools and weapons that it, that are used to maintain the status quo. Yeah, um, yeah. Just reminds. I'm just thinking about this sort of experience of of immigrants being racialized, oftentimes in service of extracting their labor, but also narratives constructed and policies put forward that might limit their ability to form families, but still extract the labor. Um, and again, that the, the notion that some people are fit for certain types of jobs is a constructed reality, not a, not a, a, a biological truth. Right. So sort of picking up on the idea that the history of eugenics we see this pattern of over-promising and under-delivering, right? And I'm wondering about that in the present. So from your vantage point, what's the gap between eugenic inspirations and the technological capacity to manifest these ideals? I know that we're, we've moved into the era of CRISPR-Cas9, which is sort of raising concerns for a lot of people. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think it's too late to get out in front of this juggernaut? And if not, you know, where would you focus your energies or combat, combat the appeal of this sort of essentialist thought? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, at, at some level, it's, a, it's, a, it, it, it's not quite clear what the gap is. So we, there are certainly these aspirations out there. And the technology is moving forward. Um, you know, we see, um, we're seeing technologies as such as Marcy described, poly, polygenic risk force. And as you described, CRISPR-Cas9, where people are moving closer and closer to the ability to be able to um, uh, screen for various traits and produce certain kind of um, uh, outcomes that align with their social and political prerogatives, right? And so that is a deeply eugenic project. And while it's not something that is actively happening now, um, you know, folks are busy working at it and they're working at it in a context where there's very little regulation. Um, so, um, it's, it's, um, on the one hand, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, this is something that could quite, could quite seriously, uh, um, be part of our reality in the next, you know, five to 10 years. So, um, I am someone who believes that it's never too late to be involved. Um, just because something is possible doesn't mean it has to manifest as part of our realities. You know, we live in a democratic society. Um, as much as many researchers want to think of their work as being outside of any regulatory context, uh, you know, we still live in a society where as, as, as uh, democratic members, we can uh, speak our voices and raise concerns and demand some type of governmental oversight if we feel that certain practices, procedures, or interventions violate our, our values. Um, and so this is why, I mean, it gets back to our earlier conversation about education. And it's why it's something I'm very important, very invested in, because I think it's important to start the process of creating the capacity for as many people as possible to participate in these conversations so that they can um, um, be leaders uh, at the community level um, to make sure that what we're doing um, with regards to the types of reproductive activities and technology that are developing, again, align with our values. Um, and right now, I think a lot of people feel as if they don't have the capacity to have an opinion about this. Um, but, you know, as you and I have been talking about for the past, you know, 45 minutes or so, these are concepts that are easy to grasp. And there, these are concepts that, uh, that folks can inform themselves on, can educate themselves on, and be a part of the conversation. And so I think that's the direction we have to go in, is that how do we make sure that folks are educated so that they can, um, um, you know, be involved. And, and I appreciate the emphasis on education. And as much as anything, it's actually a political project because I think the ability to sort of marshal the civic will requires the historic understanding to recognize that there are real implications for these, for these issues. And I think, again, this universal framing tends to set up a dynamic of comparison in which we're all being presented as universal, but whiteness is normed, but not named, right? And so in order to get to a place where we might actually have some coherent 
civic energy, we actually have to have enough historical understanding to be able to, to parse these issues in a way that is, that is effective. So I'm seeing that there's some, some questions starting to emerge in the chat. And there's a comment by Han who introduced some really in important uh, ideas about the intersection between eugenics and mental health care uh, in yesterday's session. But his point here is, their point here is within the university, administrators of the student health plan complain that certain students needed extra health care and that that drove up the cost for other students, specifically citing a graduate student who had given birth prematurely and gay men using PrEP to prevent HIV. Uh, Han says they pushed back on it, of course, but it didn't even occur that it was a eugenic framework. And so again, we see this idea of fitness and entitlement being situated as a normative frame through which uh, arguments about who gets resources um, is, 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 is positioned. And it, reminds me of one final question that I do want to sort of get to before we move into the Q&A, because it, it actually gets to the persistence of these ideas and where they live on, on campuses and in, in universities. And I know that in your recent work, you've discovered a eugenic fund that was present at your own university. Um, I would love it if you'd be willing to share a little bit more about that and where you are in that process, and then we'll move into uh, more of an open Q&A format. That was exactly one of the questions What's what have you learned about eugenics at Berkeley, Asagi? Yes, yes. So it's been an interesting um, past couple of years. So I joined the School of Public Health in 2016, um, and then around, I believe, around 2018, um, um, the faculty were um, were notified that it, there was, or um, we were notified that there was a fund available for um, for faculty members who wanted to engage in research that engage eugenics. Um, given my research background, you can imagine, you know, I was surprised um, and uh, immediately started, started to look more into this um, and was quite disturbed and shocked by what I found. Um, long story short, you know, back in the 1970s, a, um, a trust that was developed, initially developed outside the university, but found its way into the university um, was given to the School of Public Health. And um, it was a couple of million dollars to support uh, eugenic research and had been in the School of Public Health since the late 1970s. Um, uh, it's still unclear exactly how that money has been used over the years. Um, when I found out about it and, and started learning more about it, I, I immediately um, partnered with a few other faculty members and we uh, talked to uh, who, uh, the then interim dean uh, about our concerns. And um, uh, we uh, immediately suggested that the fund be suspended pending further investigation and conversation um, with the administration. Um, so um, the interim dean agreed. And since then, over the past uh, couple of years, it's been an ongoing conversation um, to both find out more about where, um, where this money came from, uh, how it's been used, and um, just kind of what's going on in general. Um, I will say that um, you know, both the administration the School of Public Health and the UC Berkeley um, Central Campus uh, re responded and reacted admirably and appropriately, and I'm 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 quite thankful um, for their um, for how they have taken this quite seriously and um, have uh, have encouraged not only me but others to continue to uh, look at this and 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 lead in thinking about um, how we should approach this issue. Um, the School of Public Health uh, uh, recently, uh, late last year, um, issued a formal apology. Um, and issued a uh, commitment to rethink and repurpose these funds for anti-eugenic and anti-racist ways. And again, this has the full support of this of the administration uh, at, at Berkeley uh, itself. So, um, and so we're now in the process of, of engaging in a um, conversation, a uh, school-wide conversation um, about how these funds should be used. Um, and that conversation is ongoing. And uh, my hope is that by at some point um, this summer or early in the fall semester, um, there will be some type of announcement about the uh, activities um, um, that will be supported um, by um, this fund. And again, the, there's a strong commitment um, from um, the Dean um, to use these funds specifically to um, encourage conversations and research that, uh, that are critical of eugenics and that are anti-racist in nature. Um, so my hope is that um, we will see a lot of good work, uh, solid conversations and efforts at educating the public and our broader community about the role of eugenics so we can, you know, as we are talking about earlier, increase the capacity of people um, to engage these, these discussions. 
Great. Um, could, is it okay to move another question to the in the question Q and A? There's a, an excellent question here by a colleague, uh, Alex Stern. Can Osagi and Milton discuss the global dimensions of eugenics in air quotes and the aggressive afterlives of eugenics? I have been learning a lot about the general societal situation in Zhenjing province in China, which seems to bring together Islamophobia, ethno-nationalism, biopolitical and biometric management and coercive state practices. It seems, not to, it seems important not to lose this global framing in terms of mapping chronologies. So the global aspect, I guess. I mean, I guess I, I, I'd take a, a first crack at, at, at it. I think for me, you know, conceptually, what helped me to wrap my head around eugenics was to situate the nation state as a, as a racial project, right? And a racial project that's preoccupied with fitness. And in this sense, fitness is a sort of an imposed sense of normativity, right? Which means that we are deeming those folks who don't fit whatever those definitions of normal are as those people who are unfit. And I think one of the challenges that we're seeing in this present moment as population demographics are shifting as a function of climate changed, you know, my climate inspired migration, you know, military conflicts and things like that, or internal demographic shifts in terms of what's going on here is that the reemergence of eugenics is again, helping us understand that these preoccupations with normativity and certain definitions of nation that are exclusive rather than inclusive are really at the crux of it. For me, eugenics is actually within the American context, eugenics is a way of reconnecting the, the domains of othering or the silos that we oftentimes are presented to us as the isms when we talk about sexism, homophobia, ableism, all these other things. For me, they're actually all interconnected and intertwined. And they're intertwined in the sense that they all represent different vectors of fitness. And fitness for me traffics and in, turns into entitlement. So who is entitled and who is not? And because these ideas have been so normalized and because they haven't been confronted, I think societies that have not done the deeper work are particularly vulnerable to these kinds of provocations. I think it's fair to suggest that uh, in the situation of Germany, they've been able to prevent some, although certainly not all of the resurgence of these ideas because of their longer commitment to interrogating their past. I think in a situation like the United States in which amnesia, imposed amnesia has been our primary sort of um, approach to dealing with our past is that we're, we're actually left pretty flat footed. And I think in some cases conceptually impoverished because we look at these different domains of othering or subjugation as isolated from each other rather than interconnected and intertwined. And so I think learning our way into a new way of understanding the relationship between these ideas is a process, not an event. And it's one that requires creating systems and structures for ongoing conversation. And that simply recognizes the depth of the work that's required, but also the, the kind of structures that were put in place to promulgate these ideas. You know, they were sustained systemic efforts that included everything from, you know, public facing events like fitter family contests and, and movies and, and, and wellness pavilions to you know, sustained efforts within education, you know, to 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 codify and reify these notions of some that are fit and therefore entitled and deserving, and others who are unfit and and, and not entitled or and, and not deserving. So part of what's going on right now is that this event itself is part of a much larger umbrella of events called from small beginnings. It's rooted in the UK, but among our goals is to start to stitch together an international community of scholars, activists students and practitioners to really understand the specific dimensions of eugenics within those contexts, but also begin to understand some of the universal aspects. I do believe that we will always be more responsive as a collective than we will operating in isolation of each other. So in my sense, I think part of the work ahead is really about building networks. I know Rich Hayes has asked a question in the, in the chat about how do we move these conversations and, and, and normalize them in a broader population. And I would say we go back to the schools. I, I would say there's some value in going back and looking at the places where eugenics were promulgated and make some distinct and sustained efforts to um, move into those spaces to critique the present narratives, but also to surface the counter narratives, 
which have actually always been present, but because of these patterns of devaluation, you know, there are archival silences, you know, which don't allow those other voices to emerge and to create the kind of dissonance in a conversation that's much needed and long overdue. So that's, that's my crack at it. I agree. I don't have much to add. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great response. You know, I think it's also, as we talk about, well, I'll say it, I think uh, Alex is, I think uh, is making an important intervention that we make sure we have this conversation in a particular global context and understand that the United States is not unique in this effort. Um, and it, um, we can um, uh, have this conversation in a way that acknowledges the unique role of leadership that the United States has played as a historical matter, while also understanding that, as you said, Milton, that the idea of nationalism is something that we see happening across the world. And whenever you have these kind of nationalistic tendencies, eugenics often creeps up as a way to express uh, those sensibilities. Um, and so uh, this both and is important in terms of understanding um, the kind of unique aspects of the development of eugenics and its, its expressions over the, year, over the years while also being attentive to how it's playing out in other parts of the world. Are there some other questions that folks are sifting through the There's um, Q&A wants to attend to? We'll, we'll have Susan um, uh, mention another one there. Well, let's see, it's hard to see. Let, I, let's go in Tony. chronological order, I guess. Uh, Tony Platt asked, had a question for Milton about, uh, Milton, do you think your efforts to bring eugenics into public education are having some success and how much success? You know, I, I think on the local front, yes. You know, I, I can say that, and I, and I do think there's, there's a lot at stake here. So anecdotally, I'll share an experience of some of the work that I was I did with some colleagues in Antioch Unified School District. And in this case, we actually partnered with a school called Dozier Libby Medical School. And Dozier, Med Dozier Libby Medical High School is actually a school that hosts students who are interested in entering the medical profession. And so they're, they're checking things out. They had internships. And so I worked with um, Stacy Wickware and a number of her colleagues to develop a medical ethics course which was interdisciplinary. So it included English, history, but also the science department. And that was several years ago, but it, and, and actually some of the eugenic scholars have actually you know, presented to her class. Her students got a chance to engage with academics around this stuff, subject matter as well, which is really important. Interesting enough, about six months ago, Stacy got a text from one of her former students who is now, um, I believe a physician, uh, at UCSF and her student had text to say that they were in a conversation uh, at, the, at, the, at the university, at the hospital around eugenics and that she was the only individual in that conversation that had been privy to that conversation prior to that. And so I do think that there's something really powerful and profound about starting these conversations earlier and early and often. I can also think about a young student by the name of, who's actually a man now, <laughs> Uh, you know, Jonathan Chernogus, who as a student uh, at Lick Wilmerding in high school in San Francisco was introduced to these ideas, went to UC Berkeley, studied those ideas, and turned at CGS, <laughs> continue those ideas. And even moving forward, these are part of his, um, the ideas that are going to be part of his, of his work trajectory. So I do think that there's a lot at stake. I think looking at the rolling back of the SAT and the ACT also suggest that, you know, the constant pressure on universities to really engage with the history of eugenic uh, quantification tools in terms of standardized testing is finally beginning to show some, some evidence. But I would say most powerfully, in my experience, the work that I've found most satisfying is the way in which interrogation of this history can shift teachers educators and administrators habits of mind about which students are fundamentally fit and which students fundamentally aren't. There are a number of ways in which eugenic and essentialist assumptions about intellectual ability that traffic along lines of gender, class, and race are very deeply embedded within education. And without having conversations, there's absolutely no chance of withstanding the seductive power of these ideas. And yet, given access to this history, most people are revulsed by it. And most people are shocked and embarrassed in some respects. The embarrassment and shame of not knowing is actually not their fault. And it's important to understand that those are temporary states of being. 
what typically happens then is that teachers get curious. And as they begin to move into the history, they have what I call the funhouse effect. They realize that it's actually everywhere. And they begin a process of reclaiming their ability to teach their students for who they are, not based on the sets of assumptions around who they're supposed to be. And so for me, I think that education is the side of inter intervention. It's one of the critical sides because our educational institutions are a primary institution of racialization. They set students on paths. They, they, they elevate some and subjugate others, but they do so in ways that are very predictable. And so for me as an educator, understanding this history helps me to recognize that the inequitable outcomes in education are not a glitch. They're actually a design feature. Our schools do exactly what they were designed to do, but they don't do what we need them to do. And so it is through the interrogation of this history that we can begin to reclaim the capacity of schools, hopefully as an instrument for democracy, but more importantly, as a tool for illuminating this malignant history that still uh, lurks within our nation and imperils all of us. So I appreciate the question and the opportunity to answer that. Thank you, Tony. We have another question from John McGuire. Uh, Professor Obasaki's stance on democracy's right to restrict certain research seems equivalent to justification of government's right to restrict abortion rights and the right to have democratically supported Jim Crow. I hope I'm wrong, but I'd like to hear his response. Thank you. Sure, so that's a great question. So I, I think I can answer that quickly by saying that there is nothing inconsistent with supporting women's rights and, and critiquing efforts at racial subordination while at the same time demanding that science, medicine, technology are used in a way that benefits society and, and are not used to exploit vulnerable communities. So we can hold up these values at the same time and support our commitments um, to women's rights and our commitment to anti-subordination um, uh, as it plays out in law, while at the same time um, making sure that we are uh, using science responsibly. And in fact, not only are they not inconsistent values, I think all of these values are, um, are, are deeply connected and, and, and can be um, um, thought of as part of a broader effort at pursuing a, a truly inclusive society. Are there other questions people have? Uh, look here. We've been able to dialogue so deeply with you all. It's really great. I, I mean, I, I'll come back to the education thing because I think there are some real opportunities right now. For one, there is a growing movement and energy around ethnic studies taking place in California. Now, I, I want to be clear. I don't think that ethnic studies should be a place where these interrogations are sort of situated or, or ghettoized, for lack of a better word, in the sense that that's the only place where they take place. But it is a structure to which there's some energy right now and actually a lot of energy on a statewide level. Mm -hmm. Ethnic studies is actually the place where many educators are beginning to have deeper conversations about the relevance of the material in relationship to the students' populations that they serve. I would argue that this history is really important for all of our students, not just those who come from marginalized communities, but also students you know, who might be white identifying or not seeing themselves as part of this history because that framing actually dismisses the fact that we're actually all racialized, but we're racialized differentially in service of normalizing these hierarchies. And so again, education gives us the opportunity for sustained conversations over time. And I think it's the idea of sustained engagement that helps us deal with both the intellectual, the, the, the complexity of these ideas, but also the affective dimensions of the learning. Um, many people are shocked and appalled when they become aware of this history. And in many cases that can shut people down. But as I said earlier that that's, that's a temporary state of being. And then what happens over time is, is students and educators are engaged in, these con engaged in these conversations over time. So it has to be a process rather than an event. They actually normalize interrogation, right? And so you move from a answer-based curriculum into a question-based curriculum. So you're inviting students to interrogate and to ask questions of. And I think at that point, education becomes valuable again, 
It becomes less about identifying which students are fit or unfit. But when we create education as a place for shared meaning making, what we become, begin to realize and affirm is that we're always going to be more responsive as a collective and that our different experiences of navigation give us different insights and understandings of the world. And that collectively, we use these ideas to make meaning together and solve problems together. So education has to be a side of intervention. I do think the timing is actually pretty proper. Teachers are moving out of that prejudice problematic, that individualist, individualistic understanding of inequity, and they're starting to move into a systems understanding. But that will be a process. Right now, what I see are a lot of efforts that are more performative, but I think even if those efforts are performative, what they reveal is that there is a desire to do differently. I don't think that most educators know what different is, but that's a process that can be collectively discovered. And I would argue that there are opportunities for educators and academics to come together, but that those conversations should also, can, could, should also engage the activist community, should also engage artists and other meaning makers, because this has to be a broader conversation. And I think the timing is sweet and the opportunities are real. And so I would be interested in engaging with, you know, academics, because I have some ideas uh, in play about how to sort of launch a statewide conversation, perhaps to the California Council of the Social Studies, which is one mechanism that brings together teachers that are teaching history, civics, and things like that statewide. So that's one possibility, but there are others. And what we hope to do is to build towards that in the years to come. So I would welcome uh, any kind of partnerships around that. And hopefully we'll have a more robust conversation that's focused on California squarely next year, because I think as a state that's engaged so enthusiastically in eugenics, there's a lot of accounting to do here. We have some time uh, after this incredibly rich discussion to discuss ourselves a little further. And I know it's been a really long day for everyone. Uh, very grateful to people who have stuck it out. Uh, but uh, please, now is a good time to bring more general questions and answers, um, to write them down and, and uh, we'll bring them in for um, everyone. Milton, did you wanna say anything more as a kind of uh, final summary? Of this panel or leading into the close? Well, let's wait a minute and see if anyone else has questions. <clears throat> Doesn't look like it at this point. So, so, so maybe in, in, in sort of closing on my comments here and then I'll pass it over to Osagi is that I'm oftentimes reminded of a friend and colleague, George Lipsitz's words to me, <clears throat> excuse me, that even if we're not interested in history, history is very interested in us. And I think we have to hold that in a space of tension in this moment, because what we are seeing is that we are being pulled back into our past. And I would argue that we're being pulled back into our past because we've never thoroughly interrogated it. Instead, we told ourselves a story that the past was the past and that we're, that we're living in the future. And that's, not, that's fundamentally not true. So I would say that we have to, we, we can't move forward without moving through our past and that that is a process of reckoning and interrogation. And I, I say, let the reckoning happen, and, and, but let it be a sustained one. Uh, complexity only lends itself to time on task, not simplification. And what we've done in the past is we've oversimplified this history and it's become at a tremendous cost. So we now have to engage with this history and honor the complexity that comes with this history. And that means building structures and spaces where people can come together over time and interrogate this history so that we actually develop a different understanding than the one we inherited. Uh, much of that work is already underway. And again, big thanks to you know, a number of the scholars presenting today, but also to Alexandra Ministern, whose work is also, and Tony Platt and others whose work has been critical to my own understanding. Um, but, but there's work to be done. And I think it's the right work. And it's the work that needs to be done in order to uh, not just save our, our, our society, but also to protect the planet. Because as we know, the same narratives of devaluation 
are also foist onto the natural world and cause us to treat it in the same way that some elements, you know, of the natural society, of natural world are, are disposable. And that's, that, that again, that is, that, that, that's a falsehood, but one that's deeply held. So there, there's work to do, but I'm excited that the momentum is growing and that there are opportunities to do that work. Osagi, any last thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll focus my final, final thoughts on just, you know, my deep appreciation and admiration for the work that Milton is doing. Um, so Milton, you've had an incredible um, career over the past few years of both engaging these conversations at the level of, of kind of um, primary and secondary schools while at the same time engaging the community. And I think that's such an admirable, admirable model for how we have to think about how to move forward. That is bringing the conversation about eugenics to our children to make sure that they are starting to understand American history in a proper context that allows um, them to understand the, the deep role that eugenics has played in the development of our country, while at the same time engaging the broader public and our community members to, in a sense, uh, supplement their education so that they have this, that, that kind of deep appreciation. And so this is, uh, I think, you know, I think, Milton, your work has been a model for the type of work that we all have to do. And as we kind of leave this conference and, and go back to our, our day to day lives, I think it's an opportunity for us to think about ways for us to continue this conversation in our own lives with our family members, with our friends, in our workplaces, and just making sure that we try to reach as many people as possible so that we, again, create the conditions and the, the capacity uh, for people to have a stronger engagement. Because as we move towards a future where these discussions around um, changing, altering, and editing traits of future generations, um, that's going to be an increasing part of, of our day-to-day -day lives. And in order for us to navigate this appropriately, um, we all have to have the ability to, to think about not only the significance of these technologies, but putting those technologies in a proper historical context so that we can have a full understanding of how we should move forward. And thank you for your powerful work as well, Osagi. Much appreciated and respected. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation and your discussions and your questions. And um, I love that format that you had. It's very generative. Um, Sue, is there anything else we want to say? We have um, another one last final pa uh, short panel just uh, on our reflections and moving forward that we will have at four o'clock. Um, we might end up a little bit early. I don't know, we have uh, 30 minutes. Wilton might have 30 minutes left on him. He, he's, <laughs> uh, quite powerful there. Um, Sue? We do have uh, one more question in the question and answer. Mm. Uh, and, uh, oh, I missed it. We could, it, 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 Han, what do you think? We could uh, leave oh. it for the final session or? It's perfect, yeah. Uh, does that make sense? They might have left because they said thank you at some point, like they were heading out. Han, are you still here? Oh, no, they're still fine. That's just, that sounds fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because I think that's a good general question. So we'll come back to that one and, and uh, take a break and resume at, at four for a final wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks again, Osagi. Thank you. This was great. Always fun being in conversation. Yes, indeed. <laughs> More to come. <laughs> As always, looking forward to it. Be well.
That was a great panel. Thank you so much. I'm glad, glad that worked out. We thought we'd yeah. keep a little bit more conversational towards the end of the day. Yeah, that was great. Just getting a organizing message here. <laughs> Hold on. Not a worry. Can I vote for us abbreviating our thingy for 15 minutes or last? Rep? Yeah, that's, I, I agree with you. I think people have been really uh, steadfast in, yeah. in hanging in for this long day. I think we're going to invite some more previous panelists too, um, in case they want to chime in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, sorry. I'm like, what? If they can. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Make them that way they can start. It can be among, uh, that's perfect actually. Um, let's all gather around the table, so to speak. Yeah, Kristen is saying her hands are getting tired. She's been diving the whole time. I bet. There we go. Hi everyone. <laughs> Gang's all here. Uh-oh. Katie's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Katie. I've been amazed, is, is um, Benedict still here? And if so, what time is it? No, I, I he, think he's, he's recording it or something. I think he must be. So Benedict's in, in London. And he's been here the whole time, at least on the on the participants list. Oh, oh there he's there. He's just caffeinated and <laughs> oh my goodness, what time is it? Human, robotic, I don't <laughs> enhanced. I'm on Zoom on one. Oh, yeah. My little one's sleeping, so I'm trying to be a little bit quiet. Oh, cute. Our little ones need to be quiet because they're not being quiet. <laughs> Glad you hung in, Benedict. All right, everyone. Well, this is momentous. We are wrapping up. I was going to say our first annual two-day symposium, but no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. This has been so wonderful. And so um, having these two days to reflect on eugenics in so many different ways, the different iterations, and uh, yeah. for me, challenging what I think about all these, um, these histories has been really amazing. But uh, as noted, this is the sort of a wrap up of our two day eugenics in California and the world symposium um, brought to you by UCHRI and also of course, um, Susan Schweik, my colleague at UC um, Berkeley and Isidro Gonzalez here, who's the student at the history department at UCSB and myself also at UCSB in history. So thank you all for being here and, and coming around the, um, I guess, the virtual table, so to speak, about to reflect and to think about how we do move forward. I think that Milton, who's here, has always sort of brings us back to this, um, so good about sort of bringing these threads together, as is uh, Alex Stern and a lot of us here as well. Um, but that's what we thought we would, you know, we come to these events and with lots of ideas and then we go back and we go, now what, right? So just um, hopefully we can have a good discussion here on some things that we might move forward with. Um, and we do, again, have our interpreters going and we have our um, uh, live captioning. I will post it now in the chat. So, and we probably will wrap up in 15 or so minutes when people feel time to go get food or a drink or whatever you would like to do, so. So shall I? So I, I could, and I'd made notes to make pithy comments about each and every session, but I think in light of the amount of screen time we've all had, I'm gonna dispense with that, but offer up a few thoughts. I mean, I, 
I'll go back to the very beginning of the conference when we had a few technological difficulties. And in fact, we did just what people do. We relied on each other's strengths, insights, and approaches to solving problems to solve the problem. That's in fact exactly what we did. And what we did is exactly what eugenicists would not have wanted us to do, to see each other as assets, to see each other as allies, and to engage together in solving our shared concerns. So I wanna suggest that we have what it takes to create a different kind of society. What we need to do, however, is to investigate the past and the past that prevents us from seeing our shared future. When I think about eugenics, one of the biggest casualties of eugenic thinking is that it impoverishes our imagination. And I think that over the course of the last two days, we had some really amazing sessions that drew us further out into the conversation in ways that I think will be enriching. So quickly going back to the opening plenary, you know, a focus on reparations, memory and history is really critical and important. Some of this history is hidden right in plain sight and our inability to see it as a function of the historical amnesia that has been imposed, which might itself be part of that eugenic sort of effort to prevent us in, from seeing what is actually there for us to see. And the second panel, there was additional layers of complication added bringing in the fact, you know, maternalist eugenics, bringing in sort of notions of carcerality. Tony reminds us that the, you know, many universities were eugenic institutions by design, that the ideas that they promulgated uh, were not sort of tucked away in, in, in recesses and corners, but were act, actually, in fact, right out in front. And many of the ideas being promulgated were uh, done so enthusiastically. Isidro reminds us that the other is constructed and that the purpose of constructing the other is oftentimes to extract from or to subjugate in ways that uh, leave them powerless and in fact empower others. Han reminded us that the mental health field and psychiatry is also rife with these ideas, right? And there's deep work to do there. I thought through your session, Meros helped us to understand the importance of realizing the intersexual uh, intersectional nature between uh, the different strands of eugenics, the population control, preoccupation with the environment and immigration control are, are all parts of the same project, not distinct in different chapters. And so working to understand the points of intersection and connectivity seem to be a critical venture moving forward. Um, I think the, the session by the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab is powerful. It gives us a way forward, but also challenges to think about the complications of using data, which itself can be a tool of abstraction, um, to reclaim the humanity of the people who were transgressed against is not an easy project. And that in fact, the, dispose, the, the assumptions of disposability have created archival silences that make it difficult to do this work, and yet it's important to do. Looking across different states allows us to understand the different and distinct experiences of racialization and how that impacted different populations. And I think the devil's in the details and that's the important work moving forward. The anti-blackness and eugenics in the present, whether in the medical industry or the welfare state, um, are again, more evidence of the ongoing nature of, of you know, imposed disposability and normalized disposability that we have to do the deeper work to be able to counter these trends because in the absence of the historical work, we simply can't see what the work is. Sort of moving towards reparations, I think the acknowledgement of harm, but also the bringing together of the coalitions to me reflects the emergence of a transitional justice approach to attending to this history. To me, it suggests that justice is not time bound, that there are ways that we can protect ourselves from preventative harm by delving into the past, but that also we must be mindful that there are survivors of these state-sponsored transgressions who still need to be attended to and that their needs need to be acknowledged and that the longer these processes get dragged out, it's almost an extension of the transgression. But as Tony reminds us, the purpose of seeking these moments of confrontation is to broker conversation and to move these conversations to broader audiences. And I would argue that that's our work ahead. I would love to see us um, push a national conversation, but let's square California up. 
we were overly enthusiastic and I think we've got a, an undue amount of counting to attend to. So the last thing I'll say is that in the, you know, in the, in the last sort of interaction that I had with Osagi, you know, it, it becomes clear that these ideas are alive and well, and particularly here in the Bay Area, where we have several universities that play prominent roles in eugenic promulgation, but also the rise of Silicon Valley presents us with some, and the biotech industry, that this space presents us with some unique challenges, but also makes it clear that if there's work to do and that this is the place to do it, it's not the only place, but it will be an important place, but that the nature of the work will require sustained endeavors. And so my request and, and hope, you know, is to work together to create some structures so that we can be in sustained conversations and move them more effectively across the populations. But this is good work. This is the work of democracy and it's the work that we need to do to honor uh, and value each other um, in the ways that we all deserve and, and is warranted. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Milton. Uh, we have, uh, by our, our recent decision, just a few more minutes. Um, and that was such a beautiful summary and, and invitation, Milton. Um, I'm thinking about Han's question and whether that might be useful for us to return to because it partly has to do with what we haven't maybe yet gestured toward or, or at any rate, not very much. So does that make sense to sure. just- You can then follow up with that. I know that Tony wanted to say something, but we can after that question. Who did? Tony, he had his hand up. Oh, good. I didn't see that, Tony. Um, so Han's question was, what targeted groups or justifications do you think are most under-theorized or under-examined in anti-eugenic work? And that's an open question if you uh, want to speak up, if you're a, a panelist or, or write in the chat. From my vantage point, I think members of the disability community, that that work needs to be done. But I also think interrogating gender uh, and sexual orientation and, and sort of the imposition of sort of normativity around those domains is also super critical to me. Um, I'm also intrigued about the constructions of class as part of a eugenic project. Um, and I would love to see more work done around that. So that's it from my vantage point, but I'd love to hear others thoughts on that. I can add to that. First of all, I just want to say that it's deeply meaningful for me to be with you all here. I've had intersecting conversations, strategies, um, various forms of troublemaking with many of you over the years. And it's really great to be in community with you and going forward in this work. And I feel like we're at a kind of time of critical mass in this work. And that is, you know, really invigorating for me on a personal and a, you know, kind of analytical level. So I would I have a few thoughts that I'll just throw on the table in response to Han's question and Milton's exquisite framing. The first is that the disability studies lens always needs to be foregrounded. And that has been shown not just in the history of eugenics, but in the history of understanding racism and inequality in, in the US and beyond. And you know, if we go back to, you know, there's been exciting work that's been done on the antebellum period, on um, you know, the 19th century South reconstruction through the lens of disability studies. And I think one of our challenges is to really think of the systems, the the, the oppressive systems and structures in which the disability thought ideologies and labeling processes happen because it's, it is about identifying particular groups or people who've been marginalized. It's also about understanding the systematicity of how those categories of fitness and unfitness were constructed, perpetuated, and deeply deep and sin normalized in very insidious ways that we live with today. Um, I agree that there's a lot more work that can be done on looking at gender and sexuality, particularly LGBTQ 
um, people in um, the like at the sterilization and social justice lab, that is absolutely critical to understanding how certain peoples and behaviors were pathologized. And I think that that hasn't been brought up to the surface um, sufficiently. So those are just some um, thoughts that I'll, I'll put on the table. And uh, I continue to, um, you know, I continue to look forward to working with you. I guess one other thing I'll say is that when you're doing this kind of history and this work, it's, you know, I often have this hypercritical lens on all the time. I'm, you know, deconstructing what was problematic. At the same time, I have need to remind myself that out of those analytic ashes, let's say we need to build the future that we care about. We need to build the ethno-racial democracy that America can be. And at its finest moments, we get glimpses of what that looks like. And I know we're all striving towards that. And this history and kind of our, you know, in complicated entangle with, entanglement with it, I think can be part of that kind of process looking going forward. Tony? Um, I feel very energized. I know uh, exhaustion as well, but very much energized by the last two days. Um, a special thanks to um, Miros, to Sue, to Isidro for an incredible amount of work to make this happen and to bring together people that, as far as I know, have never been in this kind of conversation with one another before. Uh, so bravo and thank you. And thank you to Benedict in London there for his sharp stick that keeps prodding us to do things and seems to be successful. Um, so I just thinking about where we're at, I wanted to um, mention three things. One is, a number of times it came up, particularly in the chat and questions like, well, how do we define eugenics? What is eugenics? And I'm wondering if we need a manifesto or maybe another word would be better to describe it, but something that wouldn't be long, a small, a pamphlet, we used to call them pamphlets, you know, um, that uh, is written for a broad audience, but has a, a sophisticated and deep understanding of the global aspects, the national aspects, the links with ability and disability, with race, with gender, with fitness, with nationalism, all of that. I think that the fact that that came up several times means that I think it's needed. And uh, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have to come up with sort of a definitive dogmatic statement about what it is. It could be a variety of things, but I, I, think, I think that's needed. And so I'm, I'm putting that out there for a discussion. So maybe we can wait till tomorrow before we start on this, but I think it needs to, to get done. The second thing is working particularly around uh, the, doing a excavation of Berkeley and seeing other people working on institutions, uh, particularly universities and other uh, large institutions. Uh, it might be good to form maybe a subgroup of those of us that are doing this work. And also uh, I think what might be useful in the future is to do a workshop or a couple of workshops where we talk about how do we research our own institutions you know, back in the day, we used to do um, uh, power elite research, you know, how do you, how do you research power and how it's used? And I think that would be useful to people, um, to, for those of us that have been doing this work, to sum up that experience and to talk about the archives and the methodology of doing that work. And then thirdly, this also shows my age, um, but I think the teaching, or maybe it needs to be renamed for the present, but something like a teaching would be a way to try to popularize and create a public conversation about the issues that so far most people don't know about. Thank you. I love those suggestions. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sue. Tell me I love those suggestions about, um, even now when I go to write about eugenics, I don't know quite how to write it because it's, it's so many things and it's just can be kind of freezes you sometimes. And and certainly somebody asked me the question yesterday, like, how are you gonna, how are people thinking about, you know, your character at UCSB? It's like, well, we haven't. And how do I do that? How do I, you know, um, so these are very good questions. I'm sorry, Sue, you were gonna say something. No, I'm glad you, you talked. Um, I love those suggestions. And I just wanted to, um, again, give a shout out to the, the broader context of our work, which is from small beginnings. And this really was instigated by this 
national, international project. And I wanted to put a link in to uh, what I think is the, the immediately next version of this gathering in Canada. And it's in the chat and that's on June 15th. And um, to thank Benedict for, for doing this massive work to begin, us, begin to bring us together globally. And um, certainly if it wasn't Benedict like poking me, not that he meant to poke a literal poking, like, so how are things going, Miroslava? Uh, <laughs> but it's so good because sometimes when we feel like we don't have this community, and I think that's one thing I was thinking about myself, of writing some notes about, like, if we know there's other people, we know there's other people out there working on this. We're not the only ones, of course not. But to have us sort of like those little network that's been created, that global network, makes gives us energy to keep continue and go, hey, somebody, this is important because my whatever, person over here or over there and um, we keep each other energized. So thank you to everybody else around. Benedict, do you want to share what we all are doing? I'd love to hear it. We did promise though that we would stop at 4.15. I just want to remind, especially because the interpreters and captioners have worked so hard today. Can you telegraph, Benedict? Can you unmute? I don't know if you can unmute. No. Well, we can promise that the people who attended uh, this will, will be part of the broader effort that's going on. We will be moving forward and there'll be more, certainly more. The, I'll go to the website the, from Small Beginnings. It's all there. There's lots of opportunities to get involved in many more projects that are in the pipeline. So um, he's already put there at the, the website that there's hopes for a journal, a critical eugenics review. Um, that hopes it's gonna happen and other many great projects, so. All right, well, I think I hope he's trying to speak. I'm not sure. Maybe his child's awake. I'm not sure. Or trying to keep him. <laughs> not. Okay. And we'll be, we'll be working on the, the recordings. They have been already captured at YouTube. Yesterday's was a three hour stream. Today's is a, I don't know, do the math, six hour stream. We're going to try to slice that up somehow to make it more manageable, but we'll, f we'll see what we can do. But at least we know it's there. So if you're interested in finding yourself, um, please do that. Any last things, Isidro, Susan, if not? Thank you to the interpreters and, and the captioner so much. Yes. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Isidro. Thank you. Oh my gosh. No, for those first 30 minutes, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for those first 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, just how Milton brought it in together um, to talk about very poetic, Milton. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's what we do. You know, we, just, we, we work together to get better outcomes. And that, that's, that's what we demonstrate. Diversity is our asset. It's a strength. It's not our weakness. Yeah, Benedict just said that he cannot unmute himself for whatever reason. You the might be stuck in wires. audience, Benedict. You might still be an audience. Well, no, I think it's time okay. to stop and let everyone go. All right, everyone. And thank Great. everyone who was here, who's here now and who was here the whole time. And especially thanks to the people who stayed for the duration. So impressive. Mm -hmm. Again, another shout out to the interpreters. I know it's hard work. Hey. It's hard work. It's hard work. It's and, and listening and, and, and as well. gesticulating. So thank you. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye. You can thank you, everyone. I'm sorry, I've just left to unmute, but thank you, everyone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thanks for hanging in, Benedict. Talk to you very soon. See that you can probably turn off the recording. That would be good. And a live the YouTube. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. All right, y'all. Okay. Thanks. We did it. Yay. Bye. Thank you, interpreters. Well done. Joe and Katie.